In 2022, From Software's Elden Ring would win Game of the Year. What had before been a relatively niche, yet well-known and beloved series, had now reached worldwide acclaim, marking it as the company's greatest achievement. This comes after nearly two decades of games, starting with the launch of Demon's Souls in 2009. Since then, we've had three Dark Souls games, Bloodborne and Sekiro, as well as two remakes. It would be a gross understatement to say that From Software has had an influence on the gaming landscape. We have overt inspirations like Neo, Code Vein, Steel Rising, Thymesia, The Surge Duology, to more experimental products like Salt and Sanctuary, Ender Lilies, Blasphemous, and Wulong Fallen Dynasty. Even games that are not solely inspired by FromSoft's creations have elements that are often compared to Dark Souls, like Hollow Knight, Dead Cells, Jedi Fallen Order, and Remnant from the Ashes. On Steam you can find these and many many more under the aptly named Souls-like tag. And while there are so many games that apply the Souls formula, they are each still in their own league. What do you recommend to someone who has played everything that FromSoft has to offer? For the longest time, Neo was the next best thing. And while its relation to Dark Souls is apparent, the feeling is not quite the same. Recently, Still Rising and Thymesia came out in 2022, although the former got quite a mixed reception. Thymesia has been generally praised, but many agreed that something just did not quite click. It was a wonderful indie Souls-like that emulated the Bloodborne experience well, though it did not quite manage to reach that high water mark. Then, 18th of September 2023 rolls around, and we might have gotten the new next best thing. Lies of Peace, a Souls-like set to the backdrop of the Belle Epoque era Europe, wearing its Soulsborne inspiration like a badge of honor. Lies of Peace's second biggest inspiration comes from The Adventures of Pinocchio, written by Carlo Collodi in 1883. After decades of Souls games and Souls-likes, in a time where some may feel like the genre has been saturated, we are still finding new and exciting takes on the same old formula. The combination of brutal, unforgiving gameplay and a dark retelling of a classic children's story makes for an incredibly vivid and memorable experience. Out of all the great games we have gotten so far, Lies of P might just be the one that comes closest to living up to the legacy of From Software's masterpieces. As is par for the course, Lies of P changes a lot of the aesthetic. As these flasks are pulse cells, souls are now called Ergo, with the genius bonus of spawning in front of a boss arena when you die. Not to mention getting diminishing returns if you happen to die before you can regain your currency instead of disappearing altogether. You are given great leniency in this regard, with two consumables that make life much easier. One consumable locks the ergo to the exact number it is on screen, meaning if you pop it right after you die but still take damage, you will nonetheless regain all the ergo you lost upon death if you retrieve it. The second consumable protects the ergo even if you die, meaning if you dropped ergo and can't retrieve it, it will still be there in the world, usually in the new place where you have died most recently. This can be a bit of a cheese, but I don't think it breaks the flow of the game in any major way. Even with this mechanic, people still complain about the difficulty and lack of ergo. You can pop both of these at the same time, but you get about 10 of them each per run, and they are temporary, lasting only about a minute or so. In other news, armor has been broken up to utility and aesthetic, which is a choice that I personally love. No longer must you torment yourself with wearing ill-fitting clothes that protect you from the elements, or sacrifice usefulness for swag. There is still fashion souls. We have outfits and accessories like masks and hats, and as of the November 2023 patch, we also get a whole new slot for glasses. The boss fights are also up to standard, with the addition of a few mandatory mini-bosses, which really isn't a thing in From Software games. These serve as a general benchmark and test for the upcoming area and boss battles, as well as padding the game slightly. The game also offers a new version of the Hunter fights. Stalkers are, in my opinion, incredibly fun and some of the hardest encounters in the game. Speaking of Bloodborne, Lies of P also has time progression, changing from night to dawn to day to night again, making the game feel much more dynamic. Traversal has been made easier as well, with most mechanics being accessible from the Stargazers, with the exception of leveling for a majority of the game. Side and character quests have also been made easier, with convenient icons on your map. Lifts appear whenever you need them, no longer must you waste time waiting for them. Further convenience is also found in the lack of any stat requirements for wielding weapons, allowing the player a freedom to play with different weapons which it wasn't really accessible in the other games. 
But even with all of these great advancements, Round 8, the studio that made the game, shows its inexperience in the places where Lies of P takes a step backward. There is no online mode, only a spectre. Instead of strategic mechanics like ghosts, messages, and co-op, we are presented with moral strategies, personal questions. In From Software, the game is about death and rebirth of overcoming obstacles. In Lies of P, it's about introspection and identity. You will see what I mean by this much, much later. We also lack any binoculars, which is a tragedy. Pressing down on the item wheel also does not jump to the first item in your belt. You can also not jump down any ladders. More importantly than the lack of these quality of life changes is the fact that we are quite limited in combat. We can only use melee weapons and consumables. No casting or ranged builds in this one. The renamed stats and removal of item discovery also causes a bit of worry, with a rather noticeable falloff for most stats around the levels of 25 to 30, making New Game Plus runs quite hard from what I've heard. Now it might strike a Souls veteran as weird for me to be naming all of these changes, most of which I won't actually be repeating in the rest of the analysis so early on, but these are some of the most radical changes done to the From Software formula. Souls-like has become a parasite word for the gaming community, but for Lies of P no other category would fit as neatly and wholly. It truly is the most Souls-like of the Souls-likes, to an absurd degree. But when we talk about a game in this way, it reduces everything down to a single comparison. Is Lies of P better than Dark Souls, Bloodborne or Sekiro? I'm not here to convince you that it is, but merely bringing this up to show the nature of the discourse that surrounds Lies of P. This is to be expected, of course, but as someone who loves Lies of P, the discourse has, in my opinion, been dominated for far too long by these reductive comparisons. Now don't get me wrong, Lies of P is smaller, simpler, more straightforward, limited in its arsenal and story than any of the From Software titles. But such a verdict does an injustice to everything that Route 8 and NeoWiz has done with Lies of P. In this video essay I will be trying to do a thorough analysis of Lies of P. By now I am admittedly rather late to the game, with big names like Iron Pineapple and Joseph Anderson already having given their two cents, and many more talking about other aspects that are just as important pertaining to mechanics and story. But I want to steer the conversation away from asking if Lies of P is better than From Software to looking at what Lies of P does well by itself. What makes this amazing debut game tick? And what is there to it outside of the mechanics and difficulty? I can't promise to cover everything, in fact, quite a few parts have been cut during production, but I want to take time in analyzing the different aspects of the game on its own terms. Though I will be using comparisons to From Software games to illustrate my points, when I compare Lies of P, I don't do it to be reductive, but rather to show how similar problems or ideas have been tackled differently and to what ends. First, I will guide you through the game as it unfolds, commenting and analyzing on the mechanics, story, level design, characters, and anything else that I find to be relevant as I go. This is not merely a retelling, however, especially when it comes to the story, and so we'll be putting emphasis on trying to connect the dots in the lore and the story, which might have been missed otherwise. I do this also for those who have not played the game themselves, or those who don't pay much attention to the story while they are playing. Afterwards, I will be studying the lore and timeline of the world of Lies of P, putting everything into context. Finally, I will also touch on some important character analysis and explaining my view of what Lies of P is really about, outside of the superficial story of our player character P becoming a human. Now, I should clarify, I'm not trying to call anyone out here, nor am I saying that comparisons between Lies of P and From Software games is unwarranted. It is incredibly necessary and useful for us to understand how Lies of P works. And I'm not trying to say that analysis or reviews that focus on these comparisons are bad in any way, nor that there exists no other videos that talk about different aspects of Lies of P. The point of this video is to broaden the discourse around Lies of P and to cover things that might not be part of the popular discussion and shine light on the aspects that I personally loved most about Lies of P. As such, without further ado, let us begin. The game starts with Timothy Chalamet being woken up by a mysterious voice and a blue butterfly on the Blue Fairy Express. Geppetto's puppet. 
We need your help. Addressed as Geppetto's puppet, we are beckoned to Hotel Krat, but not before arming ourselves with one of three starting weapons, also assigning our starting build. We have three options, the first being Path of the Cricket, a balanced build that favors neither dexterity nor strength, for those yet uncertain of their preference or the mechanics of the game. The weapon you get is a lightsaber. Your attacks are quick, and your charge attack is a double sweep. It's the least interesting of the three, but also the most standard. The second choice is Path of the Bastard, a dexterity-focused build. It gives you a fast rapier that allows you to stay agile. It also has a notable heavy attack in the form of a short thrust, leading into an automatic jump backwards. While it lacks any invincibility frames, it is an incredibly good dodge weapon for keeping distance from enemies. Lastly, we have Path of the Sweeper. It gives you a machete-looking greatsword. Its light attacks alter between sweeps and stabs with a cross-cut heavy charge. Despite never playing strength builds, I found this gameplay to be surprisingly fun, and perhaps even easier than my dexterity-based playthrough. We pick up a broken cricket lamp thing, and with our weapon chosen, we exit the train into Krat Central Station on a rainy night. Immediately, the game overflows with atmosphere. You're greeted with a wide train station, dark save for the few lamps scattered around. Outside, a storm is brewing. Sometimes flashes of lightning will light up the sky, while echoing rain falls down from the ceiling onto a pool of blood, the water completely unable to scrub away any of the carnage. However, unlike the slower openings of usual From Software titles, you are immediately thrust into the crisis that's happening in Krat. I do think this is one of my favorite openings in any Souls-like. It's quick and simple, as well as very effective. It sets up the gloomy, dreary atmosphere incredibly well. As soon as you exit the train station, you think, what happened here? Compared to its gothic sibling, Bloodborne, the intro for Lies of P is jarringly different. Bloodborne gave you a mysterious info dump, foreshadowing the events of your journey and outlining your task in the first line, Pale Blood. It then ramps up the weirdness by showing you the messengers and your first beast, after which you wake up in Yosefka's clinic before descending to your first bloodbath and a fight you are meant to lose. It's a relatively slow windup, combined with the introduction of The Hunter's Dream. In Bloodborne, a lot happens all at once, and although the clinic itself as a location wasn't too noteworthy, its brown chocolate walls remain in your mind, contrasting beautifully with the paleness of the dream. It's a thriller, the horror slowly creeping up before knocking your teeth in. Meanwhile, in Lies of P, you don't slowly wake up to a living horror. Instead, you're thrust head first into the scene of a massacre long forgotten. Everything is dark, everyone is gone. Pre-recorded messages blare through the speakers, during the mundane spiel welcoming you to the center of human ingenuity amongst all the corpses. There is nothing left to save in Krat, and the opening beautifully demonstrates that. In the lobby you find Krat personified, a giant statue of a lady puppet, the proud letters reading the Grand Exhibition, Krat 1889, almost completely worn away. This starting section introduces many of the most important mechanics and recurring themes in Lies of P, doing a lot of the heavy lifting and catching you up to speed. At the feet of the statue lie pulse cells, this game's Estus flasks. You are given three to start with, and once used up, every attack you deal will charge up an additional pulse cell, but every subsequent cell after that will charge slower. So you can still depend on regaining this tool if you run out of it, but it's not a viable long-term strategy. I find this to be a great mechanic. It's not the Bloodborne blood vial that you have to farm for or buy once you run out, and it's even an improvement on the Estus flask. A forgiving tool, but not one that you can always depend on. It eases the frustration of the longer and tankier bosses while not making the difficulty significantly easier. There are also upgrades for the pulse cell, increasing number of use, efficiency, and even how quickly you regain it, as well as an upgrade for passive recharge. Using it forces you into a walk, it's not nearly as fast as Bloodborne's healing, so you will have to time your heals efficiently. The enemies in the train station come at you slowly, and most are inactive until you walk up to them. This allows you to get familiar with the dodging of this game. On that note, dodging is a bit weird in Lines of P. You have a Dark Souls-esque dodge roll when you aren't locked on, but with lock-on it's a sidestep that is slightly slower than Bloodborne's. But actually, if your carry weight is below 30, something you don't naturally encounter in the game, and something so obscure that many people don't even know about it, 
you literally just get a Bloodborne sidestep. It's far quicker than a normal dodge and your stamina recovers much faster than normal as well. Later you get two unlocks for your unfortunately named P organ, one that allows you to link dodge and a rising dodge upgrade, though as of November 2023, the rising dodge upgrade is now automatic. In general though, these are both default mechanics in every other Souls-like. This was likely done to empathize the use of the block mechanic, which gets introduced immediately after in the next room. If the dodging didn't already make you perk your ears, the blocking in this game sure will. When blocking with any melee, any damage received is mitigated. However, along with mitigated damage, in lines of P you get what the game calls guard regain. This is basically the rally mechanic from Bloodborne. This grey part of your health bar is guard regain, and this stacks up to a certain point. And while active, you can get your health back either by hitting an enemy or landing a perfect block. Perfect blocks also seem to be a result of some sort of absentee parenting by Sekiro. If you enter a blocked state a few frames before an enemy attack lands, you block all damage at the cost of some stamina. Fury attacks, the twin to Sekiro's perilous attacks, can only be parried with a perfect block. Although with a late game amulet slash ring, they can also be dodged through. I think the blocking is introduced a bit too early in this section. You are faced with a ranged shooter, one lone attendant, a type you should already be familiar with, and an ambush enemy. None of these really force you to block. In fact, dodging here is much easier and much more instinctual. I think they fumbled this introduction to blocking, especially considering how integral it is to the game's identity. What makes this mechanic rather difficult is the fact that a lot of people seem to have trouble with timing. It's much stricter than it was in Sekiro, and somehow it feels off. As one commenter on YouTube explains it, you are not trying to catch the enemy's attack during their parry window, but instead you are trying to activate your parry window so that the enemy will attack during it. Only then will you land a successful parry. This takes some getting used to, but by the end of the game you should have a good enough handle on it. Still, this is arguably the number one most talked about aspect of Lines of P, and the fact that the developers didn't make it clear how the parry works compared to Sekiro's is probably what made things so complicated in the first place. Going further, you climb to the upper hallways of the waiting room. A lone puppet stands with its back towards you, the moon shining on it from the skylight. It couldn't be more obvious that this is your next lesson, but this is not a bad thing. Oftentimes when games try to teach you something like this, they fail in signposting it, making you miss the intended solution, which makes the lack of any proper introduction to dodging or blocking feel odd in comparison. In any case, here we learn backstabbing, which has to be one of the worst in any game I have ever seen. The dodging and blocking, while contentious mechanics, serve their purpose well, and it can be argued that they are even good mechanics. But the backstab hitbox in this game is god-awful. It is very wonky and unless the enemy takes 5 years to recover from its attack, even if the prompt for a backstab glows, you are not guaranteed to proc it. The Dark Souls trilogy had very forgiving backstab windows in comparison. I really don't know what to make of it. Personally, I hate this. It's not often that you can even backstab an enemy, so the fact that the hitboxes are so bad in this game is one of the many things that makes Lines of P so difficult. One thing that is new is the groggy mechanic. It's similar to the posture breaking found in other games. If you hit and parry an enemy enough times, the border of their health bar will turn white. If you hit a charged heavy attack, their posture will break, allowing you to get a fatal attack. We've seen similar mechanics with Bloodborne's visceral attacks and Sekiro's posture breaking. However, the most important part here is that you actually have to land the charged attack, otherwise the enemy will not go down. What makes this difficult to capitalize on is that some heavy attacks have very long charge up windows, and some have multiple hits. Only the last hit of a charged heavy attack will proc the stun, and this game does not really have hyper armor. So if the enemy hits you during your charged attack, you might as well not get the stun. This is rather frustrating, but can be overcome in a few ways. You have shot puts, which also break the enemy's groggy state. These scale best with motivity, which is a plus for strength players. The final upgrade of the puppet string legion arm also has this effect. So clearly the developers did realize that the charged attack is not always the safest option, and I applaud them for giving us alternatives. Though I wish fable attacks would also have this effect. We reach the end of the section when we come across this constable puppet. It is our first mandatory mini-boss, of which this game has many, and will serve as a small pop quiz on everything we have learned so far. Its combos aren't long, but it hits hard, and if you aren't paying attention, you'll get hit by its follow-up attacks. This goes for most enemies in Lies of P. 
Getting it to stagger is relatively easy though, and it doesn't have a lot of health. Depending on how well you do here and how quickly you can adapt to the gameplay mechanics, this will likely set a precedent for how fast you can adapt to the rest of the game. But for now, that is all the tutorial has to offer. After defeating the constable, you get a key that will let you leave the station. Going through the station, we can also spot some early signposting. I don't know if this can be counted as foreshadowing, but in a sense it does clue us in to the overarching themes of this game. We see posters of the most loyal servants, a puppet show festival, even the obligatory becoming a real something something that will become very relevant as the story unfolds. One of the most striking is this huge poster for the workshop that makes the puppets. Their motto, I shall either find a way or make one, above the slogan, Ergo is life. This particular one will become painfully clear as you learn more about the nature of Ergo, the magical substance that powers all the puppets we see in-game, including our player character. At the end of the station we are also familiarized very early on with how shortcuts in this game work. These electric locks on the doors that zap you if you try to open them from the wrong side. They will become a core part of Lies of P, as just like in Krod Central Station, most of the levels loop in on themselves through these shortcuts. I will talk more about level design later, so for now let us enter Krod proper. The rainy night falls down on the square in front of the Krod Central Station. We see a statue from which a man hangs, a broken Welcome to Krod sign behind it. And between it and Vanini giving us the thumbs up, we see our first destination, Hotel Krat. It is very similar to the opening of Bloodborne. It doesn't overwhelm you with information, but gives you a bombastic presentation of its beautiful city. The walls of which you will be painting red for the rest of your playthrough. The atmosphere is heavy and I eat it up every time. The colors are also important. Bloodborne is often very dark and grimy, though admittedly it is from a completely different console generation and also trying to achieve a completely different aesthetic. Still, the colors there often blend together, whereas in Lies of P this problem doesn't really come up as much, with well-lit areas, contrasting colors and changing daytimes. We activate our first bonfire, or stargazer as they are known here. Every souls like has to rename everything. In that sense, Lies of P does live up to its predecessors. One place it fails in, however, is that it has possibly the least annoying dog enemies I've ever encountered in a game. No, I am not kidding, dogs might be my most hated enemy design outside of flying enemies. But in Lies of P they are quite manageable, so it's the first Souls-like quality which Lies of P lacks, but kind of in a good way. Central Krat is relatively standard, though the architecture is quite beautiful. The enemies here are also very basic, with your robotic dogs, butlers, and what I think are newsboys? Chauffeurs? Nearby we hear a glitching public service broadcast, stating that Krat is safe, when the opposite could not be truer. The repeating and broken manner of this broadcast suggests that it has been running for quite some time, and with the streets littered with puppets and a newspaper article describing the massacre that started all of this, we can assume we are only experiencing the aftermath of the tragedy. Outside we can also find a vantage point where we can see Hotel Krat better. It really is a vivid structure, almost looking like a vampire castle or something equally mythical. Fighting our way through the traffic controllers and dogs, we find out that the circus is in town. A friendly wandering merchant reports that the main organization hunting the puppets, the stalkers, have fallen apart completely outside of a few amateurs. He offers us supplies as well as the starting weapons for each class for a very cheap price. Nearby, an item on the ground baits us into discovering the training dummy. Here you can test the timing for parries and perfect blocks, which is incredibly useful and very accommodating of the developers. Approaching the festival grounds, we are met with our first boss. Bosses are one of the most discussed aspects when it comes to Lies of P, considered now the hardest Souls-like to grace this planet. Even harder than Elden Ring, can you believe it? I disagree with this notion, and throughout the video you will see why. Don't let the big hat and noodle hair of the Parade Master distract you from its sharp claws and cage full of corpses. The Parade Master works as a perfect introductory boss and teaches us a lot of the intricacies that we will have to familiarize ourselves with. First and foremost, I want to talk a little bit about Elden Ring. Haha. Ha. My earlier words about not comparing Lies of P to From Software games is quite ironic now, isn't it? 
Like in most From Software games, the bosses in Lines of P reset to a neutral stance after finishing their combos. A thing that Elden Ring generally changed. The difficulty in Elden Ring bosses came from the fact that some of them didn't really give you a lot of room to breathe. From Software games and Souls likes teach you to wait until the combo is finished before going in for the punish, waiting for those obvious gaps between moves. But after a decade of this, From Software has decided to change things up, and this is understandable, of course. Keeping things the same for this long breeds stagnation. There is no growth expected from the player. Furthermore, the combo length in Elden Ring is generally dependent on how far you are from the boss. If you are too far away, the boss will finish its combo early. This makes the combat harder, as you can't ever be sure you know exactly when a certain combo ends if you dodge away from it. Generally, this is not the case with Lies of P. Why this is, I am not sure, but objectively it does make the combat in Lies of P easier compared to Elden Ring. Another thing that Elden Ring gets flack for is the delayed attacks. Of these two features, delayed attacks and smaller opportunity windows, Lies of P really only has one, the delayed attacks. The Parade Master doesn't have many of these delayed attacks. While some of them are delayed, they are still well telegraphed. He is big and one simple strategy to beat him is to just circle around. This strategy actually works amazingly for most bosses. We can see that the focus of the design here was on the aggressive, face-to-face -face combat where you are asked to parry and block. The boss also introduces you to things like the belly flop, how to deal when the boss is closing its distance to you, and to look out for side sweeps if you do decide to hug a boss's back. Much like Udex Gundyr in Dark Souls 3, this introductory boss has a second phase as well, setting the standard for most other bosses to come. Most of them will have at least two phases, many even two health bars. In its second phase, the Parade Master rips off its own head to pummel you with it. Be careful when it finishes its combo, since it can still hit you with its head. There are quite a few of these lingering attacks, so this is also a neat little intro to the concept, keeping you attentive even after the boss has finished its combo. Bosses can also heal, and not just the nameless puppet. Just like you do, the bosses have guard regain, only it recovers passively if you don't deal damage. This is yet another mechanic that incentivizes you to stay aggressive, even if you do it with throwables. A fatal attack will help you here, as after a fatal attack their guard regain will disappear. Most of them can be staggered normally, and can be groggied. However, the stagger will not activate during phase transitions or other such important animations, which is Bullshit, frankly, in my opinion. Even if you break a boss's groggy state, which should mean they go down for a fatal attack, they just ignore you and continue on with their attacks. I hope this is an oversight, and I hope it was not done on purpose, because otherwise, this is very bad design. Bosses also take reduced damage during phase transitions. Most, if not basically all, of the bosses have some sort of part of their weapon that can be broken. This is something new that Lies of P introduced, and generally a good mechanic that, once again, incentivizes blocking. In almost every single part of the combat, the developers of Lies of P have made it very clear that blocking is advantageous, but as I will explain later, you should not forget about dodging. What concerns the Parade Master, as you can see from my footage, both are very viable options. I won't stop for bosses too long, nor will I be giving in-depth guides to how to beat them. This isn't supposed to be really one of those videos. I will just be mentioning the more important aspects of the fights, the lore, and some general tips for flavor. Once we have defeated the Parade Master, we instruct it to lie to get inside the hotel. So you'll have to lie to get inside. This is in fact required. Since if you tell the truth, you are just outright barred from entering. As far as I know, this is the only time you are forced to lie. It really wants to drive home the nature of your character and that lying is a solution to your problems. Or at least a recommended one. A message even pops up after this. Your springs are reacting. And if it wasn't clear enough, as we enter the hotel, we are greeted with the title screen officially graduating us from the tutorial section.
We are also treated to a short cinematic slideshow that illustrates the crucial events preceding the game. The alchemist that discovered Ergo, Geppetto grading the first Ergo puppet, Benini and Krat's golden era, as well as scenes from the tragedy that would become known as the Puppet Frenzy. Despite being rather static, the opening cutscene never fails to send a chill down my spine. The slow start, progression as the music builds, the vicious massacre as the puppets go haywire, and as the music calms down, a blue butterfly, waking up Pinocchio. It's beautifully simple, but I never skip this cutscene. It keeps the fairy tale, children's tale like quality that can be felt in the original adventures of Pinocchio. The finding of magic stones, the progression of a normal city into a capital of discovery and industry, even the creation of new fantastical living beings. The moment where Sophia's butterfly touches P is so evocative of something you'd see in a picture book. The intertwining of the real and magical. Lies of P has many features that invokes this feeling, staying true to its folktale roots. We meet Sophia, who fulfilled the role of the maiden in this game. I'm so happy to see you. She's the one who awoke us, but before we get any real explanations, we are directed towards saving Geppetto on Elysium Boulevard. She will also give us a pocket watch which is this game's homeward idol. It will allow us to teleport either to our last used Stargazer or Hotel Krat. One tiny gripe I have with this mechanic is that if you teleport to Hotel Krat and use the pocket watch there, choosing last used Stargazer will just bring you back to Hotel Krat. So basically both choices can lead you to the hotel. I wish that even if you came back to the hub base, it would still remember the last Stargazer you used outside of it. This would make traversal a bit more convenient, in my opinion. A nice quality of life feature. But it's a relatively minor gripe. Technically, here we are introduced to our hub base, Hotel Krat. But I will be glossing over this, as it makes much more sense to talk about it once we have saved Geppetto. So, on to Elysium Boulevard we go. Elysian Boulevard was a regular rich people row. You wanted fancy boutiques and shops, it was really better. But that was long ago, before the puppet frenzy. Giuseppe Geppetto is simply put our father. It could be said that he is the father of all puppets in Krat, but contrary to popular belief within the fandom, he is not the inventor of automated puppets in general. That honor goes to the Veninis. He did, however, popularize the use of ergo-powered puppets, which led to Krat's prosperity. During the real-life Belle Epoque, puppets were a rather popular item. In Lies of P, puppet engineering seems to be a common occupation. Geppetto is one such engineer, based out of Krat and is currently the president of the Krat Workshop Union. We get our first sighting of the Black Brotherhood here, as well as an introduction from Gemini, our living lava lamp. We exchange traditional greetings with the locals and ascend to the rooftops. The city isn't as empty as we are led to believe though, as we can hear whispering and coughing coming from the windows. On the roofs you might find your first moment of rage, with chimney sweepers staggering you to high hell while also getting bombarded with electricity. To me this area serves as an introduction to the wider gameplay, forcing you to acquaint yourself not only with the normal combat, but also with the legion arm you got back at Hotel Krat, and all the different consumables and throwables. Of course you can't just learn to block the enemy's attacks, but the grapple arm you just got works wonders on these guys trivializing the entire area. The game really wants you to free yourself from your From Software programming and actually pay attention to the game and its mechanics. Because all of it seems so familiar, you might just brush it off without thinking twice, and then later get your ass handed to you because you didn't take the time to learn. But Elysium Boulevard reminds you that you aren't playing Dark Souls or Bloodborne anymore, and if you don't unstick yourself from that mentality, you will only be getting in your own way. When you meet your first elite enemy, you can also spot a stargazer just across the way. 
I think this is intentional, letting you know that sometimes shortcuts or running ahead are a wiser choice than just approaching a challenge head on. The game even throws you a bone with an early life ring and an electric coil baton, which can proc electricity, which puppets are weak to. You will also get your first butterfly sighting. These drop important upgrade materials, as well as cranks and alchemical boosters for your gold coin tree back at the hotel crot, which you will unlock later. Down below you will meet one of these non-permanent white stagecoach drivers. Its frequent and delayed attacks can make it hard for a strength build to just power through. Even when you get it into a groggy state, it can be hard to capitalize on it if you aren't careful. A little later we come upon another constable but this time with more moves. This guy will beat you up, and will also throw some new undodgeable fury attacks at you. If you're lucky, you can even break its weapon with enough blocks. A very cool thing about combat is that if you kill an enemy with a fatal attack, charge attack, or fable attack, you can tear off the enemy's limbs or head. This adds to the visual spectacle of combat, and Elysium Boulevard has no shortage of enemies for you to style on. The game is really trying to hammer home its message about blocking. After all, it is only advantageous. Hell, even if you don't get a perfect block, you can still regain your health rather easily, especially if you're running a motility build. What was once a rich commercial area has now become a ghost town due to the effects of the local petrification disease. We can visit a small quarantine zone, which has become laughably useless, with the disease having spread to all corners of Krat. Later when we reach City Hall, we can see one of its gruesome victims. Crystallized scales grow and the body will start to malform. Here we also meet two NPCs, though they are both behind windows. One is a woman inside the quarantine zone for the petrification disease. The woman in the window says that she has been separated from her child by her family due to her having the disease. She asks us to reunite her with her baby. When we get to city hall, all we can find is a pile of corpses. Her family and child didn't make it. We do find a baby doll and can give it to the woman, whose eyes have been covered completely by scales growing because of the disease. We are given our second prompt to lie or tell the truth as the lady asks whether or not the child is beautiful. I never have the heart to tell her otherwise. The second NPC we meet is a young boy, also likely stricken by the disease. He speaks about a hero he looked up to, and wishes to play once again with his friends. For now we move on, but let's keep him in mind. We come to the alchemist's bridge, where a stalker with a donkey mask bangs on the door of a stagecoach. He recognizes us as a puppet and attacks us. The situation has grown so dire that every puppet must be killed on sight. The survivors gone so completely insane with grief and rage that they won't listen to reason. You can't sneak past me! Die! Isaac P calls back to the hunter fights of Bloodborne, with its own twist, stalker fights. These human enemies are quick, deadly, and have all sorts of tricks up their sleeves. They are always a fun challenge. And while they can technically be backstabbed, this is easier said than done, as I have stated before. Still, the Mad Donkey is one of the easiest enemies to cheese through backstabs, so make of that what you will. In retrospect, the Donkey is an incredibly tragic figure. He calls Geppetto out, saying that he must know how the puppet frenzy started, and how Geppetto is the father of the puppets. Foreshadowing. I quite like the Mad Donkey boss fight, as his inclusion illustrates how far gone Kraw truly is. He's our first human kill, and as he perishes, he mutters one last apology to his comrades. Finally, we meet, son. We meet the man of the hour, or really of the last three decades, Giuseppe Geppetto. Elated to see us, he quickly brings our attention away from the blood on our hands to the next objective, City Hall. He gives us the key to progress, not the first time he will do this, funnily enough, and tells us that we will catch up at the hotel later. We're near City Hall, and here we can find the baby puppet, as mentioned before, that we can give to the woman in the window. She will give us our first vinyl disc, which we can listen to on the gramophone back at the hotel. 
With this, we conclude Elysium Boulevard and the City Hall section, coming face to face with the area's boss. This also served as the final area for the demo that was made public three months before the full release of the game. Here is the third boss of Lies of P, the Scrapped Watchman. A hulking, intimidating figure, the Watchman runs around the arena on all fours, occasionally zapping us with electricity. It's one of my favorite bosses, actually, and to be quite honest, one of the easiest. I remember playing the demo and thinking to myself, God, I hope the rest of the game isn't this easy. Boy, was I wrong. The Watchman isn't anything new as far as early bosses go, which ironically makes it a great boss for Lies of P. It's familiar and lets you get used to the new mechanics. It has these spinning swings, which it does plenty often. Easy way to get perfect guards to pull that stagger damage. It also has some grab attacks, so you'll learn to dodge those. Really, the Watchman teaches you that dodging is completely viable and sometimes safer than guarding. Guarding is good, since even if you get hit, you only lose some of your health, but sometimes dodging is just so much simpler. And to play Lies of P without going insane, you need to learn when to use both. In its second phase, the Watchman will start generating lightning that will stun you for a second. This keeps the fight fresh, and you can no longer get easy hits in, making you adapt to your strategy. This early, you don't have any other ways to break a boss's stance other than charge attacks, so you also have to get comfortable with either missing the window entirely, or learning how to somehow squeeze an attack in so you can knock it down. The incoherent screaming, tense music, and the Watchman's ferocious attacks make for a very memorable and enjoyable boss battle. After you defeat the Watchman, you can find a bench at the edge of the courtyard. There you can find a whistle and the word Franz scratched into the stone. We can return to the sickly boy in the window and blow the whistle outside it. Hey, that sound... Is that you, Murphy? Murphy, or the scrapped Watchman as we know him, was one of the projects of the great inventor Venini. The Watchman was meant to be both a crime fighter, but also a mascot for the people of Krat. However, the battery that produced electricity overcharged, causing multiple explosions and severe damage to the puppet. The city council wanted to scrap the Watchman, but Venini and the citizens protested against this. Ultimately, it was left abandoned in front of City Hall. Despite its flawed design, it surprisingly did fill its secondary purpose. Slum kids would befriend the Watchman and play with him. The puppet embraced his new calling and would become Murphy, a beloved hero for the children of the city. They would even craft for him a wooden puppet in his likeness, though this increase in popularity also led to City Hall being crowded with children. The council would, after that, consider displaying Murphy periodically to limit entry. It wasn't meant to last, however. The petrification disease swept through Krat, leaving Murphy alone. Quarantines were set up, but with little success. Murphy's resentment would grow, and when he was unbound from the Grand Covenant, he decided to pass judgment on everyone at City Hall, deeming them responsible for failing the children. In New Game Plus, his garbled speech becomes clear. If he kills you, Murphy will call out to his old friends. In his own final moments, Murphy will lament his fate. It seems none of the children would survive the petrification disease. I miss Zack, and Sophie, and Eric. I wish we could all play. <sighs> With City Hall liberated, we return to Hotel Krat. Since this will be our base of operations, it's best to survey the facilities. Talking to Sophia will allow us to turn ergo we collect from enemies into levels, like in every other Souls-like. Outside of lore dumping, this is her main role. At the reception we find Polandina, our primary shopkeep. As we progress through the game, we can give him items that will expand his shop. He will also tell us more about the Grand Covenant that guides the puppets. After beating the game, this moment is a little funny as it's rather obvious how hard this dialogue foreshadowed the twist that comes later. In any case, Pinocchio is not bound to these laws, so we can move on for now. In the section of the hotel behind Polentina, we will meet our gracious host, Lady Antonia Cerasani, unfortunately stricken with the petrification disease as well. She serves no gameplay purpose, but makes for some interesting conversation, knowing all the secrets that Krat would like to keep buried. She gives us our first outfit and gesture as well. Trying it on, she will make a curious comment. It suits you. For a moment there, you look just like... 
Oh, forgive me, I'm rambling. When you get to my age, your memories are like good friends. And just as distracting. <laughs> After we save Geppetto, we can fight him upstairs. From now on, he will be giving us directions and lore, as well as unlocking the chair so we can modify our unfortunately named P-Organ. Here we can add permanent upgrades to our character, like more slots for our rings slash amulets, longer stagger windows, dodge upgrades, and so on. We can also choose minor upgrades, like damage increases and more healing items. Don't forget to come back to the chair every once in a while when you've collected quartz, as some of these upgrades could really save your life. The last human member of our posse is Eugenie, our blacksmith. She will let us upgrade weapons as well as change the stat scaling on our weapon handles. She will also give us our first two legion arms, a grapple hook tool called the puppet string, and after the scrapped watchman fight she will give us fulminus, which shoots out a blast of electricity. Oh, and how could I forget the most important member of the hotel? Spring the cat! Who oh, completely hates us. With the acquisition of Fulminus, it seems like now would be the best time to talk about the Legion Arms in general. They are often compared to Sekiro's prosthetics. This is not entirely unfair, but I feel like it does set an odd expectation. Sekiro's prosthetics are generally offensive tools, while Lies of Peace Legion Arms are, in my opinion, more so defensive. To demonstrate, let's take a look at the first tools we get in both games. The Shuriken in Sekiro is used to clear low health enemies like dogs, interrupt enemies who are about to heal or jump into the air, and keep their posture meter from draining. The puppet string meanwhile has purely one use, closing the distance between you and an enemy. It's a movement tool, working best on smaller mob enemies with some niche uses in boss battles. In Sekiro, closing the distance after using a prosthetic is a skill you can gain, because the movement in Sekiro is already much faster than in Lies of P. And this lack of ease of movement is one of the main drawbacks for the Legion Arms in Lies of P. In addition, the Legion Arms are also very static. Once again, let's look at the Shuriken. The Shuriken also deals additional posture and health damage to enemies who jump into the air, in addition to interrupting their attacks. Generally, you can interrupt enemies with the puppet string as well, but as I learned from my fight with the Brotherhood, it doesn't feel very effective. The Shuriken can also be upgraded to spawn projectiles that will follow enemies, or you can get an upgrade that works against blocking enemies, or strikes multiple combatants at once, or helps you build massive amounts of posture damage. This amount of variability is non-existent in Lines of P. Yes, the Legion Arms do have upgrades, but they do not change how the tool works as fundamentally as the prosthetics in Sekiro do. The only pro in Lies of P is you don't have to get other upgrades before getting the one you wanted. However, after some testing I have found that the Legion Arms are not as useless as it might seem. I too believe this, especially since it's much easier in I'd say 80% of situations to just use your normal attacks and consumables, but I have found a few interesting uses for these tools. As previously stated, the first tool you get is the left arm of steel. In the early game it does a decent bit of stagger and health damage, but I can't see it being effective against bosses in the long run. However, it can be used as a combo extender against elite enemies, since it strikes fast after you attack. It also drains no stamina, which is a big plus. The left arm of steel can make a few fights easier, but falls off when you start getting the other legion arms. Especially tragic is that it doesn't break an enemy's groggy state, which should have been an upgrade choice, since it's the only legion arm with no upgrades. Our first actual tool is the puppet string. The damage is bad, but does stagger the enemy briefly. It staggers the enemy briefly and lets you either pull them to you, or the other way around, pull you to them. Its final upgrade can also fling you into the air before you come down with a plunging attack that can break an enemy's groggy state. However, at least with the Brotherhood fight, it does seem that you can't always depend on it, since some enemies refuse to be moved, and if you fling yourself to them, they will just outmaneuver you. It is arguably the most versatile of the Legion arms, but you gotta be vigilant in which situations it does work and in which ones it doesn't. Next we have the status effect trifecta. The Fulminus can stun puppets and build up electricity damage rather quickly. Puppets are more common in Krat than carcass enemies, so that makes it more useful than the Flum Badge. The Flum Badge is good for crowd controlling carcasses, but not great against bosses in my experience at least. It takes a long time to proc and throwables and grindstones do the same thing but better and safer. Finally the Pandemonium is fine, I guess. 
The DK can stagger and groggy enemies, but it's held back by the short range. You have to keep enemies in the goop for it to work effectively. You likely won't have enough legion to make much use of it during boss fights, but I did find it to be useful in some situations with lots of enemies. However, these situations are few and far between, and even then you run the risk of death. All of these three are fine to have, and legion is free anyway, but in most cases you will be better off using a throwable or just powering through enemies. And with the falcon eyes we start getting into super specific situations. One I can point out is this high ground section in the grand exhibition with the juggler puppets. Still, it is very slow, though an upgrade does let you shoot while dodging, which is neat. It does okay damage if you are on a technique build, but it doesn't fare well against bosses at all. So once again, it is limited to mob enemies and elites. The Deus Ex Machina is just a worse, even slower version of the Falcon Eyes. There is little to say here. The range and damage are both very small, and it takes too long to put the mine down. The only enemies I can suggest to use this against are the shield puppets, and maybe the brotherhood? In my opinion it is definitely the worst legion arm out of the whole bunch. Finally we have the Aegis, which is probably in the top 3. It is the crutch for those who miss shields. If you block and an enemy hits you, it can blow you backwards to a safe distance. The final upgrade even unlocks a counter attack right after this. You can parry with it too, including fury attacks. But most importantly, when blocking you can also swing your sword. You can protect yourself from damage while regaining health through guard regain, so long as you have the stamina and legion for it. It also works great against groups of enemies, and combined with a status element weapon it can save you a lot of trouble, even against stalkers. The catch is that it completely slows down the flow of combat. It just doesn't feel cool hiding behind the shield and slowly poking the enemy. It did get me past Fuoco in New Game Plus, which is something I was struggling with, so it can trivialize some fights but its effectiveness is completely dependent on what your weapon is. If it's too short, you won't be hitting anything from behind your shield anyway, and if you don't do enough damage to health or posture, then you will run out of legion before it becomes useful. Lupine OS has a great video explaining how the prosthetics add a lot to the combat in Sekiro, and the main way they shine is how they all contribute to the main gameplay, that is parrying and blocking, while extending combos and still having different effects in regards to status elements and so on. Legion arms only add a bit of variety to combat. They don't really work as combo extenders nor as an extension of the core parrying blocking mechanic. Only the Aegis does this and that is the one exception. There does exist a bit of freedom in the form of the katana and blind stalker spear, the charged heavy attack of which you can use as a parry. In a more minor way, Fable Arts also contributes to combat. However, the weapons that are noteworthy all share the same trick, and while Fable Arts can be incorporated into combat, they require a break in your attack flow. As such, the combat in Lies of P, despite the infrastructure being there, lacks a certain dynamic freedom that Sekiro does have. And this is most noticeable in the implementation of the Legion Arms. Let's talk a bit about weapons as well. We have two kinds of weapons, those that can be broken up and unique boss weapons. One of the innovations in Lies of P is that most weapons have a handle and a blade, which can be interchanged. This allows you to keep the moveset of the handle while you rock a different blade. There are tons of combinations for this, both in style and also trying to maximize scaling and weight. For example, the police baton has the lowest weight in terms of good motivity scaling, though it lacks in range. I personally didn't interact with this too much, and I think a lot of people also either do not interact with it or look up guides online, but if you do find a weapon that has an amazing moveset, then you can try its handle with a different blade. I'm sure you can find something that's very fun. One thing to keep in mind is that when you upgrade weapons, only the handle gets upgraded. So if you're trying to mix and match, keep that in mind. Upgrades work as they have always done in these games. There are two types of materials, one for normal weapons and one for unique weapons. They can both be upgraded to level 10. The handles can also have their scaling changed, so if you are running Motivity but your favorite handle has Technique, then you can change it to fit your needs, or maybe even add an advanced scaling. The thing that bothers me though is that not all handles can be upgraded to have an S stat scaling, which I find to be very weird. I think if we have the means we should be allowed to upgrade our weapons as we see fit, so it's very weird that we do not have that ability. Up until now, we have been using the saw in our legion arm to fix our weapons when the durability starts falling. I don't mind this mechanic at all, it only becomes relevant in like tier 3 bosses, 
An example is being Andreas and the Green Swamp monster since they have decay attacks, and maybe the Brotherhood fights since they're so long. It's really not that big of a deal, we have items that can immediately fix our blade, not to mention that the animation is actually quite cool. When Vanini joins us, we unlock special grindstones. These range from status effects like flame, electricity and acid, to increasing damage reduction while blocking, increasing stagger damage done to enemies, or even making all your guards perfect guards for a short amount of time. Again, not too much to add here, I like this mechanic, it's good if it's included. Uh, if it were missing, I don't think we would really notice, but I am still very glad that this tool is here. You can also get P organ upgrades to increase the length and number of uses for your grindstones. Finally, a little bit about Fable Arts. Each weapon has two Fable Arts, one for the handle and one for the blade. The former are usually defensive skills, while the blades have offensive abilities. I won't go through every single one, but it seems to me that these attacks do have hyper armor, at least in my experience. Also worthy of note is that some of the handles, including the handle for the weapon you get if you choose the Path of the Bastard, you have a perfect block ability, which makes all blocks perfect blocks for some time, which is yet another incredibly useful tool in our ever-growing arsenal. For now, this is all the hotel will offer us, but we will unlock more as we go along. Design-wise, I quite like it. It can be a bit annoying when you have to travel from one end to the other, but ultimately, it does feel like home. works as the puppet's main base. It's a factory where they manufacture more of themselves. Vanini himself went to stop them, but I'm worried. He's an industrialist, not a fighter. Rescue Vanini and shut down his factory. That will deny the puppets their reinforcements. Benini is a billionaire philanthropist and the mastermind behind the production of puppets in Krat, as well as the author of many other inventions like the Legion Arms and the Tram Systems. He is also our next objective. Despite his genius, he saw fit to venture alone into his own factory, which has been taken over by puppets. Geppetto expresses concerns over Benini's well-being and tasks us with finding him, as well as shutting down the factory so that the puppets can't create any more reinforcements. While Geppetto was the mind behind the Grand Covenant that binds the puppets to serve their masters, Benini was the genius who made it work. At 18 years old he would establish his factory, which would go on to produce puppets bound to the Covenant en masse. Right out of the gate we already learned some interesting tidbits. We learn of a quack called Dr. Curall peddling some cure for the petrification disease. The factory is also where the long-running joke of collapsing bridges in Lies of Peace starts. Many platforms will collapse and make you fall down, and this does get old very quickly. Hopefully by the late game you will have learned not to trust any bridge you see. Despite a gesture alluding to this phenomenon, it does not seem to do anything. However, you can use throwable items to check if bridges are safe to walk across or not. Before I continue talking about the factory, I must mention one of the most interesting and memorable aspects of Lies of P. The Riddler. Another fine day in the city of Krat, but I wonder, my friend, just where you've been? Ah! <laughs> Arlecchino, the king of riddles, is one of the most colorful personalities that you will encounter in Lies of P and one of the creepiest. While the game has been fairly realistic so far, it has lacked that certain lunacy that Bloodborne, for example, had in spades. Every Yarnamite was completely out of their fucking minds, and it added to an uncomfortable, uncanny feeling to the setting. Arlequino does this perfectly, as halfway through a conversation with him, you can tell he is a few rungs short of a ladder. He offers you riddles to solve with binary answer choices. Get it right, and you get a key, get it wrong, and he will ruthlessly tear into you, but still give you a key out of pity, most of the time. Sometimes you will get a chance to redeem yourself, but it's best to answer correctly, and the questions aren't particularly hard if you're paying attention. Every time you answer a question correctly, your humanity will increase, which it, until now, has only done if you have lied. As such, I think now is a good time to go briefly over what humanity is. One of the main shticks of Lies of P is, well, the lying, surprise surprise. When you lie, a message will pop up. The content of the message will change as you lie more, but the point remains the same throughout the game. This shows how your humanity is growing. Other ways to increase your humanity is to listen to records back at Hotel Krat. 
and through some other specific moments that I will talk about as they appear. I will also mention how humanity is affecting P as the game progresses. Upon a correct answer, Arlecchino will give you a trinity key. These open trinity sanctums which usually have some sort of outfit in them. So really you're only missing out on fashion souls if you fail the riddles. The severity of this punishment is completely up to you to judge. At last we can turn to the factory itself. And despite its clear-cut industrialism, there are a few things that do stand out. First, you don't get 10 feet into the area without being attacked by a small girlish puppet. It looks an awful lot like a child. It begs the question that will be repeated for many puppets to come, which is, why would anyone make that? What was their purpose before the frenzy? Since this never really becomes apparent, it is a rather creepy addition in my opinion. At this point we also start gathering attribute purification and attribute resistance samples. These were used to allow puppets to survive in dangerous areas where they could be damaged. But the necessity of this item alludes to a rather grim reality. Puppets are the working class, that is clear. But the extent to which the puppets were used is never stated, but it can be inferred through environmental storytelling. It is this early that we can figure out that puppets were sent to very hazardous and dangerous areas, they were an infinitely replaceable labor source. The description for the exploding pickaxe weapon only deepens this interpretation. The puppets are merely tools, nothing else. If one breaks, it can easily be replaced. Right before you enter the factory proper, you will also be able to spot the St. Frangelico Cathedral, which we will be visiting next. I'm glad that Lies of P continues the tradition of letting you spot these different areas that you will go to or have been to. It makes the world seem much more connected. Right at the start of the factory you can find the Salamander Dagger. Combined with the Coil Stick, we have two of three status effect weapons in Lies of P. That, the pools of corruption in and around the factory, as well as the fire spitting puppets make this a good time to talk about status ailments. There are three states that you can apply on enemies. Electricity, which is useful against puppets. Fire, which works great against carcass enemies, and acid, which seems to work best against human enemies. However, you can also mix and match. They all scale with advanced, so you will have to level up that stat as well if you want to make use of them. Even if you have high motivity or technique, the weapon will generally be less useful than its normal counterparts if you do not have an appropriately advanced stat level. When applied to you, shock will gradually drain your stamina. Overheat will make you receive fire damage while the effect is active, though you can dodge to make this go away faster. Decay would be the acid equivalent. It makes your weapon's durability slowly decrease. Then we have the unique status ailments. Electric shock will, instead of stamina, drain your fable slots. Meanwhile, if you're afflicted with corruption, your health will start ticking down. And break will decrease the health regained when healing. Lastly, Disruption is largely a one-off effect very late in the game. If the bar fills up, you will instantly die, much like Terror in Sekiro or Madness in Elden Ring. The main thing in Vanini works to write home about is the level design. It's not linear like Elysian Boulevard, nor is it quite so circular as the Malum District will be. It's actually one of the biggest areas in the game. You have the above ground where you start, you have the underground tunnels and open sewage areas. Then you have the inner side rooms to explore that are next to the fox and cat, as well as the factory floor where Vanini is hiding. It's not as big as typical FromSoft areas, but every time I replay it, I'm reminded how much bigger it is compared to every other area in the game. This area also has the first side bosses, though it's not the area with the biggest number of optional encounters. That honor will go to the Baron Swamp. In general, one area in which Lies of P is severely lacking is optional content. There are no secret areas like Kanehurst Castle, Old Yarnum, or Dragon Peak. In fact, you progress from area to area in a purely linear manner. You can't wander off and discover things before the game tells you to. In that sense, it is less ambitious, and some freedom is taken away from the player. But for as story-focused as this game is, it's not entirely a bad thing in my opinion. It would have been nice if even just the Nini Works, the Cathedral and the Malum District had all been separate areas and not connected, since at the end you still have to go through a completely different route to get to Rosa Isabel Street. As you explore the factory, you will also come across the fox and the cat. Pleased to see you, my stalker friend. Two stalkers who are called by Vanini to protect him, though they promptly blew him off. The fox wishes you luck on your journey. 
Well, the cat scams you out of 500 ergo for a fake Vinini's landmark guide. It's a funny enough moment, and 500 ergo is really pocket change. For now, that is the extent of our interaction with them. Directly below them is a puppet of the future, a hulking bulldozer looking figure. The floor is covered in waste, which you will need to remove by going through the side area and finding a valve. After that, the boss becomes rather trivial, though it can still easily crush you with two hits this early on. The puppet of the future is not very interesting as a boss. It has slow attacks that deal a lot of damage, and this encounter is mainly made interesting by the corruption he is standing on. If you don't remove this, the boss will be incredibly hard. We fight two more of these guys later on in the swamp, where in addition to avoiding corruption, we must also avoid a volley from the ballista. Both of these encounters are rather forgettable, mostly made interesting by their surroundings and presentation. Lore-wise, there is next to nothing about them, though their existence does point to how normalized puppet labor is. This thing is, after all, just a replacement for a bulldozer or a wrecking ball, and has no other features. If we take Ego Awakening into account, how tragic must it be for one of these things to become self-aware? A horrifying thought. One of the optional encounters is our second human fight. Same rules apply as before. He can be backstabbed and will repeat the same three lines at you throughout the fight. The survivor is quite tanky though and can easily kill you even if you know what you're doing. None of these human fights are ever particularly easy nor are they ever frustratingly hard. Most of the time they just pose a curious annoyance and stand out sharply against the gallery of puppets with minute long windups. The story seems to be that when the tower, possibly the workshop tower, fell, he abandoned his sworn stalker brother, Leo, and ran away. His mask also implies that the survivor is a rookie stalker, as the masks of rookies are chosen by their superiors. Having forgotten his name, he now merely survives in a deranged haze of guilt and self-loathing. The final sideshow in the factory is the Trinity Sanctum. In the area besides the stalker siblings, we can find a door with a triangle on it. If you answered Arlequino's riddle correctly, you can now use the key he gave you to unlock this door. In it, you will find the Blue Blood's tailcoat, which is P's official outfit in the game's promotional material. Other than this, these sanctums aren't too much to talk about, and are right now only object to speculation, but we will touch more on them later. One thing that I did also want to talk about, but uh, forgot to mention before and couldn't really find any other place to put it, are these shield enemies. There are only three of these enemies, and they show up here in the factory, and two of them show up at the Grand Exhibition much later. What I like about these guys is that they perfectly embody the spirit of the combat in Lies of P. It's too bad that this guy is not a mandatory miniboss, because you are forced to learn how to block him. Strafing him isn't effective and neither is brute forcing. This guy is here to make sure that you've understood that blocking is just as important as dodging. They are both viable, but you still need to learn how to block. Don't be impatient, learn the timings, and wait for your opening. That is the way you defeat these guys, and that is the way you will beat the game. Above the factory floor, where the acid vat is, we can find Venini cowering. He asks us to put an end to his former foreman, Foco, and find Pulcinella, Venini's butler, who went to close the back door to the factory. Just like the Watchman, the attacks here are well telegraphed. His sweeps are obvious and his timings are easy. The main thing you might learn from him is when to dodge and when to block. Being able to switch between them, when to block the attacks you know the timing of, and when to uh, dodge the attacks you don't know how to parry is the main takeaway from this fight. At half health, Fuoco will enter his second phase. Fuoco's main niche is that he will sometimes cover the floor in fire and also shoot out pools of oil, which he can set on fire. This area denial is what makes his otherwise huge arena feel very cramped. He has lots of attacks that cover a wide area, so staying close to him is important. But if he has you in a vulnerable position, it will be very hard to avoid the fire. One small tip is to keep the red ceiling beams intact, as hiding behind them means that you are safe when Fuoco sprays the floor with fire. In fact, ever since the November 2023 update, these pillars can now only be destroyed by Fuoco's fury attacks. Speaking of fury attacks, he has this one charge attack which can be hard to parry. However, it has a long windup and he doesn't move horizontally very much, so you can very easily just dodge or run away from it. Again. This is another way that the game tells you that dodging is completely viable and sometimes better than repeatedly hitting your head against the wall trying to learn how to block an attack. As always, the soundtrack is amazing, the sort of military march type orchestral composition marking him as the King's Flame, one of the important players in the Puppet King's plan. Like with all other puppet bosses, his dialogue is at first garbled. 
In New Game Plus, it's notable that he does ask you to submit to his king, and that what they are doing benefits humans. Though this message comes off a little stronger and menacing than their intentions seem to be. So even if we did understand what he was saying, it's doubtful if we would have listened. After defeating Fuoco, you can find Pulcinella's body at the end of the room. Interacting with it and returning to Hotokrat, we can find Vanini and his butler now there. Vanini unlocks more legion arms for us, and also upgrades our grindstone to apply special effects to our weapons. Pulcinella functions as a secondary shop merchant, selling mostly armor, some weapons, grindstones, and other such high-end items. Benini also says that he has no idea what could have started the puppet frenzy, though he does name drop the king of puppets for the first time. Geppetto adds that he did, in fact, not design every puppet in Krat, and remembers that some puppets had broken away from the covenant before the frenzy began. Geppetto also says something interesting, something huge for the plot that seldom gets mentioned again. If puppets break away from the covenant, does that mean they have free will? Or are they merely under someone else's control now? We must ponder this question ourselves as we head for the next destination. The cathedral is famous for its wise and kind Archbishop Andreas. He offers sanctuary to countless refugees there. The thing is, I've lost touch with them. Perhaps no news is good news, but I'm a suspicious sort. And if the puppets push towards the cathedral, it could be devastating. Go save the Archbishop and the refugees before it's too late. We are sent to the cathedral by Geppetto to investigate the loss of communications with the Archbishop and Reyes. We can enter the area from the back door of Benini's factory. Benini's backyard seems to be some sort of mineshaft that connects to the nearby town of Moonlight. We find a few items and a weapon here, as well as another one of these annoying shovel enemies. Moonlight itself isn't notable in its gameplay, but has some interesting lore tidbits. Before Krat's economic boom, Moonlight Town was the most popular part of the region. At some point in the far past, a one-winged angel came down to Earth and met with Frangelico, who then went on to form the Cathedral. This was one of the main stops in pre-modern Krat. Pilgrims would start at the town when ascending to the Cathedral, and the Bishop Andreas worked closely with the town, offering it support where needed. Lots of people regarded the Bishop highly, considering him a saint of sorts. When the alchemists arrived in town, the decision to accept them was made in Moonlight Town, and while not outright stated, it is likely that Andreas was involved somehow, as it is said on a loading screen that the alchemists invested funds into rebuilding the cathedral. These days, the town is overrun by worker puppets, and little is left of it. The houses are abandoned and run down, some even collapsing. It's uncertain if this was an effect of the frenzy, or if Moonlight's golden days were over a long time ago. At the end of the road we meet a stalker with a dog mask, called the Atoned. She stands guard in front of the cable car, a modernization that came with Krat's industrial era. Before you would have to ascend through a rope and pulley method, now we have the convenience and ease of technology. However, the Atoned gaslight girl boss Kate keeps us from progressing. She has led many people to the cathedral, thinking it was a safe haven. That could not have been further from the truth. Monsters have taken over, and there are no survivors. Now, trying to redeem her folly, she makes sure nobody else can fall victim. If you killed the survivor in the factory, you will have gained the stalker's promise gesture. Using it here, and lying to her about being a stalker means you don't have to fight her. Otherwise, if you lack this gesture, you will have to grab the key for the cable car from her corpse. Either way, we progress. The ride is somewhat long, so to fill the empty air, Gemini will give you a guided tour. Fascinating town, Moonlight, just fascinating. Back in the day, the only way to reach the cathedral was using a rope and pulley. <laughs> so, thanks for building it on a cliff, St. Frangelico. Reaching the top, we find the corpses of humans, puppets, and things we have never seen before. These are carcass enemies. They are the results of advanced petrification disease, and a little something else, which we will get to later. In any case, these guys aren't a part of the natural fauna here, and the cathedral is filled with them. Thankfully, as a helpful note points out, they are susceptible to fire. The salamander dagger that we picked up in the factory and the flum badge will make quick work of them. We reach a small chapel at the Bridge of Atonement. 
A statue bids us to rest, and if you return with the prayer gesture later, you will get some humanity if you use it in front of the statue. We also find a note from a woman who is praying for the safety of her daughter, Charlotte, begging God to lift this curse from Krat. On Elysium Boulevard, we found another note from a man suffering from the petrification disease, who had sent his wife Louise and daughter Charlotte to the cathedral, hoping to spare them from the crisis in town. It's tragic that, instead, he merely sent them from one gruesome fate to another. Beyond the chapel you will find Giangio, an alchemist pretending to be a pharmacist. Ah, mercy! I beg you, don't kill me! He will offer you the cube in exchange for finding a tree that produces gold coin fruit, said to be a mythical wonder medicine. The cube is very useful. For now you can only get an extra heal, but later you can fit it to boost your stamina and My other stats, as well as buffing your specter for boss battles. It is a useful tool in a pinch, especially if you are struggling with a boss, and the long use time balances out its effectiveness, though this can be circumvented with an upgrade on the P organ. You have to keep returning to Gianjo to replenish its uses for now, though later you can buy more of them at once. In front of the cathedral, you will find puppets and carcasses fighting amongst each other. You will likely immediately forget about this, but upon a second playthrough, an incredibly enlightening bit of dialogue is revealed. We will come back to this much later, but keep it in the back of your mind. From the top of the bridge we can see most of Krat. We can see Venini Works, and Central Krat most prominently, as well as the tramway that leads to Hotel Krat. Immediately beneath us is Moonlight Town. We also get early sightings of the Grand Exhibit and the Estelle Opera House in the distance next to the Ferris Wheel. Here we cannot quite see the Malum district or the swamp, however we do see an island with a lighthouse off to the far left. This is not an area we can go to as of right now and honestly I don't even know what it is supposed to be. It is definitely not the Isle of Alchemists, so it could either be set dressing or DLC. These moments are some of my favorites in these games, just being able to see the whole map, how things are connected and where we will be going, a tease of our future challenges. In Lies of P though, we are shown the areas where we have already been to, which is a bit more uncommon. Usually this emphasis is put on new areas, if you look for example at Dark Souls 3. However, I believe this serves to guide us to the philosophical questions that the game poses. On the bridge, a simple for progression from one state to another, we look back. We are literally in a state of retrospection before we can grow or move on. Why are we here? What is our mission really? Who are we doing this for? And are we our own person, or just another puppet? These are important questions for truly understanding our journey in Lies of P, and I appreciate the small moment that lets us ponder these things. Upon opening the doors and resting, we can see Gianjo has moved into the cathedral. Going to the adjacent room with the organ, we will also get an early sighting of the boss of this area. However, I forgot to record it, so I can't really show it, unfortunately. As I stated before, the cathedral is home to the carcass enemies. These are largely rush enemies. They come at you with lots of delayed swings, so it's usually safer to dodge them. They go down easily, and other than the antler guys, I have never had much trouble with them. You could say that mechanically, this area teaches you to react to these fast and ruthless enemies with their delayed attacks. They move around much faster than puppets, so you have to be on your guard not to get stunlocked or have your attacks interrupted. You also get to learn how to avoid status afflicting attacks. Getting hit or blocking means that the status bar still fills slightly, so getting a perfect block saves you from any harm. Descending down into the hole in the cathedral we come to... Uh, I honestly don't know what to call this area. It seems like the inside of a clock tower? It's very mechanical, but I have no idea what it is powering. In any case, you can find a secret area here if you ride the wheels, and another one if you push down the fire brazier that will burn the pool of decay. Returning to the ground floor, you can find a secret room with your first cryptograph, which you can give to Venini to acquire a puzzle. You can find a few of these cryptographs in different areas. They're usually used by a high society to code secret messages, and cracking them will lead you to some neat goodies. This one will send you to the alchemist bridge on which you fought the donkey. 
Hitting the hung puppet will get you a key to a door on Elysian Boulevard, marked 221B, a Sherlock Holmes reference. There you can find the outfit for the Owl Doctor. For now, we go forward and unlock a shortcut. Here we encounter our second mandatory miniboss, after the constable in the very beginning. And the game has quite a few of these. I don't know if I like this addition or not. On one hand, I can't think of any From Software game that locks areas behind normal enemies like this, except maybe Sekiro. On the other hand, these do serve as like a sort of pop quiz to see if you are ready for the rest of the area. They are usually a challenge, and something a first time player will definitely struggle with. However, considering how short the levels in Lies of PR, it feels like these enemies also pad the game a bit, making the areas seem much longer than they actually are. On a repeat playthrough, these enemies should not give you too much trouble, and the illusion of length is broken. Still, I can't say I dislike them for this reason or any other. They are infuriating, and it feels weird to gatekeep progress like this, but they are one of the few objectively hard parts of the game that presents a real challenge to the player. In any case, once you defeat this shield carcass, you... Descend further? Into the cathedral library. So we start off at the ground floor, then we ascend to fight the shield boss, and then we go back down again. The logistics and architecture are, as always, complete from soft nonsense. But you don't really notice this when you're playing. Down in the library we find a nun named Cecile, who is, shock of all shocks, afflicted with the petrification disease. Take a shot every time someone in Krot has it. Though she seems to have lost hope on a cure, she asks us to retrieve the Archbishop's holy mark. There are quite a few interesting things in the library, but those will all become relevant later. For now, they don't make a lot of sense to us. We can find the same enemies here as we did below, so we can run past them. Around the back area here, we can find an elevator. Going up, we can find this shifty fellow called Alidoro the Hound. Treasure Hunter Extraordinaire. Dark Boy VTuber over here is looking for refuge and we can send him directly to Hotel Krat, or tell him to go to Venini Works. If we send him to the factory, we can later find him there, and he will be mad at us. We can lie again and tell him to go to Elysium Boulevard, but he will see through our lie this time and head to the hotel himself. You don't want to miss out on Aldoro as he is involved in a few character stories and will also sell you boss weapons and amulets. These are your standard fanfare. You can choose to use a certain boss's ergo either on a weapon or a very heavy amulet with great benefits. Like being able to dodge through a fury attacks and having a chance not to consume a pulse cell. You cannot dismantle the weapons but they are some of the strongest ones in the game. I got the 7 coiled sword and proceeded to beat the rest of the game with it with very little difficulty. As it is one of the fastest motivity weapons while also having an uninterruptible fable art attack. Up here we can also see the entirety of Krat one more time from a much better angle, including the Malam district with its stone towers. The swamp remains elusive. Coming back down we can circle the area to find the Archbishop's diary and holy mark. We can then open the shortcut for the boss battle as well as give the mark to Cecile. You will want to do this before beating the boss since she will turn into a monster if you don't. That is all for the cathedral though. You probably could have guessed, but the boss of the area is Andreas himself, deformed into a giant, grotesque monster. Andreas, despite his many virtues, was human after all. He succumbed to greed and seemingly abandoned those under his care, a fact which we can infer from a note that we read when we first entered the cathedral. To make sense of all this, I will be spoiling a major plot point which comes much later in the game. The carcass monsters we see are results of experimentation on the petrification disease. These experiments were done by the alchemists, the guys who first found Ergo. In his diary, Andreas blames the alchemists for the crisis that has befallen Krat, and he is not entirely wrong. He asked Cecile, a confessed murderer, to steal a relic from the alchemists and bring it to him, while he started taking in refugees. In his diary, Andreas mentions having a deep guilt about something, but it is hard to concretely say what. We know that the choice to accept the alchemists happened in Moonlight Town, which Andreas had close ties with. And while it is not said in-game, the loading screen lord leads us to believe that Andreas was working with the alchemists in some capacity, even taking money from them to rebuild the church. Andreas must have had reasons to send Cecile to steal the relic from the alchemists. We found out later that this relic is the Arm of God, which gets mentioned in a scribble in the church. 
It seems Andreas was planning to use the arm to, quote, purify Krat, whatever that means. It seems that after so much praise, the messiah complex got to him, and he started to truly seeing himself as the second coming of Saint Frangelico. The cryptograph we find at the bottom of the cathedral also provides some clues. It is written to Adelina, who we meet later in the game. But the writer mentions going to the cathedral with the alchemists, trying to redeem some sort of grave wrong the writer had committed before. If we follow the clues on the cryptograph, we find the aforementioned safe house 221B, where we find the Owl Doctor's apparel. We actually meet the Owl Doctor later. It seems that he has also been experimented on by the alchemists, forgetting his name and seeking to cure anyone who he thinks is suffering from the petrification disease by any means necessary. When killed, he mentions his beloved, Adelina. With this we can concretely connect the Owl Doctor to Adelina, which means he was the one who wrote the letter we read in the cryptograph. We also know then that the Owl Doctor wished to redeem himself for something. Well, as it happens, there is another doctor we hear about in the game, Dr. Curall, who was peddling a cure for the disease stolen from the alchemists. However, this cure only made victims transform into monsters. My theory is that Dr. Curall, or Clark Shore, stole a quote-unquote cure for the disease from the alchemists. This cure turned out to be fake and Dr. Curall was wrought with grief, as he says in his confession. However, what he didn't know was that the cure had worked as intended. The alchemists had been experimenting on disease victims and creating these carcass monsters. Unaware of this, Clark Shore is convinced by the alchemists to join them on their trip to the cathedral to administer more cures. As expected, all victims have turned into monsters, and Clark Shore is experimented on even further. The stalkers are believed to have a higher tolerance for the cure the alchemists are using. The question left unanswered is, how did they get in? Andreas hated the alchemists by this point, or he should have at least. However, if he was indeed so greedy, he could have been bought out by the alchemists to spread the cure among the refugees. Or alternatively, Clark Shore, aka the Owl Doctor, was used as a front to spread the cure, with the alchemists hanging back. Or a third option, high off his own hype and falling into delusions of grandeur, as well as possible influence of the Arm of God, Andreas had completely isolated himself from the rest of the refugees, not present for the moment when the alchemists would arrive. We have very little information about Andreas himself. It is likely that the answer is hidden within one of those three options, as everything else falls into place. The Arm of God is a rather curious item, though it is another one of those things which I will be talking about later as it becomes more relevant. It's not found in the cathedral to begin with, so we can move on for now. Finally, I will focus on Andreas' boss fight. It's quite a tricky one, as it is the game's first fight that has two health bars, which will become a norm from here on out. In the first phase, you fight the bloated frog. It can hit you with decay, which will make your weapon's durability go down. If the durability goes down completely, your weapon will break and become unusable until you rest. So here we might as well talk a little bit about the durability system. It's a bit of an odd addition. It almost feels like the developers felt that they needed to put in something to show that not every mechanic is stolen from From Software. It's inconvenient, especially in certain fights where you don't have room to fix your weapons. There are plenty of ways to circumvent this, however, with Vanini's urgent repair tools or with an upgrade to your P-Organ which allows you to mend durability when you apply a special status with the grindstone, which is what I did. It becomes quite trivial then, only becoming a nuisance if you forget about it completely, which happened to me only once. This is another aspect of the game I don't really know how to feel about. As I become better at the game, it really stopped being a bother at all. It does introduce an element of resource management into the game, which controls the pace of the battle. You will have to strategize when best to use your grind wheel, whether to do it on the first phase of a battle so that you don't get caught with your pants down during the second phase, or to try your luck as the fight goes on. I can see why people would find this mechanic annoying, but it's not that big of a deal in my opinion. Removing it wouldn't mean we lost too much, but it is well connected to applying special status effects to your weapons, not to mention, as I already said, it looks cool as hell. Besides, resource management has always been a thing in these games. Posture in Sekiro, weapons like the Tonitrus... 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 Weapons like the Tonitrus breaking in Bloodborne, not to mention blood vials, anybody still remember those? 
FP and Dark Souls and Elden Ring, so on and so on. This and the Legion Gauge aren't really that intrusive, especially with how many ways we can influence and upgrade these aspects. Now back to our regularly scheduled boss analysis. Andreas himself is a bit harder than Fuoco. He has fury attacks that are very hard to evade, he is one of the bosses that don't accommodate dodging very much, and he is quite big and has a lot of sweeping moves. The upside to this, however, is that his moves, while a little delayed at points, are quite easily managed. He doesn't have that many attacks, and the timing is fairly easy to get down after a while. I find him to be one of the easiest bosses in the game when it comes to learning how to perfect parry most of the attacks. The first phase is not very hard at all, and mostly serves to drain your pulse cells if you get lazy and stop paying attention. You do have to pay attention so you don't get decay and your weapons don't break. In the second phase the boss's back will open up, and a centipede like Andreas will now slither around. He is hard to hit, and he sways around a lot. His attacks are also quite broad. He has an incredibly annoying fury attack where he goes off screen so you can't see when he attacks you. Thankfully however, his frog form does stay the same, so instead of dealing with the noodle you can dodge around him and have a repeat of the first phase, which you should now be familiar with. He will have a new ground smack attack. I recommend trying to run under him whenever he goes for one of these, as he will continue moving forward. Backpedaling only works with a shorter version of this ground pound, but I can never tell which one he is going to use. He also has a beam attack. Your natural instinct might be to run under or behind him again, but after he shoots his beam he will plot down and send a shockwave behind him. It's best to stay in his periphery then while he charges, then immediately return to face him when he is done. It does have one batshit insane attack, which is when he starts zooming around the arena and ends it with a fury sweep that even I have trouble with. I would say that Andreas is to Lies of B what Genichiro is to Sekiro. They are both mid-game bosses that really force you to engage with their primary mechanics, namely blocking. They also have some dangerous unblockable attacks, and use status effects to their advantage, not to mention being one of the first examples of a boss having multiple stages. With Andreas, you need to learn his timing. Fire works well on him, as well as heavy weapons if you know when his openings are. And don't forget to use Fable Arts. If you get those three core ideas down, he becomes an incredibly easy boss, and another one of my personal favorites. Upon defeating Andreas, we get a cutscene showing all the bosses that we have fought so far. Their Ergo leaves them, and accumulates in a specific place. Here we also get an early bird cameo of Simon Manus. It's at this point that you're clued into the fact that you're doing everything according to this anime villain motherfucker. You're merely a... well, a puppet in a play. After beating Andreas, you can check up on Cecile to find her missing. She has left behind a record, as well as a note thanking us for giving a sinner like her a chance to stay human. After beating Andreas, we can do the whole song and dance routine with Alidoro, and find him back at the hotel. Eugenie will also thank you for leading Alidoro to the hotel, even despite your best efforts. She will also explain that she is from the country of the morning though she has very little connection to her homeland. Vanini will now ask you for help in getting to the bottom of the puppet frenzy, starting with understanding how the puppets operate. If my suspicions are correct, something in the puppet's very ergo is causing their aggression. I... I refuse to believe the king of puppets is truly behind this... this puppet rampage. It's too simple, but also a bit too much even for him. No, I suspect the ergo itself is corrupted, or at least compromised. If you return to Sophia at this time and have acquired enough humanity, she will point out how you have been changing, even to a degree that Geppetto himself might not have expected. That is how you are unique. You can go beyond a puppet's limits. I don't even know if Geppetto is aware of this. A victim of the petrification disease turned into a monster. That's just tragic. Could the disease lead to puppet frenzy? Hmm. No, that doesn't make sense. Remember, puppets cannot get the disease. But puppets shouldn't frenzy either. I made them to obey and protect humans, not go berserk and harm them. But the stalkers blame me. They think I worked with the alchemists to spread the disease to puppets. <sighs> How sad. 
smallest resentment, with a lie at the root of it. That's why my only wish is that you stay a good boy. No resentment, no lies. You think it's the water? <laughs> Thinking about the city's pipes, they connect to the Malam district. Their water supply might be tainted too. I don't know what's happening in the Malam district. The Black Rabbit Brotherhood seized the neighborhood. That's all I know. It was always a run-down neighborhood, but it's descended into anarchy, or worse. I'm hearing rumors of monsters rampaging through the district. Those poor people. They need your help, son. Pepero and Sophia urge you to go to the Malum district, though this entire trip feels a little bit contrived. We'll get back to the reason at the end of this section, but for now just know that Geppetto and Sofia have heard bad news coming from the slums and ask you to check out the situation. The possibility of a confrontation with the local troublemakers, the Black Rabbit Brotherhood, is also set up. Descending from the cathedral, you can enter the woods, which are reminiscent of Hemme Charnel Lane from Bloodborne, leading to the slums right before Malum District. Outside of a few items and butterflies, this area is largely uninteresting. Except for the fucking plague bear, we do come across a grave with a smiling bunny mark. The gravestone reads, A child who was a blessing to their family lives here. May he rest in peace. I won't mention this anywhere else in the video, but I believe this could be Carlo's grave. The smiling bunny mark could have been left by the legendary stalker, as some attribute her mask to look like a bunny or a rabbit head. The Brotherhood is definitely familiar with her, at least enough to recognize her combat abilities when Carlo, or P, mimics them. It could be that she also served as an inspiration for the Black Rabbit Brotherhood. But ultimately this is purely speculation on my part and otherwise unimportant. Next to the grave there is also a rusted stargazer which we cannot interact with uh, as of right now. This is likely a part of DLC. As we unlock a shortcut we also find an interesting note. Everything changed. Whose blue hair is it in his cane? We can infer that this is talking about Manus, and he has a piece of blue hair in his cane that likely belongs to Sophia. It is unclear when exactly, but it seems Manus and the alchemists have been doing the rounds around Krat, sharing their medicine which has been turning citizens stricken with the petrification disease into carcass monsters. We make our way through the woods and enter Brotherhood territory, and we get a very welcoming reception. <laughs> the Malam district is completely run down, and there is seemingly nobody left. Some areas are almost flooding with how much water there is. Although the Brotherhood mentions protection fees being waived for anyone who manages to kill us, we see nobody here except the fox and the cat. And they seem ready for a scuffle. They offer their help out in dealing with the Black Rabbit Brotherhood, though their intentions aren't quite clear. The cat even derides us for being so gullible as to accept their help. We don't get far before he sits down and tells us to go ahead. Right after, the Brotherhood announces our identity to the rest of the district. They seem ready for a fight against the Brotherhood, but we later find out that they must have worked even together with them for the Alchemists. It could be that they expected us to eventually reach Malum, but the Fox seems somewhat surprised to see us at all. Or maybe the treasure that the Brotherhood is supposed to have is the gold coin tree, the fruits of which they are looking for. In any case, they turn out to be of little help, and we must make it through the rest of the district on our own. And what a shithole it is. We get assaulted by all sorts of carcass monsters, remains of the alchemists' work. Their brotherhood likely didn't know exactly what the alchemists were planning, but it seems to me that if nobody is alive or human enough to even pay protection fees, then what's the fucking point? The merchant we find is the only other NPC in Malum, and even he is surprised to see that anyone is still kicking. Who is he selling to if nobody's here? The Black Rabbits seem to be his bosses, but I can't imagine that business is booming in this part of town. And he seems far too happy when we drive them away later. Dude, you just lost your only long-term customers in this shithole. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Whatever. We also find our second phone, so you know what time it is.
Interestingly enough, Arlecchino mentions a connection to Candle of ours. It could be that he means Lampwick slash Romeo, but how he would know that is beyond me. Anyway, you can get your Trinity key and return to the cathedral to open the door there. If you get the answer wrong here, he will give you a box that explodes instead. You will still get a key though. Up ahead we also see the youngest of the Black Rabbits, who we also spotted riding the trams in Elysian Boulevard. No matter what, there will be a scripted event where you activate a bear trap. It doesn't hurt you or even give you any sort of status effect, it just seems to be a funny little gag. We circle around the Red Lobster Inn, and from there we unlock a shortcut to the boss arena. The Red Lobster is... interesting, as we find a guide for the Mona Charity House here, as well as scribbles on a painting from Carlo and Romeo, declaring to become legendary stalkers. For the uninitiated, the Mona Charity House was formerly known as the Rose Estate. It used to be an orphanage for slum kids, but after the alchemists came, they sponsored many aspects of Crud. The aforementioned rebuilding of the cathedral, the alchemist bridge, and even seemed to have their sigil in City Hall. They also seem to have sponsored Rose Estate, which came to bear the name of the leader of the alchemists, Valentinus Monad. We can see his statue at the start of the game in front of Crot Central Station. I did briefly wonder if the inn could have been the charity house at some point. After all, we find so many things connected to the Rose Estate in Malum, but I think that's more of a coincidence than anything else. The sign on the Lobster Inn says that you can eat traditional Crot food here, and I doubt the Brotherhood would put up such a sign. So it seems that the inn is legit, or at least was at some point. This whole chapter, especially the district of Malum itself, is rather short. But when I was first playing, I barely noticed. It doesn't even have a mandatory mini boss like some other areas. I especially like how it circles around on itself. We come back to the point where we started in front of the Red Lobster. The rundown atmosphere, the flooded streets with the speakers static in the background, gives this place an amazing atmosphere. The Malum District is one of my favorite areas in the game. It really reminds me of home. Regardless, we meet up once again with our compatriots. Looking good. Who'd have thought we'd make it this far? You've got all kinds of skills. This is likely the worst voice acting in the entire game. The game has otherwise phenomenal performances, but the fox really fumbles her lines here. I don't know if it was the VA's fault or direction wasn't sufficient, but yeah. Uh, it's definitely the weakest, but no, that's alright, since the rest of the game has truly phenomenal voice acting. Bring it on. You ain't seen nothing like my brother. Finally, the Brotherhood fight. The Black Rabbit Brotherhood are four siblings, former stalkers that have taken over the Malum District by force after the stalker organization was wiped out during the fall of the Workshop Tower. They are in bed with the alchemists now, supplying them ergo and cold coin fruits, seemingly to get out of the city. This is Neowiz's first and only gang boss in the game, since we go for a second round with the same fellows later. In this fight you really only need to kill the eldest, but taking care of his siblings is almost mandatory. As you chip away at the pig's health, one of three of his siblings will come down to the arena. The nimble youngest, the spear-wielding eccentric, or the duelist battle maniac. The first to join is the youngest, who is likely the most annoying out of the four siblings, which is hard to pin down and some of her attacks will throw you into the air or otherwise stagger you. She doesn't do a lot of damage, but she's definitely the most troublesome, with the hardest attacks to block. Her combos are quick, so if your own swings are slow, she will likely outpace you. Her frame is also incredibly tiny, so backstabs aren't a reliable strategy here. However, she has the lowest poise out of the four, but getting her into a corner and then letting loose can let you get decent damage. But be careful that you don't overcommit, since you either won't have stamina to run away, or the eldest will bother you. Church attacks are also difficult against her, as she can cover a lot of ground very quickly. Cheesing her with items or your legion arm is a decent strategy, if you're having trouble hitting her. Since the Brotherhood are all humans, they are weakest to acid damage. Bring it on. You ain't seen nothing like my brother. After a certain amount of damage has been dealt to the eldest, uh, regardless of if the youngest is present or not, the third sibling will enter the arena, the eccentric. A complete antithesis to the youngest, the eccentric is the easiest to deal with. 
He is the second tallest, which means he has the biggest frame out of the backstabbable enemies. The wind down on his attacks are also generous, which means you can easily circle around him for a backstab or damage in general. His attacks are mostly thrusts, so he is also very easy to dodge. Bring it on. You ain't seen nothing on Finally, the Battle Maniac. His attacks come in swings and thrusts, meaning he has a wide range in all directions. Unlike his sister, who is prone to run away, the difficulty with getting close to him is not taking any damage. Some of his wind downs are long enough for you to try and backstab, but this can also leave you open for another combo of his. I'd recommend waiting for him to get close to you while he is attacking, then either closing the distance after the combo if you have a dexterity build, or trying to swing at him immediately with a heavier, longer strength weapon. Bring it on. You ain't seen nothing on in general, when talking about the three smaller siblings, I recommend dodging to parrying here, since their attacks can be quick and hard to time. Instead, putting distance between you and them when needed, and avoiding damage at all, is much more beneficial to trying to parry their attacks and failing. I also recommend always taking care of whichever sibling appears during the fight, before engaging with the oldest again. Neowiz made the excellent decision to only have them come at you one by one, meaning you aren't as overwhelmed as you would be typically with From Software's usual gank bosses. You can use the puppet string to pull them in. Their health bars aren't big enough to make it too worthwhile, but status effect items can't easily cheese them. The merchant in the Red Lobster sells infinite items, so make use of that too. Now, finally, the main event, the eldest. Bring it on. You ain't seen nothing like my brother. Yeah, yeah, yeah I got it already. Once you've taken care of his siblings, he is all yours. His attacks are telegraphed well enough so that learning to block isn't too hard, but since his combos are very long and there is not a lot of downtime between them, you will have to be very consistent with your blocks. The reach on his weapon also makes dodging difficult, since you have to get closer to him than he needs to be to you. He also has attacks that catch you as you dodge away, making him quite a tough pickle. Parrying enough of his attacks will break his sword, however, which gives you more breathing room and lowers his damage output remarkably. When he charges at you, especially when you are fighting one of the three younger siblings, you can rather easily run around his attack if you keep an eye on him. His overhead swings are easy to dodge as long as you dodge to the side. This also leaves him open for a punish, though he might sometimes have follow-up attacks, so be careful. His spin attacks are quite fun to parry, when it comes to dodging, you can avoid this by simply running out of range, waiting for it to end, then countering with a heavy attack while he recovers. Putting some distance between you and the eldest, you can pop a status grind wheel and try to proc burn or acid. If need be, you can also just lob shit at him like I did here. That is also super effective. A lot of people hate these bosses, the Brotherhood ones, but personally, I do not agree. They're not my favorites, but they're also not nearly as bad as people make them out to be. As always, you gotta learn the timing and what strategy works best for which sibling. Thankfully, the add-ons don't have a lot of health, but apparently if you do summon a Spectre, the aggro of the Eldest goes crazy, and he just keeps attacking. Usually, when you have more than one enemy on the arena, only one of them will be aggro towards you, and the others will just walk around. Uh, I haven't really tried this myself, so take it with a grain of salt. The most disappointing thing about this boss, or actually both instances of the Brotherhood bosses, is the fact that we get no drip. Seriously, these guys are some of the flyest motherfuckers in the entire game and we get no Black Rabbit costume? Not even the dude's weapon? Come on. You do get 10k ergo and a quartz, but your biggest haul will be an interesting painting that you can find in the Black Rabbit Brotherhood lair. Hey, check this out. Looks like you, sorta. From a certain angle. You know, if you squint. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm just kidding. No, it, it looks exactly like you. I mean, you see it, right? With the nose and the... Right? At the other end of Town Hall, you will find an elevator. The this will bring you up device. where you can find Giangio and the gold coin tree. The gold coin tree is a rather weird mechanic, admittedly. It kind of works like a phone game. Every few minutes you can grab its fruits and trade them for a wish stones. You can also use them later at the Saintess of Mercy to respec. You get boosters from butterflies and you can even get upgrades to increase the amount of fruit and decrease the wait time, but I never did any of these. Coming back every once in a while and getting the standard 8 fruits was perfectly enough to get me through the game. 
But I guess it is nice that we have these options. It kind of reminds me of Rice and Sekiro, but I honestly have a hard time finding any other parallels to this in From Software games. I guess it can be called innovative, but yeah, I, I really don't know what to make of it. It's, it's a funny little addition if you think about it for very long, but it's also not too annoying. Some people complain that they have to farm for the gold coin fruit, but I honestly do not see it. I think you get plenty for the amount of time you have to wait, and honestly, if you're using them as that big of a crutch that you need to constantly have gold coin fruit or recovery wish stones on you, then maybe ju you just need more practice rather than more gold coins. Anyway, as it turns out, the tree is located in a secret area within Hotel Crot, which means we have circled back to home base. Antonia hid this tree from the alchemists and outsiders, but it seems the Brotherhood still found it. Now, a little side tangent here. It doesn't make much sense for us to go to the Malum district in the long run. Both Geppetto and Sophia say that the citizens seem to be in danger and that the Black Rabbit Brotherhood is terrorizing the area, but there's very little in terms of the overarching narrative that compels us to go there. After the cathedral, when talking to Geppetto, he seems to suggest that there might be something in the water, to which Geppetto says that the canals run through Malum, which might mean that the people there might also be infected. But once we defeat the Brotherhood and read their ledger, we found out that they've been dealing with the alchemists, selling them five ergo? Ten? I mean, one puppet has like 40. What the fuck were these guys doing? Anyway, they seem to want to get out of the city and even stealing gold coin fruit to do this. But they do note that the hotel people are onto them. So are they talking about Antonia? She seems none the wiser. Geppetto? Maybe. If he knew that they were working with the alchemists, it would make sense why he would send us here. But the fact that we don't really do much else here, we don't do anything with the water, etc. Uh, this kind of sidetrack makes it feel a bit weird in retrospect and when trying to fit this into the overall story. Uh, but yeah, that's like a little, little nitpick sort of thing. I don't know. In any case, the district is quote unquote liberated if there's even anything left to save here. And while we do not get any resolution to the question of whether or not the water was contaminated, it does seem that the alchemists did come through here, which would explain the carcass monsters. The Black Rabbit Brotherhood. I remember them well. Even within the Stalkers, they were rebels. The four of them were loyal only to each other. Thanks to you, the people of the Malam District have a chance to rebuild. That is, if anyone is still left in one piece. And why not strike at the root of the problem? The King of Puppets' lair is on Rosa Isabel Street. Perhaps the puppet frenzy will come to an end if we can take down their king. We come to the second third of the game. We take two steps into Rosa Isabel and find an old lady suffering from the disease. He mentions how the puppets have been harassing the locals, that so long as you have the disease, they don't even let the dead rest, which is brilliant foreshadowing and an underrated throwaway line. Her quest is rather simple, so I will be covering it entirely right now. She asks us to bring her wine, specifically a bottle of La Bleuy, a famous brand that even the legendary stalker was supposed to like. When we move on to the next area, the Lorenzini Arcade, you can find a bottle in one of the cellars and bring it back to her. It will reward you with a Venini commemorative token, which will open up new things in Pulcinella's shop. The lady is generally unremarkable, but some in the fandom believe her affinity for the vine and age make her a possible candidate for being the legendary stalker that we sometimes hear about. I don't think this is the case, since I doubt they would make such an important character a random lady hiding in her house, but also because the stalker was close to Carlo. The lady, while it could be that the disease has taken her sight, does not recognize us, and so I think that alone disqualifies her automatically. I don't have much to say about Rosa Isabel Street. We return to the Belle Epoque era cityscape and continue fighting puppets. There are a few new enemies, mainly the Kamikaze Harlequins, the Soldier Puppets, and the Bomb Throwing Puppets. We also get a non-mandatory clown mini-boss, who is the source of much rage within the fandom, mine included. This motherfucker is incredibly hard to beat, and he laughs every time you die. He's a small, optional boss, 
uh, you can just run past him to the next stargazer. But if you do want to beat him, then there really is no shortcut, other than just spamming items. You just have to learn how to parry his attacks, no matter how many times he laughs in your face. We also encounter yet another human fight, namely a white woman. I mean, a white lady. The, wh the white lady. We get, we'll, we'll get back to the white lady in a, just a moment. After defeating her, we encounter Julian, who sends us to recover the belongings of his wife further up Rosa Isabel Street. I'll be honest, by this point, I had grown completely paranoid with the NPCs and wondered if he was some sort of thief who was using us to do his heavy lifting, but no. The twist instead is that his wife is a puppet. This confirms him as the eccentric gentleman, Jay, who we read about in Vanini Works from a newspaper. A man who married a puppet and who was ostracized by his family. That Sims' wife, Melody, died during the attack and he is now left alone and grieving. He asks us whether or not we believe that love can bloom on a battle. I mean, um, between a human and a puppet can exist. We can say that we've never heard of such a thing, or we can lie to him that she left behind a message telling him she loved him. Doing this, he mourns her passing, stating that he believes that puppets are just as capable of dealing as humans, that they have a heart inside them too. Now there are a few ways to take this. As we learn more about puppets and ergo, it becomes clear that puppets are capable of autonomy. We have plenty of examples of puppets acting on their own. If you haven't noticed, we play as one of those puppets. Alternatively though, we could also interpret this a bit more cynically. Puppets are generally bound to the Covenant and their masters, meaning they can't disobey. It could be that Julian was merely using his leverage over Melody to force her to be with him. We do see some sort of writing behind Melody's body, but we can't read it and it could just be random scribbles. At least we don't know this until the end of the game. After we beat Lexazia and free subject 890, we can read the message. And it does indeed say, I love you, Julian. I feel this was a bit unnecessary, maybe, as leaving it ambiguous whether or not she truly loved him was more interesting. There was more to discuss. We have nothing to go on other than his words and some illegible scribbles. Can puppets truly love? And if so, was this one of those cases? Or was it merely just another human abusing their power over puppets? We can relay this story to Polandina and support him in his feelings towards Antonia later. So clearly it's not out of the question that puppets can have such feelings. It's a rather interesting moment in my opinion, but it feels like Neowiz didn't want there to be any ambiguity on the wholesomeness of this interaction, so that's that. Regardless, it's still a fun twist and one I personally did not see coming. I skipped the lore section for the Malum district because there really wasn't much to say. The Malum district is old and has been there since before the industrialization of Krat. Much like Moonlight Town, it is one of the oldest parts of the city. We can see that from the stone tower through which we enter the district. Other than that though, I don't have too much to say. The Rose Estate was probably here, so this is likely where Carlo grew up. And at some point, the Black Rapid Brotherhood took over. That's pretty much it. Rosa Isabel also doesn't have too much lore, but it still has more than the Malum District. Named after Lady Rosa Isabel, a patron of the arts, wife to Valentinus Monad. Krat has an interesting culture of philanthropy. There are a lot of patrons of arts and science and the like, and cultural figures get places, streets, and buildings named after him. We have Rosa Isabel Street from Lady Rosa Isabel. The Estelle Opera House, likely from a lady called Estelle. We have the Lorenzini Arcade, which is named after Lorenzini Venini. We have Elysian Boulevard. Maybe there was somebody named Elysian at some point. Uh, Isabel Street, the entertainment district. You might call it extravagant. Operas, operettas, street concerts, all running 24-7. Adelina Corday, the singer in the red dress. Oh, she was the most famous of them all. The legendary prima donna. Rosa Isabel Street specifically was known for its high culture. Theater, plays, music ran 24-7. We can still hear some of that from the loudspeakers. Though it is French, despite this supposedly being Italy, I think. It should be Italy anyway. 
Lorenzini is definitely Italian. Geppetto should also be Italian, going off his name, and so is Antonio Ceresani. So I don't really know what's up with all the French stuff. Speaking of important figures like Antonia and Geppetto, right in front of the Opera House we see two statues. We have a fountain dedicated to the patron of the arts, Lady Antonia Ceresani. The other is a statue dedicated to a Camille by a certain GG. The Opera House is a beautiful place with a haunting soundtrack. It's a bit of a labyrinth, but we can find a trinity door here, as well as some items and weapons. If we take a sharp right as soon as we get in, we can find the private rooms of the performers. We even find the famed prima donna Adelina Corday. She laments how the disease has taken away her ability to sing. She also claims that someone called Riddles fooled her into coming to the opera house, where she now remains trapped. If we give her a red apple, which we can buy from Polandina after giving him a crot supply box, she will confess to covering her sister Patricia's voice to the point where she poisoned her. Patricia, having lost her ability to sing, abandoned her career as an actress and became a stalker. This is the white lady we killed earlier, believing that her sister had been taken by the puppets. Adelina Corday is also the lover of the aforementioned Owl Doctor, or Clark Shore. It seems she was supposed to go to their safe house, but the King of Riddles, our Lakino, duped her into coming to the Opera House. If we have a Trinity key and return to the Sanctum here, we can read a message left behind by our Lakino describing a songbird whose tongue had been cut out. It remains vague exactly what happened. Arlecchino, as far as we know, can't move from where he is, so it seems impossible that he could have killed her, or even poisoned her, or anything. But later when we meet Arlecchino, he asks us if we have witnessed his handiwork, and if we were impressed. He mentions having learned some alchemy tricks from his former master, which would mean he caused Adelina's petrification disease, since we know the alchemists are deeply connected to it. At the end of the day, she dies after you defeat the King of Puppets, but the body does not contort in any way. What did Arlecchino do to her exactly, and when? The white lady believes her sister to be dead, so it must have happened some time ago now. Poor Adelina is connected to quite a few tragic figures in this game, though her end could be seen as karmic justice for poisoning her sister and living the glorious life of a renowned actress instead. Putting further salt on the wound that is her story, if you get one of Arlecchino's questions wrong, you have to use the red apple at her statue to get a key. This means that if you answer one of his questions incorrectly, Arlecchino makes you forego the only kindness you can give to Adelina if you want to get a trinity key. Truly his evil knows no bounds. If you retrieve the portrait from the Malum district and around this time return to the hotel and have been obviously lying throughout the game, Sophia will mention that something is growing out of the portrait you brought back. Going up, we can see a nose growing out of it. I'm glad you're here, my son. Have you seen that painting? I can't believe my eyes. It's almost as if something is growing out of the portrait. I remember commissioning that piece from an artist named D. Gray. Like all artists, he was eccentric. He claimed that a painting could harbor a living soul. But how can that happen? Just like the fairy tale. Forgive a foolish man his ramblings. Perhaps the seed of its growth was there all along. Geppetto's explanation is an allusion to the portrait of Dorian Gray. I think most people know this story, but to summarize, a man called Dorian Gray has a portrait of him. He is a rather wicked and debaucherous man, but he does not suffer any repercussions from his actions. Instead, his portrait degrades over time, granting him relative immortality. Just as in the story, in Lies of P, the more we lie, the more the nose on the portrait grows, reflecting our inner nature, just as the portrait of Dorian Gray reflected his inner nature. What's cool is that you can actually see the shadow of P's nose grow as well. We face the King of Puppets, the supposed origin of this puppet frenzy.
play he lays out before us is rather obvious in its metaphor, but still we decline his invitation to a tea party. At first we fight the mech. Its moves are slow and wide. There is a lot of room to dodge. If he swings from the left, you dodge to the left. If he swings from the right, you dodge to the right. With these big bosses, and really not only in Lies of P, but in any FromSoft slash Souls-like game, it's always best to dodge, in my opinion, into the attack. Otherwise, once the invincibility frames wear off, you'll get hit. A lot of the king's moves are also slow enough that they make for easy parries. In either case, whether you dodge or parry, the first phase isn't all too bad. Maybe just a little spongy if this is your first time playing the game. During the king's first phase, at around half health, he will start crying. When he does this, run away, as it will easily allow you to dodge the following attack. The king will now use his propellers more, which will launch you into the air. The mech will sometimes shoot out mines, but these are only dangerous when he pushes you away into them. Otherwise, you can easily avoid them and also use this opportunity to punish him. I couldn't catch it on video myself, but he has a propeller attack with a very long windup. This is incredibly hard to dodge because it covers a lot of ground. You need to quickly run to the complete opposite corner of the arena, which depending on the king's positioning is very hard to do. The tables can also get in your way, which is why I always try to clean them out during the first phase. I wish they would stay broken after your first encounter with the king, as it becomes pointless busy work afterwards. As always, the first phase is just a pulse cell sink. Stay patient, take a break if you need, then come back. Remember that puppets are weak to electricity. Also try to grind your weapon before you proceed to the next phase. Since the mech has very likely used up a lot of your weapon's durability, and fixing it during the second phase is much harder. The mech blows up and we now fight Romeo. Romeo's combos are short, usually 2-3 to three attacks long, which means there is a lot less to avoid. Even his damage in the first half is rather low, all things considered. In Romeo's first phase, wait out his combos. There is a lot of time in between them. He also has a very long stagger animation, which is great to get a fuel light or even a charge attack in. When he goes in for a fury kick, simply dodge to the side. It's very easily avoidable. I think I only got hit by this once, maybe twice. What is not easily avoidable is his flame foul dance. It's his longest combo with many sweeping attacks that will easily break your posture and cause fire damage. Try to dodge in and to the side, which will make him go around in circles. It's hard to run away from this one since he can jump quite far. But other than this specific one, which he sometimes repeats, his attacks will generally remain the same. As with most bosses, don't be greedy when it comes to breaking his posture. His attacks are quick, and they will likely stagger you out of your charge attack. Bide your time and be careful. Use an upgraded puppet string or shot put if you can. Once the king is defeated, we can find Geppetto behind the opera house. We can also meet with Sophia at the hotel. Talking to her will activate this cutscene. Many of those children grew up at the Rose Estate and became alchemists, technicians, and stalkers. I hope the king didn't harm any of them. Or don't tell me. The king's ergo is actually... Are you okay? You look ill. Ever since I mentioned the necklace. My heavens, you look... Carlo. Just as a puppet's hair cannot grow, neither can a human boy's nose. We can finally talk about the core of Lies of P. I think this is an appropriate time. I will be spoiling a lot of the story, but I think all the pieces are in place now for everything that we have learned until this part to make sense. The game does a good enough job of building all of these twists up. The one with the alchemists and the one with Geppetto. However, this video's purpose is not to retell the same story, but to analyze the events of the story with the knowledge that we get later on. Early on, important moments like the Cathedral and Romeo can only be put into context much later, or upon a repeated playthrough. As such, to make this video as easily digestible as possible, without having to keep so many things in mind at once, 
I'm discussing the twists when I feel like it is most convenient and sensible to talk about them. Let's start off with Romeo, the King of Puppets. Some time ago, there were two boys, Romeo and Carlo. We first hear of them back at the Malum district, when we read the flyer and the scribbles on the painting. Romeo and Carlo were two kids at the Monet Charity House, aka the Rose Estate, which had turned from an orphanage to a boarding school. There you could get an education to become a stalker, who served the powers in control of Krat, a workshop technician, working on puppets and other inventions, or an alchemist, who dealt in ritualistic religious practices on their isle. Carlo was the son of Geppetto, and his mother was likely Camille. However, Carlo resented his father, who was too busy to ever interact with his son, even missing his graduation from the boarding school. We get the uniform that Carlo wore from Antonia. Carlo and Romeo wished to become legendary stalkers, which was likely the education they got at the Monet school. There, we later find out Carlo also met the legendary stalker, a famous woman who belonged neither to the Sweepers nor the Bastards, the main stalker factions. She likely trained Carlo in some capacity, or at least Carlo studied her. The battle maniac comments during the first Brotherhood fight that we don't fight like a sweeper nor a bastard, and if we battle the fox much later on, she comments how we remind her of the legendary stalker. Now, you might be wondering, what is the connection between Carlo and P, our player character? It's not merely an appearance, as Gemini points out. At some point during Carlo's stay at the Mona Charity House, the petrification disease hit it. This was likely the first mass outbreak of the disease, although it had been considered a poor people's illness before, as we can read from a loading screen. There were no survivors found during the aftermath. An incident report also states that Valentinus Monad, leader of the alchemists, the man whose statue we see at the beginning of the game, perished during the outbreak. And it is highly likely that Carlo, Geppetto's son, as well as Carlo's friend Romeo, also died during this outbreak, or at least were infected with the petrification disease and died shortly after. This would not be Geppetto's first loss, however. Remember, in front of the Opera House, we find a statue dedicated to a certain Camille, from a certain GG. We get only two pieces of concrete information about Camille, one more obvious, the other a bit more vague, but just as important, if not more so. The more elusive one, is in the form of the Saintess of Mercy statue gallery key, which we get slightly later on in the game. The description of the key reads, The genius engineer Camille received a request from the alchemists to create a masterpiece. This was the Saintess of Mercy statue that brought back to life the puppets under golden divine protection. Camille was a genius engineer and inventor, much like Giuseppe Geppetto, GG. It is more than likely that they both worked in the workshop and as such had some sort of a relationship. However, Camille's life would be cut short. Still, this is not the end of her story. By the time she had passed, puppets powered by the resource known as Ergo were widespread. The book First Discovery Camille gives us a rather bleak look into what happened to her after her passing. For context, let's listen to Sophia's explanation on the nature of Ergo. Petrification disease, puppet frenzy, and carcass monsters don't happen by chance. They're all related to Ergo. Ergo is the essence of life made from the petrification disease. It contains the memories and distilled lifespan of the victim. That's why puppets sometimes awaken their old selves or describe someone else's memories. So, Ergo is the culmination of memories and essence of a human, trapped by the petrification disease. This same Ergo is what is being used to power the puppets. Camille was one such puppet. She must have passed from the disease, after which her Ergo was used to turn her into a maid puppet. Maybe by Geppetto himself. From genius inventor to maid puppet, Camille continued her motherly duties to the point of saving a baby as it fell from its crib. Camille's look, personality, and duties were so similar to those she had had during her life that the ergo inside her awakened her ego and gave her consciousness. She was promptly taken apart and studied by the alchemist. It's uncertain if Geppetto had anything personally to do with this. Simon does call Geppetto a former colleague of his, but it's also clear that Geppetto had a falling out with them, 
The treatment that Camille got could have been one of the reasons for that falling out. Carlo would pass after his mother, also from the purification disease. But by now, Geppetto was wiser. Carlo's favorite book was the in-universe canon Adventures of Pinocchio. The description for the golden lie, the nose that grows out of Carlo's portrait, the more we lie, reads, a mystical wooden rod obtained from the boy's portrait. Fascinatingly, it extends and retracts at the whim of Geppetto's puppet. There are two kinds of lies. Yours is the lie that makes your nose long. The boy loved the fairy tale about the wooden puppet's adventure. Geppetto, perhaps inspired by the fairy tale that Carlo loved so much, and armed with the knowledge that a puppet can awaken to an ego, just as his wife's puppet had done, put his dead son's ergo into a mechanical heart, so that one day Carlo could be reborn, and that the puppet who looked so much like him could become a real boy. So, Carlo's soul, for lack of a better word, was stuffed into P, our player character. Romeo, meanwhile, suffered a different fate, but not too dissimilar. The ergo we get from him reads, when the boy opened his eyes, he found himself sitting on a throne that he had not asked for. When he sought his friend of the past, he clung to his memories even though he knew there was no going back. While Carlo's soul was put into P, Geppetto turned Romeo into the King of Puppets, who would become the fall guy for his master plan. Bound by the Grand Covenant, Romeo and the rest of the puppets were completely under Geppetto's thumb. Geppetto needed to collect a massive amount of ergo, so he orchestrated the puppet frenzy. Most everyone in Krat died, and the puppets ran free. It was chaos, but a ripe opportunity to harvest all of that free ergo. The alchemists had a similar plan for their own needs. We will discuss these schemes when we reach the end of the game. For now, we know how P came about, what happened to Carlo, and who Romeo is. However, something interesting is that Romeo, who can speak and lead all of the puppets, has his own agenda. While Geppetto started the puppet frenzy, it seems that the puppets are trying to save whatever is left of Krat from the alchemists and the petrification disease. It could be that they are hunting down anyone with the disease, as hinted by the old lady in the window, and by the fight we see in front of the cathedral. However, it is uncertain how this exactly came about. Is this the true will of Romeo and the puppets to protect Krat? Or did Geppetto trick Romeo and the puppets into seeing everyone as diseased, which was what started the slaughter? Benini believes that it could be that someone lifted the covenant that was holding the puppets back, which then led to them killing humans. In which case, Geppetto only needed to free the puppets from the shackles of the covenant, and Romeo did the rest out of his own volition. It's really uncertain, and the origin and purpose of the puppet frenzy is one of the most wildly debated topics within the fandom. It certainly seems that Krat has more sick than healthy people. It could be that the puppets see this as a necessary pragmatic move to kill everybody who has the petrification disease to save the few that are left. Whatever the case, the truth could never have come out in time. After all, Geppetto set us to tie up loose ends. The puppet bosses we have fought so far speak of a king and ask us to join him. Even Romeo tries to show us the truth, but P refuses to see. Their speech remains garbled until New Game Plus, when we can finally see their true intentions. When we kill Romeo, Geppetto will have succeeded in cleaning up after himself. Making us kill Romeo was likely a revenge against the boy, since Carlo gave his graduation necklace to Romeo, who he loved more than his father. This is the very same necklace we find on the King of Puppets once we defeat him. Still, it seems we were able to give Romeo some peace, his line as we defeat him reads And it is after we find the necklace that we start turning more human, changing in ways even Geppetto didn't expect, slowly breaking free from his control. Now that the king is dead, the puppets have no leader, no direction. 
But the curse of the petrification disease still lingers. It's tough, but I know where you should go now. The Grand Exhibition. Rumors say the alchemists there have developed a cure. As a man of invention, I'm skeptical of the alchemists, both their science and their motives. But they may be the city's last hope. Won't you help me, son? Before we can go to the Grand Exhibition, we have a conversation with Antonia about the good old days of her youth. On the reception counter of the hotel, we can also find a beckon by Polandina to speak outside. We can tell him of Julian and Melody, and he will be more confident in his feelings towards Antonia. Our next stop before the Grand Exhibition is the Lorenzini Arcade. On our way there, we will see many puppets crying and grieving for their lost king. This is unique to this exact part of the game, as no other puppet will act like this. It's a shame that there aren't greater consequences to killing the King of Puppets, but I guess it also serves to show that he was not the one behind all of this. While out on the streets, we can hear music coming from windows up above, maybe from a gramophone, or perhaps someone is playing it. This gives us hope that once this is all over, maybe there will be people left to rebuild after all. We arrive at the arcade, which is another one of my favorite levels. The arcade is another example of how much Round 8 Studio can do with vertical and horizontal space. You only use one stargazer throughout the entire arcade area, but with how many little nooks and crannies there are, you will feel like the place is huge. You start on the second floor, then take a dip down into the wine cellars and travel through a broken wall to reach new areas. And it all still comes back to the central area with your stargazer. The arcade feels much bigger than it actually is, and I enjoy coming back here every playthrough, even if I wish the place didn't look quite so drab and that the enemies were less annoying. More carcass monsters. The bushy eyebrows ones aren't the worst of it. Downstairs you have a section covered in a fog of decay with bloodborne brain suckers. You'll also encounter the second most annoying clown mini-boss. Weird that there are two of these fuckers. We can also encounter these ball sack spawns. We saw these growths in the cathedral before, but when they popped, they were just empty. Now you have these disgusting creatures crawling out of them like newborn infants. In the wine cellars, you will get your first of two mandatory mini-bosses. A carcass juggernaut with two spikes for hands. He uses his fury attacks often, and half health he will become even more aggressive. But after his combo, he gives you a few seconds for your rebuttal. He gave me a lot of trouble on my first playthrough. But on my second go around, I killed him in one try. And we find another merchant here who sells the spinny blade weapon, if that's to your liking. Around the end of the section, Venini will contact you through the stargazer and tells you that the King of Puppets was communicating with others through ergo waves. He says he's heard of a cry for help at the Grand Exhibition, so that's where we're headed next. As if we weren't already going there. The grand exhibition theme was automatic puppets and city of the future. The plan was to showcase and demonstrate the most advanced technology in Krat. But you know the rest. You can't hold an exhibition in a city that's fallen into utter chaos. And now the whole city is an exhibition of a nightmare. The Grand Exhibition reeks like a ghost town. You can smell the death and desolation before you even step into it. Outside, a large speaker has been blasting the same parade music for god knows how long, the sound quality having degraded over time. We ride this eerily quiet tram car to the Exhibition Gallery and climb down to the entrance. Here we can see an exhibition for the Puppet of the Future, an acute mini version of it. The Grand Exhibition was meant to show the newest advancements in Kratz technology. We see some of those innovations, though they do not inspire us with much awe. As said before, there is an unsaid horror in the fact that one of these machines could just turn on one day and suddenly awaken with an ego. But as fellow video essayist Jinji points out in his own video, these comedic looking puppets with two drills and four saws, the shield puppets, giant puppets whose only real point is to replace wrecking balls, all of these examples seem rather vain and a little useless. Perhaps a sign of how complacent Crotisans became. Puppets became a point of pride for the city, and as such everything was delegated to them. 
Newer and better puppets had to be constantly created, even if there really was no need for these innovations. Alas, the cogs of industry have to keep churning. It reminds me a bit how in real life these so-called innovators are constantly trying to reinvent the train with self-driving cars and taxis. Just like the workshops of Krat, it all seems incredibly silly and reeks of hubris. Eventually you just run out of good ideas. If making puppets to start with was ever a good idea. Sure, police puppets and firemen puppets seem like a logical step, but are they really the right ones? What is the point of a juggler puppet in the first place? A human juggler is an example of dexterity and skill, while a puppet who can juggle just seems... ordinary? Unremarkable? We've taken the performer out of the art, commodified every aspect of life. I'm surprised that Alina even still had a job. Up on a catwalk we find the origin of the distress signal, a soldier named Bell. She asks you to kill Vector, our likely boss for the area. Once you do, we can meet up with her at the hotel where she will reveal that she is a soldier who came from the outside of the city. For now, we still have a plot to uncover at the Grand Exposition. You can also say hello to the single most annoying enemy in the entire game. I don't know what this dude is doing up here, how he got here, he can't climb because of his hand shields. In every single playthrough, I waste at least 20 minutes on this guy. Honestly, he can go to like robot hell or something. We ran the corner and I swear to god, the first time I saw this scene I was ready to quit. Thankfully these are only props, but by this point the game had made me thoroughly paranoid. I believe this scare is the result of all the ambushes we have been suffering until now. It's doubly ironic when immediately after, the stationary puppets do come to life. The game really loves fucking with you. Come to relieve that paranoia is our favorite quiz master. Ignore me getting the wrong answer here. I had gotten one of these questions wrong before, but I forgot which one, so I just overthought it. If you do get it wrong, Arlequino will send a kamikaze harlequin to try and kill you. If you survive, he will call again and give you the hint about the lady with the cold hands. I really love how even if you get the riddles wrong, Arlequino will give you alternatives. There are only a few riddles that you can answer wrong that have no way to recover. I'm glad that the developers thought of this. Try to progress and you'll be shot down like someone from the Godfather movies. These guys are alchemists, our first exposure to them. They're very memorable with their long, creepy limbs and weird guttural sounds. We see another experiment in a straitjacket trying to stab us to death. We also see one of these strongman types, which will be a primer for the boss just up ahead. There's not much to say about these guys. The SMG dudes will easily stagger you, the knife checks have erratic moves with a long windup, and the strongman enemies serve as a roadblock. They're the third enemy type, or I guess fourth if we count human NPCs, that the game rather desperately needed. They're visually striking, with grey skin, naked gums and missing teeth. Their eyes are all milky white. They're creepy and tough, especially with the grab of inducing lag. The alchemist must be quite proud of that one. Also, be careful with this anime ass dude stopping midair. Who's he trying to impress? The efforts of the alchemist's human experimentation shows most prominently on Victor, the next boss. Victor, the Hercules of Krat, was a former wrestler and entertainer, said to be able to take down even a lion and a bear. He stood at the peak of the human condition, but was brought down by an incurable disease, possibly even the petrification disease. However, he made a surprise recovery thanks to the alchemist, and was supposed to make a grand return before the puppet frenzy. Now he serves as an example of how far the alchemists have taken their experiments. Surprisingly among the bosses that still gave me trouble in my second playthrough, he was one of them. He has some very long combos, throwing in fury attacks into the mix at very inopportune times. He can also push you around the arena as well as launch you into the air. Victor doesn't use a weapon, instead using his fists. This means his attacks put him very close to you, and despite his tall stature, you also have to be very close to him to land any attacks. His jabs are very quick, meaning the time between his wind-up and him hitting you is very short. Possibly the shortest of all the bosses, making it hard to learn how to parry him. I know I had a lot of trouble. This makes it hard to avoid his long combos and fury attacks more than some other bosses. 
With bigger enemies, their attacks are slow and wide. They give you enough room to breathe and move around. With bosses like Romeo, whose range is rather short, you are still let off easy thanks to his combos being only 2-3 attacks long. Victor, however, hits hard, makes you stagger easily, and if you are in range to attack him, you can bet he is perfectly in range of hitting you into next Tuesday. I haven't found Legion Arms to be an effective alternative either, since if you try to keep out of his fisting distance, he can easily shimmy up to you before you have the chance to use it for long enough to be effective. Victor is the first of the many more aggressive bosses yet to come, and his fist-based moveset is one that you really don't see a lot in Souls likes, throwing you off guard. Sadly, I don't really have concrete strategy for him. Running away and throwing firebombs at him might just be good in a pinch, but since he has two phases, you will likely run out of items before he runs out of health. Hopefully by this point you have enough pulse cells to be able to tank some of his hits. Wait for his longer and heavier attacks to finish, squeeze in a few of your own, then skedaddle away. I hope you've been also leveling stamina. Without that and the stamina recharge ring, this fight will be a headache. He also has an unreasonable amount of invincibility frames after your fatal attack him. I don't know what that is about. It can be counteracted with pandemonium, that's something to think about. At half health, Victor will enter his second phase. He moves around the arena much more, and hits harder. Wow, what a surprise. But he seems to have lost some of his longer combos. His recovery is also slower, which means you have more time to damage him. It's the first phase, but on steroids. Somewhat literally, it seems. He is also the first boss not to go down immediately after you stagger him. Instead, you can be caught by his fist as he falls to one knee. This phase is arguably easier. What makes it hard is that you likely don't have many pulse cells left by this point. The tanking his hits is just gonna end up with you dead. Why be humble? I am evolved! A better man! The man with the Red Dead Redemption cosplay is Simon Monis. He's the brains behind all this human engineering and spreading of the cure, quote unquote, around Krat that turns the citizens into carcass monsters. I've already touched on what the alchemists have done, but haven't really gotten into the why. And you will have to wait a bit longer for that, since we really don't have all the pieces of that puzzle yet. Simon monologues at you for a very long time about evolution or some such nonsense. The alchemists believe that the petrification disease is not a blight, but an opportunity. He even asks you what you think of the topic. He mentions having been colleagues with Geppetto before, and reaffirms that Ergo used to be a human being. He also invites us to the Isle, where the alchemists reside, if we can find it. Their plan is to bring humanity to another level, so on and so forth, you know the spiel. It's pretty standard stuff and the superficial philosophy behind it isn't really worth talking about. We get to the interesting parts later when we kill God, but for now let us move on. Simon throws us the key to the Saintess of Mercy statue, which as I mentioned earlier was created by Geppetto's possible wife, Camille, for the alchemist. It can reset your levels, legion arm and P organ upgrades. I don't have much to say about it other than it's a hauntingly beautiful location. Take a shot every time I say that. We also get to talk with Sophia here, and we are clued in to the fact that she knows a lot more than she has been letting on. Apparently, she can astral project herself here to tell us to watch out for Simon. Thanks, mom. Honestly, Simon put up enough of those red flags on his own that our dear blue fairy here went through all this trouble for nothing. The Saintess statue is an allusion to the statue of Mary and Jesus. The exact connection is lost on me. The description of the room's key says that the statue allowed for puppets to find new life. We also have Sophia appear here, who is something of a mother figure to our character, turning back time so we can revive every time when we die. She can also listen to Ergo and speak to other puppets, but it seems we are the only one who has listened so far. Returning to the hotel, we can conclude that the cure is a bust. That means there is no hope to cure Antonia or anyone else with the disease for that matter. Antonia will console you that despite there being no cure, she is fine with it. But Polandina isn't quite so optimistic. He asks you to try and find a cure regardless. Talking to Giangio, he will give you a cure for one gold coin fruit. Must be Black Friday. Warning you that even if it does cure the disease, it cannot restore organ function. And it might not save the victim from certain death. 
Giving the cure to Polandina is the human choice, and upon arrest, Antonia will be elated. It's you. Come here. I've been in such a good mood all day. I have a feeling I'll be in better shape in no time. Oh, and you better not underestimate me just because I'm not as spry as I used to be. I know you and Polandina are up to something. After defeating Victor, we can find Belle at the hotel. She wishes to stay with us until she can find her p lost partner. Benini praises you for your rescue efforts and speaks about helping others. Everyone deserves some help now and then. If we who live through times like this don't live the best lives we can, we dishonor the memories of all we have lost. Honoring the lost is why I do what I do. In a way, I envy the dead. They don't have to know what it's like to remember that they're gone. Ha! <laughs> and here I go again. Blah, 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 and who cares? <laughs> now, let's get out there and save my... That is our city. We can ask him about the Covenant and have his take on it. <laughs> the Grand Covenant. You're not asking much, are you? <laughs> Very well. Geppetto himself created it, and I... God help me, I made it work. It's in every puppet, a sort of... conscience. And in theory, it should have prevented anything like the puppet frenzy ever happening. It's because we don't truly understand Ergo, at least that's my view. Sometimes Ergo-driven puppets gain what we call awakened egos. Individuality, more or less. Which is a dangerous thing if someone's not ready to handle it. Though that is rare. Or used to be. Hence, the Grand Covenant. Humanity's safety net. But it did not work. Exiting the exhibition, we run into our old furry besties. Ciao, Bella. They voice their annoyance with the alchemists and ask us for the rare and powerful gold coin fruit, as Chat Noir is going blind. Now as a reminder, Gato conned you out of some pocket change, they strung you along in the Malam district before dumping you and are colluding with the alchemists and possibly even the Brotherhood. Though the knife is yet to enter our back, they sure are dangling it dangerously close. And later they will continue to cause us trouble. If you're following along, nothing they've done should make you feel like you can trust them here. Especially since Antonia mentions how the alchemists, the people Fox and Cat are literally working for, are interested in the gold coin fruit. How do we know the cat's blindness is real and not just a lie? To be quite honest, I didn't have any reason to give them anything on my first playthrough. In the original story of Pinocchio, the cat pretends to be blind to earn Pinocchio's trust, only to betray him later. Every sign we get up until now is supposed to make us doubt them and deny them any help. Which is where the game gets you. Or me specifically. Giving them gold coin fruit here is the decision that will grant you humanity, and they will be surprised at your generosity despite their actions. Later, you can continue supplying them with the fruit to completely skip their boss encounters. We will touch more on the cat and the fox later, but for now, this is a surprisingly smart move from the game. Their actions and the voice acting make you feel nothing but distrust for these characters, so that in the one moment where you can change their mind, you have no reason to. Honestly, I didn't really expect you to bring us a damn thing, and yet... Thank you! Truly! I'm not saying I'm ready to set up housekeeping, or that I even trust you. <laughs> but, given time, I think we could become actual friends. We need to track down the alchemists, but first we must retrieve an item from the barren swamp that will allow us to do that. Benini also says the funniest line in the entire game. This is a nightmare. I'm living my own nightmare. Puppets and alchemists, forget it. There could still be a way. A dangerous but marvelous mode of transportation, but it won't work without a golden ergo. My research, well, Purcinella did a lot of the heavy lifting, has led me to believe you can find one deep within the barren swamp. No, I'm not going to tell you the details yet. Not until we have that golden ergo. It's just not worth getting our hopes up, companion. 
If you thought the Malum district was a dump, then you are not ready for what the swamp has to offer. We are finally reaching the last third of the game, and I can't wait to be done with this area already. We take one of Vanini's tramps to the barren swamp and graveyard for puppets, literally. At first it was a coal mine made redundant by the discovery of Ergo, then it turned into an illegal dumping site for broken puppets, but got so out of hand that now there is literally mountains of machinery. So since it is located right next to the Grand Exhibition, the idea is to turn the whole place into a giant park. At this point I stop having too much to say about the areas in the game. The Swamp is an ironic name for a man-made location, with pools of corruption and broken puppets covering every surface. Something I like is how we can see old stone towers from Krat's medieval age. We also saw them in the Malum district, if you remember, creating a sort of natural barrier around the town. I like this mix of old and new, it shows how old Krat really is and how far it has come. Here we mostly find puppets of all different sorts, from the simple butler ones, to kamikaze dogs, to soldier puppets, and even a FUCKING CLOWN, OH MY GOD! The Baron Swamp also has the Kraut world record for having the biggest number of broken bridges, and the second biggest number of bosses in one single area. Damn alchemists. The terms of the bargain, almost intolerable. Well, it's not like I care about those hotel people anyway. But there are limits. We find Alidora squatting here after having gone missing from the hotel. Eugeni gave us a gift, a four-fingered glove that we are supposed to give to Alidoro. The hound is not impressed though, as it doesn't fit him, so he insults the gift. If we return to Eugeni, we can lie and tell her that he loved it. If you tell her the truth, Eugeni will become suspicious of Alidoro, as the hound who saved her definitely lost one of his fingers. We see the dreaded return of the constable puppets and get shot by ballistas, though it does make the rematch with the puppets of the future easier. It's technically two individual fights, and I certainly don't recommend fighting them at once. But it's really only here to give you some ergo. The fight is the same, and thankfully the ballistas help you out here. Our third mini boss is the Owl Doctor, or Subject 890. We already covered his story way back, he was Adelina Corday's lover, but got won over by the alchemists at some point, after he peddled their cure under the name of Dr. Curall. They used him for experimentations, believing that the body of a stalker would better handle the cure. The owl fight is, like most NPC fights, quite difficult. Loads of damage on this guy, and he moves fast just like you do. He also has an annoying ranged attack, and is for some reason very resistant to fire. Use the pillar to avoid his needle throws. Try to block his combos instead of avoiding them, and take care to break his stagger if at all possible. The hut you fight in is small, so you will be on the cramped defense for most of the fight. Another NPC we can meet is the Broken Puppet. Not bound by the Grand Covenant, he is ostracized by the other puppets. Wow, well, puppet on puppet racism, who would have thought? He asks us to be his friend and teach him about humans. Through the gestures we have collected so far on our travels, we can teach him about grief, happiness, rage, and... clapping? This is really the only thing you can do with him, and you have to go out of your way to come back later when you get the gestures for anger and happiness. It's a... cute enough interaction. He gives you some ergo in exchange, and we get some humanity points. However, I feel like it's a bit too simplistic, a bit too banal. I wish there was more dialogue with him, maybe we could also show him the ring to teach him about love and other important emotions. I also wish that there was some introspection about the nature of puppets. Can a puppet really love, or is it only the echoes of the human that is trapped within the ergo that powers the puppet? Can puppets and humans ever coexist? What would we need for that to happen? The idea is neat, but what we have in the game feels incredibly raw and undercooked. I hope they do something more like this in the DLC. We enter the mine shafts and face off against the hardest encounter in Lies of P, the Rolling Stones. These things are incredibly annoying, and as such, Lies of P lives up to the FromSoft legacy of making every swamp level a fucking nightmare. We also get to fight a giant Disney Pinocchio. Okay, seriously, what is the point of this puppet? What purpose did it serve before the frenzy? What is the lore explanation? I guess it makes sense that we find it in the dump instead of out and about on town. In front of the boss arena we meet rookie explorer Hugo, one of my favorite characters. Life is short, and life in Krat is shorter. I reckon I should cherish what time I've got. We will get back to him. Until now you might have heard and read about a monster in the swamp, a huge green thing that likes to collect treasure. Its design almost reaches Lovecraftian levels of ugly. 
It's one of the failed experiments of the alchemists abandoned in the swamp. However, as time wore on, it fed on the ergo of the puppets that had been left here, growing in size and strength. It's definitely one of the most annoying bosses in the game and has become rather infamous. Its health pool is rather large and has plenty of bullshit attacks. To this day I have no idea how to avoid him when he burrows into the ground and jumps out at you. Its charge attack is also complete nonsense. It seems to pick up speed at some point during the charge, but the camera angle gives me no info on how close I actually am to the monster, so I am always thrown off by the timing and can never parry it. I found that the best way to avoid both of these is to just run across the stage, as both attacks stop after covering roughly half of the arena. It will vomit decay at you, and its tendrils have a mind of their own. It will sometimes shake its head before they try to stab you, but sometimes they'll just decide to attack you at random for no reason. The boss does become a lot easier when you realize that it's not built for dodging. The monster is huge, so dodge around it and start hitting its backside. It has no moves that can catch you if you do this, and it's an easy way to defeat it. Something that's uh, cool that you only notice upon repeated playthroughs is that during the first phase you can spot the Broken Watchman uh, with the Golden Ergo that the monster will climb into during its second phase. This phase is a combination of the monster's first phase and the Scrubbed Watchman fight. I quite like this actually, it's a familiar enough scenario that I can use my prior knowledge, but also fresh in a way that keeps the fight interesting. It has a more chaotic moveset in this phase with sweeping attacks that launch it forwards and backwards. When it goes crab mode, just step away. It can only move from side to side, so if you stay away slightly, it cannot hurt you. It does repeat some of the same moves that the Watchmen did, so if you learn to parry those, you will have a slightly easier time. Fire works great for the first phase, and electricity works decently for the second. Once again, not one of my favorite bosses, but I don't necessarily dislike either phase. Still, together they can be quite frustrating with some janky hitboxes and constantly moving around in the arena not really helping. It's also the only boss where lag was a major factor. I don't know if it's because of the nouveau or because I was recording or if the arena just had too much going on in it, but it was rather distracting at times. Once the monster is defeated, Alidora will jump in and retrieve the treasure we have heard so much about. It's typical for a coward like him and was waiting for us to kill the monster so he could retrieve the two dragon sword, a saber from the far east. The Jenny will also comment on how incredible the weapon looks and tells you to take care of it, as it also holds a little part of her lineage. Let's get back to Hugo. Earlier we got a wanted poster for Alidora from him. When we take it to the Hound, he will point to the disreputable journalist called Medoro. However, Hugo points out that Alidoro and Medoro are friends. So something is very wrong here. Hugo will also give us a cryptic vessel that we can take to Venini for decoding. It will send us to the Malum slums, the specific shack. It seems that a band of thieves were collecting treasure from the swamp. However, threatened by the Brotherhood, they wanted to run off together, but ended up betraying each other instead. You meet the last member of their troop, who gives you the key to the shack. However, once you enter, you will fall through the hole. This is a reference to the beloved Dark Souls character, Patches, who has a history of tricking the player with talk of treasure then pushing them into pits and other traps to be killed. Unfortunately, we are forbidden from getting payback as the NPC despawns after we fall in. If you don't fall for his trap, he will comment on how lame it is, but will still disappear all the same. Who knew such a huge monster lurked in the barren swamp? Perhaps the Grand Exhibition's wastewater twisted the monster somehow. I shudder to think of it. A concoction of all a swamp's creatures. It's another sign of how Krat is tearing itself apart. Who knows the science behind it? I'm just glad my precious son made it back in one piece. We can bring back the Golden Ergo to Venini, who will turn it into a lead acid battery. He says this can be used for a submarine somewhere underground, but the location of the vehicle is completely unknown to him. We can turn to Antonia and if we have given her the cure, she will once again thank us for making her pain go away. You are responsible for this miracle. You have no idea how much it means to me. I have to stay seated as I feel a little lightheaded, but I feel the vigor I thought I'd lost forever. Thank you. 
If Krat ever holds a proper ball again, I hope you'll ask me for a dance. We can ask Antonia for information about the base Vanini mentioned. Antonia admits that the hotel did have an agreement with the alchemists long ago, before Simon Manus became their leader. There exists a passage to the underground mines where Ergo was first discovered. However, the alchemists, shifty bastards that they are, made it so that you have to unlock the passage from their side first before you can enter from the hotel. Antonia therefore sends you back to Central Crot, as the recent earthquakes might have something to do with the alchemists. Crot Central Station. Yes, it's where you woke up. There used to be a workshop near the station. However, the puppets destroyed it when they attacked. Many of the puppets have moved on, but now strange monsters lurk nearby. Be careful if you go back. You're precious to me. We return to the Swamp Monster's lair and make our way through the tunnels that lead very conveniently to Krat Central Station. The puppets have now been replaced with various carcass monsters including brain suckers and carcass demon dogs. What puppets we do see have been malformed as a result of the experiments of the alchemists. I think they might be encroaching on Japan's business here. We were to bloated decay balloons in the area, you can pop them with weapons, items or legion arms. They're still as disgusting as they were before. I love parallels, and our revisit to Krat Central Station definitely delivers. As if things couldn't get any worse before, we see how far Krat has truly fallen, all thanks to the alchemists and Geppetto. It shows how Krat has been decaying even more since we arrived. We also reached the old train car where we woke up. Here we can notice a fake wall. Breaking it leads to a workshop situated right behind our chair, with a note from Simon Manus stating that he has recovered the arm of God from Geppetto. If we have talked to Bell, she will mention that her partner Atkinson went missing around the station and asks us to go look for him. In one of the trains we can find a man going by his name, suffering from the late stages of the petrification disease. He mentions something that is always more so an afterthought in these types of situations, namely why can't people just, like, leave? Why not just leave Krat if everything sucks here? Why are the Brotherhood and Alodoro looking for a way out through the alchemists? Well, Atkinson explains that all communications have been cut off, and the suburbs blockaded. No one is getting in, no one's getting out. This choice was deliberate, but knowledge about who or why is above his pay grade. It seems that Krod had a military separate from the Stalkers, the Workshop and the Alchemists, but it is likely controlled by the City Council, which we know is still under influence of those Alchemists. Atkinson asks us to tell Bell that he died a soldier, and gives us a letter to his partner and lover. We can return to Bell and give her the letter, as well as having a choice on how to present Atkinson's demise. She will give you a record as thanks, and say that she will have to report his death to others. We once again reach the lobby of the station, but instead of a constable, we meet the robber Weasel, another one of my favorite characters. The scarecrow looking mask, her little backpack, the raspy voice, the fact that she is a simple looter in a doomed city, so far out of her own depth. She is a simple stalker enemy, but the awesome mask is supposed to incite fear into her victims, making them easier to rob. As always, this can be a challenge depending on how much cheese you like. But by this point you should have faced greater challenges than her. You can always just run past her, she is not a mandatory miniboss. Look out for her jumping axe attack though, that thing is wild. The only critique I have is that the description for her mask says that she hoped to escape the city after one more house, not knowing that it would be her last. However, we fight her at the train station. Like, what? Did she not know that the trains had stopped? At least put her in a house or something similar. Was she planning to escape to the swamp? Like, girl, what was your plan? I guess we will never know. We fight through the familiar square and find Valentinus' statue now toppled. How thematic. Even if the abnormal has become normal, the living must live. Buy something and you'll help both of us. Leaving the apartment complex, we see ergo crystals growing out from the ground and through the buildings, linking the city street into a ravine. 
Jiminy informs us that we are near the workshop transportation base, which turns out to be the fallen workshop tower which everybody keeps harping on about. The one from which Eugenie and Hugo were saved by Alidoro. Careful with the yellow crystal growths. Standing near them will give you disruption, which works like Frenzy in Bloodborne or Madness in Sekiro, or even Deathblight in Elden Ring, killing the character instantly if the meter fills. We traverse through the collapsed apartment buildings and find that the tower is full of alchemist gunners and bandaged enforcers. The alchemists are really the challenge that is needed this late in the game. By now we have become very intimate with the puppets and carcasses, so this change of pace is very welcome. Once we drop a shortcut to the Stargazer, we fight the Walker of Illusions. The Walker is a relatively humanoid enemy, despite her tall stature, but don't mistake her for a Stalker-like fight. She isn't as agile, but her combos are longer than what we've seen before, with plenty of fury attacks in between. Kinda working like Victor. She also has a cheeky follow-up to her Needle Smash, which combined with her backstep can cover a lot of ground. She also has a disruptive scream attack, which will stun you shortly and push you back. At half health, the walker will periodically spawn a clone, which will aggro on you while the real walker stands off to the side. As always, I recommend taking care of the extra, as you don't have a lot of room to move around here. The fight isn't hard, especially since by this point you should be leveled enough that you have plenty of pulse cells and health. To me, at least, the walker is one of those filler bosses that most just tank through. Her moveset is limited, which makes her quite easy, her own low health bar also adds to the apathy factor. Overall, an interesting design, but serves more as set dressing. Not a very memorable or difficult mini-boss. Though it does speak to how cruel the alchemist's experiments are. After defeating the walker, Sophia will contact you, telling you that the hotel is under attack. Simon Manas will then hijack the connection and mock you for trying to stop them. During the elevator ride, when Sophia calls you, P's heart starts beating loudly. Compared to complete silence after killing the walker, to the thumping noise in the background after Simon hangs up. I don't think I need to explain what this means, but its addition here is truly remarkable. I don't know if it changes depending on how high your humanity is, but I've never noticed this before, and I've never heard anybody mention it either. Anyway, this is an incredible detail, and it only makes me love the game even more. If you wish, you can explore the side area next to the sea, where we can find another phone with another riddle. If you get it wrong here, he will direct you to get a red apple. You can offer this in the lower hallways of the Opera House to the statue of Adelina Corday. This will get you a key. Remember this little detail for later, it'll become important once we talk more about Arlecchino. We face off once more against the Parade Master, now mutated. Its attacks stay mostly the same as the original second phase with some follow-ups courtesy of its many tendrils. It has no second face, so this should be fairly straightforward. Though I am the type of guy who will make a fuss about Elden Ring reusing boss designs, here I do not mind it. This is a callback to our first ever boss in Lies of P. Now we face off against a harder enemy, but we ourselves are also much tougher. We can actively see how far we've progressed. We can now not only take down puppets and carcasses, but also mutated puppet carcass monsters. Much like the green swamp monster, I love the synthesis of the organic and mechanical, which makes use of both the slow, delayed attacks of puppets and the frantic flurry typical of carcass monsters. Lies of P is often criticized for its supposed lack of enemy variety, but for a game this short, I think Lies of P makes the most with its enemy designs in the smartest of ways. Enemy templates are something that souls like sometimes struggle with, and I'll touch more on this point later, but Lies of P really hit it out of the park by choosing these kinds of enemies which can be a canvas for endless imagination. As it stands, the Corrupted Parade Master is not a very memorable boss, but I do appreciate its addition here as a sort of marker for all the progress we have made on our journey. 
You come back to the assaulted hotel Crot. Sophia informs you that the Brotherhood, as well as the Fox and the Cat, attacked the hotel and took Geppetto. Eugenie will say that Alidoro has also gone missing, so we can suspect that he was in league with the other stalkers. Benini thanks you for saving him for a second time, and with your help with the decoder. And if you got the rusty cryptic vessel, then you can visit Hugo, who has gotten the gate he was fiddling with open. This will have revealed a secret area, and we can find out what happened to Medoro, the reporter who we've read a little bit about. He collaborated with Vanini in writing the Krat landmark guides that we can find throughout the game, as well as trying to publish a piece revealing the true nature of the alchemists, which was promptly censored by the city officials. He was also a friend of Alidoro's and helped out when the workshop tower collapsed. We can find his last journal entry in the Hermit's Cave. He is sick with the petrification disease and won't last long, but begs someone to uncover the truth of what has been happening in Krat. He also mentions a missing Sophia and a hopeless Lorenzini. Lumacchio and the unnamed Hage are names I do not recognize. Perhaps Hage refers to the real Alidoro? Who knows. At the end of the cave we come across another one of these brutes. Although it looks no different from the rest we have encountered, you should still kill this one. drops a record called Misty Era. I'm uncertain if the monster was the hermit or Medoro himself. The scribbles on the walls mention the blue fairy, and since Medoro was friends with Sophia, it could make sense that this would be him. It makes for a rather sad end to Krat's last honest reporter. When we talk to Sophia, she will reveal more of her backstory, and tells you how she escaped from the Isle of the Alchemists. Finally, Antonia tells you how to open the secret entrance she mentioned before, and so you set off to find the traitors. The elevator takes us to the relic of Trismegistus, the original Ergo mines that the alchemists discovered, and that would bring about Krat's Golden Age. This is definitely the least remarkable of all the areas, and as such, I have next to nothing to say about it. One YouTuber has found that there is actually much more to this area than we actually got to play, which would suggest that this might be relevant during the DLC. Down here we can also find the last phone. If you happen to miss any riddles, you can answer them all here. The last question that Arlet Kino asks has no real correct answer, but rather is a question of self-reflection. Is Geppetto's creation a killer? Confess. If you have gotten all your answers right so far, this will be the first time you will hear our Lakino drop the mask and show his true colors. It's a rather bone-chilling conversation here at the heart of Krat. As far as I can tell, if you give the wrong answers, his tone will shift, revealing the king's deranged mind a little before his more obvious reveal here. Other than that, there is really nothing else. There's a bunch of random mobs and a few chests, but really nothing remarkable. So we'll skip straight to the boss.
accept your fate. You ain't seen nothing like my brother. This version of the Brotherhood fight happens backwards from the original. We start off fighting the three younger siblings. As every other encounter with more than two enemies, only one will be actively aggroed against you. This is communicated to the player with a voice line and the respective character coding their weapon in a status ailment. Flames for the Battle Maniac, Electric Shock for the Eccentric, and DK for the Youngest. Their movesets are all the same otherwise. While one of the three attacks, the other two will at times throw something your way. For the Eccentric, this is a Thermite Bomb, the Youngest throws Stunning Knives, and the Maniac will grapple you towards him. Same logic applies as during the earlier fight. They all stagger very easily, so be aggressive when you have stamina and get them into a corner, and go back if you start running out of stamina. The youngest is the most annoying, so dealing with her first is recommended. Next you'll want to keep the maniac and the eccentric at about the same health, since as soon as you kill one, you will want to bum rush the other before the eldest comes back from the fucking dead. Otherwise you are fighting two enemies that are aggroed on you constantly. Once you have defeated at least two siblings, the eldest will start waking up. He has the same general patterns as before, with large sweeps and fast overheads. Though now he will sometimes use his new... petrification disease powers to send out a shockwave. You can use the environment here to block out his shockwaves completely, but be careful for the feint on one of his attacks. Some of his longer combos will leave him heaving, making it prime time to let loose on the guy. As a side note, this was the only fight where my weapon broke. It was actually kind of funny and cool, but uh, impossible to complete the fight. Otherwise, it really is the same as before. It's not one of my favorite fights, as it can be a little tedious, but I quite like this approach to gank bosses. The first version was methodical, it let you fight the siblings one-on-one -on -one and learn their movesets. Now we get to fight the three younger siblings properly before a last duel with the big guy. That means the second time around we are already familiar with everything, but the order of attackers and status ailments switch it up enough to keep it fresh. Idea-wise, this is one of my favorite multi-enemy bosses in the entire Souls-like genre, even considering the From Software games. Though it's not quite as elegant as the Shadows of Yarnum boss fight or something like Smo and Ornstein. People vastly blow this fight's difficulty out of proportion. Take your time with the small guys, you have plenty of it, then cheese out the third guy and use items if you must. It's really not that difficult, in my opinion. Behind the arena we can find Alidoro the Coward. He confirms that the city is being blockaded, maybe by the alchemists, as they do offer a route to escape. He also reveals that he is not the real Alidoro, but instead was Alidoro's partner, going by the fittingly ironic name, Parrot. They admired Alidoro, but criticized him for never turning a prophet. They got into a fight, and Parrot killed his partner, taking over his identity. It seems that while working with the alchemists, Alidoro could have been also selling the boss ergo we were collecting to them. It wouldn't make much sense as to why he'd think they were so valuable otherwise. After this we can redeem any weapons we want from him. If we let him go, we will see him back at the hotel. But who would do that at this point? Here we are finally given the option to put the bastard six feet under. We can choose the option to attack him. He will laugh at us, believing we are bluffing, since we are a puppet after all and can't possibly kill anyone outside of self-defense. We exercise our free will by mowing him like grass. Alador is another example of magnificent voice acting. From the very moment you meet him, you can tell he is so far up his own ass that he couldn't possibly see, even without his dog mask. His patronizing arrogance is only overshadowed by his cowardice. Too bad it didn't get him anything in the long run. We can return to Eugenie and report the Hound's death. We can then either confess that he was killed by his partner, or that the real Alidoro was just a very good stalker. The cryptograph we get from Alidoro the Dead can be deciphered by Vanini, and we learned that Alidoro was Eugenie's brother, the original Alidoro that is, originating from the Land of the Morning. This also makes him the prime candidate for being the whistleblower who Medora speaks about in his article about the alchemists, meaning that Alidoro defected from them at some point, which he also writes in his letter. Somehow I always talk to Eugenie first before deciphering the cryptograph, so I've never gotten the scene myself, but you can tell Eugenie the truth before New Game Plus. 
If you reveal the truth to you, Jenny, she will at first be confused, then mad that her brother never contacted her. Now she has more questions than answers, having lost the only family she could have had. If we have killed the faker, Hugo will come to the hotel after visiting the relic of Trismegistus. He will continue Alador's legacy and become our new weapon slash amulet merchant. I don't have almost anything to say about the Isle outside of story points and boss battles. It's in my opinion the least interesting of the areas, not counting the Relic of Trismegistus, but also paradoxically the longest. Not to say it's inherently awful, climbing the Tower of Babel, a monument to human arrogance, slaughtering alchemists on your way is a good climax for the game. However, it really drags at times and kills the momentum. You can tell an area is padding when even speedrunners can't skip it. As such, before I get into the next section of the video, which will talk about the Arch Abbey and then go over the story analysis and characters, I would like to talk a little about the level design in general. Here we can already see the first points of relation with From Software's design. Japanese and Eastern storytelling in general has its own narrative structures. One that characterizes the From Software games is Yoha Q, which more or less translates to Beginning Break Rapid. One of its most well-known uses is in no theater. You can see the implementation of the Yoha Q most prominently in level design. As such, I'll be using Vinini Works as a demonstration of the core ideas. The beginning, according to Yoha Q, it must be straightforward. The introduction remains simple. In storytelling, it gives an overview of the story and characters. In Lies of P, we are told of Vinini right off the bat giving an overview of what to expect of both him and the factory we are about to go into. Then the action develops in the Ha section. We reach the factory and face off against different puppets and overcome our first challenges. One aspect of Vanini Works is how it flows from one source of action into another. First the bridge forces us to either wade through the ambushing puppets slowly or run ahead. Then on the elevated platforms we are once again surprised by the fragile floor which we fall through. Then right after we face off against one of these shield puppets. Then comes the section with the rolling puppet balls. Then we find the survivor, a shovel puppet and the puppet of the future. Constantly the action escalates more and more as we progress through the level and find new challenges to overcome. Finally at the climax we fight the boss of the level, Fuoko, which brings us to the Q part. The conclusion of the story is swift and energetic and that definitely goes for souls like bosses, especially in Lies of P. The fights are hard, with the player vigorously trying to beat their opponent. The music, presentation, and stressful combat all make for a very energetic encounter. Then once the boss is defeated, the pressure dissipates, and the level immediately ends. There is almost a tangible sense of being suddenly cut off from all the action. Usually in Liza P, this is managed by nudging you back to the hotel, so that the change from fight to silence isn't too jarring. But you can still feel how the vibe of the game and the level changes right after a boss fight. This structure is one way in which Lisa P excels at following From Software's blueprints to a very engaging and successful result. In other aspects of the level design, however, we can find a stark difference. From Software's level design has always been, for a lack of a better word, sprawling. You have your central hub, which is often disconnected from the rest of the world map. This is the case for Dark Souls 3, Bloodborne, and Elden Ring. Exceptions to this rule do exist. Dark Souls 1 is one example. Another is Sekiro, though that one lacks a central hub, so to speak. I guess Ashina Castle would be the closest thing. In Dark Souls 3, you start your journey on the High Wall of Lothric, then proceed to the Undead Settlement and the Road of Sacrifices. From here, the map spreads out like a spider. You can go to the Cathedral of the Deep or continue on to Farren Keep and the Catacombs of Carthus. You can also visit Erethil and Arnarlando from here, though you will need to have gone to the Cathedral before that. This applies even more in Bloodborne. From Cathedral Ward you can go to almost any edge of the map. You can go to Hemwick Charnel Lane, Yahar Ghoul, Old Yarnum, Central Yarnum, or Bergenworth. Even Sekiro, which is the closest in terms of structure to Lies of P, has Ashina Castle filled the role of being the heart of the map. From the castle you can go to the dungeon or the sunken valley, which both lead to the depths, or you can choose to go to Senpo Temple. Sekiro's map is smaller in that regard compared to its siblings, 
and somewhat more interconnected, but it still has a so-called center. The center of Lies of P is the hotel. However, the fundamental difference between the hotel and other central locations is that it has loading screens. Generally, in From Software's games, you can go from one edge of the map to the other with no loading screens in between. Lies of P does not have this freedom. In fact, in its level design, there is no freedom of movement. You can't wander off like in other games, you are always on track to the next story beat. You go from the hotel to Elysian Boulevard to Vanini Works to the cathedral to the Mound District, which leads you back to the hotel. From there, you go to Rosa Isabel Street, then the arcade, the exhibition, then the swamp, and then back to the hotel again. To contrast this linearity with an anecdote, usually when I play Sekiro, I always complete Senpo Temple before I actually have to go there, which illustrates how much freedom you have in choosing where to go. It doesn't feel as seamless as From Software's games, and it's very on rails. However, I do not entirely hate it. Yes, From Software's games, not even talking about the open world Elden Ring here, have much more to explore and discover, hidden nooks and crannies to satiate your curiosity. Eyes of P dials this way back. The only real optional area is the Hermit's Cave, which isn't really too visually striking or different from the swamp. On a smaller scale, the individual levels are so small, with few side paths or optional bosses when compared to From Software's games. On one hand, this allows for the developers to build a much more concise and understandable narrative. I don't think it's necessarily all that bad. It works for what Lies of P wants to do. This, that is, tell a very linear story. And it's not surprising that the team that worked on Lies of P would go for a smaller, more concise map for the first game. Again, this is Round 8 Studios' first game ever. Not first Souls-like game, but first game in general. The fact that they have managed to do anything even remotely close to From Software's design is already praiseworthy in itself. Naturally, there were gonna be some drawbacks here and there, and certainly the level design merits criticism, but should not be held against the studio. Regardless of all of that, it is still a fun world to explore, but I can understand it getting boring on repeated playthroughs. I do think that, at the very least, the developers could have made Central Crot connect to Venini Works, the Cathedral and the Malum District all individually by different paths. I get why they didn't do this, though. The game starts with the Puppet Frenzy. This is our main roadblock, or so we think. The Cathedral surprises us with the carcasses, and the Malum District shows us the true extent of what the alchemists have done. Spreading these areas out and giving us the freedom to explore them at our own leisure would have ruined the suspenseful build of this plotline. However, with more optional areas and bosses, the problem of feeling underleveled would be mitigated, which a lot of people complain about. Usually you go through the levels of From Software games with the intention that you will be just as strong as the game wants you to be. So while the odds should feel stacked against you, you should never feel so overwhelmed that you need to grind, though that has happened in almost every Souls-like that I have personally played. In Lines of P though, you don't have that many ways to control your leveling. You are given a certain amount of ergo by the game in the way of bosses and mini-bosses, and if you lose any of that ergo or don't level correctly, you will screw yourself over. You can respec by the Synthes of Mercy statue, but that is more or less two-thirds of the way through the game, with eight areas behind you and three areas ahead still. I never felt like I needed to grind, but I can see it being a problem for some, especially with diminishing returns that you start getting after levels 25 to 30 depending on the stats. On the other side of the coin, this does mean that your stay with the game and its difficulty isn't over long. You speed run through the areas, no nonsense or long stretches of boredom. It allows the game to be concise, and I can respect the devs making a shorter game instead of bloating it with useless filler, where the market is oversaturated with games that go on for way too long in my opinion. Still, Round 8 has shown that they do have a good grasp on general level design. I think Vanini Works is one of the best examples. The factory, the grand exhibition, and the arcade all leave a plausible feeling that they are far bigger than the physical level actually is, at least compared to other areas, though they don't really compare to most levels in From Software titles. However, the illusion works, with a lot of changes in verticality and different entrances and shortcuts making the level feel like an intricate maze. 
One thing is to make a big game, but a completely different, equally respectable achievement is to make a physically small game that feels bigger than it is. Going forward, I wish Round 8 will lean more into this strength that they clearly have, but I hope that they still have variety in future level designs. The worst thing you can do with a concept that works is overuse it until the magic is gone. Still, because of this magic, Benini Works is the best level in the entire game, in my opinion. Setting aside the number of areas, I do think that the pacing here is perfectly in place. Usually we start on a narrow road with a few enemies to give us a heads up on what we will be facing up ahead. The only real time this convention is broken is during the cathedral level, but that is done to shock the player when they encounter the carcass enemies for the first time. Another thing that the pacing succeeds at is not boring the player. After every major area we are introduced to some new mechanic. Legion arms after the tutorial, P organs after Elysium Boulevard, grindstones and more legion arms after Venini works, the cube in the cathedral and boss weapons right after, defeating the brotherhood will unlock us the gold coin fruit, the effects and significance of humanity is also explored more after Rosa Isabel, and as a final treat we unlock respecking at the Saintess of Mercy statue after we beat Victor at the Grand Exhibition. Admittedly it does slow down after this, the last four areas of the game don't introduce new things but that would also be a bit weird this late into the game. A further thing that I appreciate is how the world feels lived in and still alive. From software games have this aesthetic of mono no avare. Everything is dark and gloomy and very much alone, empty. But something I greatly enjoy about Lines of P is that it breaks some of these conventions. We have people in their homes, just like in Bloodborne. We can also hear singing on Rosa Isabel Street. We can hear the piano playing. We can hear music coming from the windows. On Elysium Boulevard, we can hear coughing and whispering as well. If we pay attention, we can notice that the city is still alive. Still breathing, just asleep. But the game also succeeds in enemy design. Many souls like struggle to think of a good enemy base that will lend itself to variety. Hollow Knight is a good example of this done right. Principally, bugs can be and look like anything. There is little that holds them back. The developers can then use this base to create whatever they want. Playing with what we perceive as different characteristics in bugs. Strong bugs, agile bugs, small bugs, big bugs, so on and so forth. There's a uniformity without repetition. We see a subversion of this principle in Sekiro, which has a lot of animal boss fights. Beasts aren't new for Souls-likes, but I have noticed that this dependency on non-human bosses is most noticeable in Sekiro, because you can only make so many human bosses before it becomes repetitive. Dark Souls 2 gets a lot of flack for this. Meanwhile, puppets and mutated monsters independently can become a lot of things, and together they open up entirely new fields for the imagination. They also, much like the Corrupted Parade Master, subvert your preconceived notions. You might think that you've gotten the hang of the enemy design, but then, without any radical changes, Lines of Peace starts throwing you curveballs. Openings which were safe before now have new combos. And this is good! Lines of Peace should keep testing the player and pushing us to new limits, the same way from software games do. The game also changes between the enemy types efficiently. Krat and Vanini works naturally are overrun by puppets, but in the third area we already see a new enemy type. This continues to the Malum district, after which we change back to puppets for a bit before we see some new carcasses. Joseph Anderson, in his review of the game, compares this to how Half-Life would constantly switch between the aliens and the military. I also generally love the boss designs. They are all faithful to the Pinocchio world and story, the Parade Master as a callback to the circus at the start of the book, the different animals represented by masks, the black rabbits, the fox and the cat. Big enemies are also fun and scary. Andreas looks disgusting and the green swamp monster is unnervingly creepy, its weird light bulb eyes floating in the air. The puppet bosses are also incredibly memorable. Romeo and the Nameless Puppet have such unique designs, despite how simple and humanoid they are. Laxasia's spiky utilitarian armor contrasts well with the round ornate architecture of the Belle Epoque. There are a few stinkers as there always is. Fukuo is very forgettable, as is the Walker of Illusions, if we can even consider her a boss. But these are small exceptions. The majority of bosses are fun and fit perfectly into the greater world. On the topic of aesthetics, Lies of P commits to this point outstandingly. 
I already mentioned how the intro cinematic helps you settle into the fantastical world of Krat, but the level design also fits into this. We of course have fantasy elements like dark scary forests and dangerous swamps, as well as castles and churches. The puppets and monsters also evoke the feeling of fantasy and adventure befitting of a fairy tale. We've seen these sorts of elements time and time again, even in games, most recent with Resident Evil Village, which is a masterclass of utilizing fantasy in a modern setting for modern audiences. But for a slightly older example we have Alice Madness Returns, another dark retelling of a classic children's tale. In these sorts of games it is critical that the narrative retains that otherworldly feeling. Alice stays even truer to its source material, with the characters doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but Lies of P's NPCs are no slouches either. I already mentioned how the animal masked stalkers fit into this, but other tropes are represented here as well. The kind ethereal beauty, the crazy inventor and father figure, the bombastic eccentric socialite, the hardworking craftsperson from a faraway land, the regal and wise madam, the shifty mad hatter, the talkative mascot, Bloodborne felt like a horror game without actually being a horror game as we understand it, supported on all sides by spiraling winding level design, dark, rough architecture, illogical and unnerving enemy designs, characters who all feel insane or malicious, or both, making you suspect everyone you come across. And this is not easy to do. We have countless examples of great high fantasy worlds, but settings like Yarnum in Bloodborne and Krat in Lies of P aren't exactly new, but still uncommon, even in games, and are hard to do so perfectly. I love returning to Yarnum not only for the combat, but for the lore, the world, the story, and I love returning to Krat for the same reasons. Even the name, Krat, makes me tingle. It feels so unique, so special, and it evokes as strong an image as the word Yarnum does. This atmosphere and aesthetic seeps into every facet of the game, especially the bosses with their intimidating figures, feeling like mythical creatures you have to actually overcome. However, not everyone seems to regard this as positively as I do. The bosses do get a lot of flack for being long, but if the bosses were any shorter, their monumentality would be wasted, especially on repeated playthroughs. RD, they are fairly easy once you know what you are doing, so it is merely a matter of the player realizing what the game wants you to do. Lies of P is a very short game by souls like standards, and due to the linearity of its level design, every boss and mini boss have some sort of importance. As such, making them as easy as souls like bosses from, I don't know, five years ago would make the game way too easy. One thing that I will mention and admit is that a lot of the player's frustrations comes from the game setting up weird expectations or not explaining things properly. The second part is old news by now, Souls games never explain anything, so in this Lies of P stays faithful to genre conventions. So what do I mean by weird expectations then? Everything in Krat City and Vanini Works is perfect. We get introduced to electric shock and blocking before the Watchmen fight. In the factory, the pool of corruption below the puppet of the future is a signpost for Fugo's fire attacks, which can also be outmaneuvered, just like the pool of corruption. These are perfect examples of the level preparing you for its boss encounter. The cathedral is also fine, its main niche is that fire is strong against carcass enemies. But then sometimes the level design flops a little. In the slums when we go against the Brotherhood, it feels like we should also be having backup. The presence of the fox and the cat in this area seems to also suggest that they should be helping us, but then they dip out after 5 seconds. Thankfully, by this time we will have faced human opponents, so the Brotherhood stalkers aren't anything new, but the game sets up weird expectations that are then awkwardly forgotten. Further examples? The miniboss literally right in front of the opera house, where Romeo is, will drill into you the importance of blocking. He is optional, sure, but he still has a boss health bar. But when we face Romeo, as Joseph Anderson pointed out, if you focus on blocking everything like you did during the clown fight, Romeo will kick your ass. Dodging makes both Mech and Romeo himself much easier to fight. So, what's with the clown setup? Other times the game does this well again. Walker of Illusions is technically a gank boss fight, but the fact that only one enemy is aggroed at a time foreshadows the second Brotherhood fight. The green swamp monster also sets up the following areas quite well, demonstrating the synthesis of puppets and carcasses. 
Another thing that the level design gets a lot of criticism for are the ambush enemies. And yeah, for a game this short, it is very noticeable. It really sticks out like a sore thumb. Souls games also have them in every area, it's just that Lies of P's areas are much shorter, so it is more noticeable. But again, these are minor annoyances at worst. If you leave behind items because you're afraid that an enemy might attack you, then honestly that kinda sounds like a you problem. Often the levels will let you counter these ambushes if you are careful and observant. Usually these are mob enemies. There are only a couple of big ambushes, but generally that's rare. I do agree though, the breaking bridge thing is stupid and should not happen as much as it does. I hope there is less of it in the DLC. So in summary, the linearity of Lies of P isn't inherently bad. It does mean that it's less exploration, but it still serves a narrative purpose. And I think the focus on combat mechanics is a worthy trade-off, because that is the main draw of Lies of P. Not all areas shine equally, but for Round 8's first try at level design, they succeed in making every area visually distinct and separate from each other, while still maintaining a uniform style. You won't confuse the arcade or the exhibition with, say, the cathedral or the slums. Every area is unique, even when compared to From Software's games. Of course, there are similarities, most prominently with Bloodborne, but the colors, style of architecture, layout, and story all give Lies of P its own identity. I should also note here that out of all the swamp levels that I've played throughout the years, the Boron Swamp is the least annoying, and despite being somewhat drab in comparison to the other areas, it still manages to be somewhat fun, which is something even From Software notoriously struggles with. In my opinion, Lies of P's shorter, more focused level design also saves it from criticism that, for example, Dark Souls 1 gets, namely the second half falloff. You will see videos talking about this, both arguing for this point and against it. I would confidently assert that Lies of P mostly escapes this criticism. There is a slight dip, but this happens only after the exhibition, so it's more like the last third drop-off, if anything. And even then, the swamp isn't as annoying as other swamp levels, in my honest opinion. Ruined Crot isn't all too much to write home about, but it still remains memorable and a cool addition, again, to show the progression of stakes relative to the start of the game. The Relic of Trismegistus is kind of lame for how important it is, but its short stay doesn't allow for too great of an annoyance. It's so short and insignificant, in fact, that I completely forgot about it when I first recorded this part. Again, there is more to the level of the relic, but we just haven't been able to go there yet. Time will only tell if it's cut content or DLC, so I will refrain from judging it too hard. The Arch Abbey is definitely the worst level though. I'm sure there are people who will defend it, but there are just a lot of misses here. Still, it's the last area of the game, so mm, it was bound to happen sooner or later. No game truly escapes this fate, but some have it better than others. For future DLC or games or whatever, I would mainly suggest making other small optional areas. This way the players can satisfy their need to explore and be curious. More areas means more bosses and more bosses means more ergo. This would also give us more options for build variety and also make the game slightly easier for those who struggle with the blocking without dumbing down any of the mechanics. Alright, we've finally reached the final area of the game, the Arch Abbey. To make up for how long this area is, I will be trying to go through it as fast as I can. We crash our ship on the beach and meet Sophia, where she fully confesses her intentions. She woke up P not to save Krat, but to save herself. It turns out that she has been astral projecting this entire time, as Simon had trapped her quite long ago now. Sophia tells us about herself, that she is the daughter of Valentinus Monad, leader of the alchemists, before Manus. Her usefulness came from her ability to manipulate Ergo and turn back time, though how Manus has been using these powers and to what ends is uncertain. It seems that he might have also had more personal reasons for trapping her. In any case, she asks you to find her and put an end to her misery. Soon enough, you know he's quite busy. While you're why don't you give me a friend? His name is Mom. 
We also see visions of the past on the beach, brought forth by all the ergo that the alchemists are gathering. These are memories of Carlo, his time at the orphanage, his friendship with a younger Sophia, Romeo, his disdain for his father and even his admiration of the legendary stalker. We even see Carlo's death, though it's not told us how exactly he died. As we approach, Ballista's bulls start shooting at us. We can use these to kill the stone-skinned monsters. Not far ahead is our first boss of the level, the Door Guardian. He tanks like crazy, but he's a gimmick boss. You're supposed to attack his right leg, and if you do so enough, he will fall down. But he can hit you when he does this, so be careful. His movement speed is slow, but he does have a roll, so running away isn't really an option. You're going to have to stay aggressive. His attacks will also shock you, draining your stamina. This makes the boss incredibly annoying, and definitely the worst of the entire game. The tower is filled with these small, simple puzzles to activate doors and bridges. Make sure you get all the shortcuts, because running back in this area is a real pain. We can also meet test subject A26, one of the last sane alchemists. He tells us how they have been forced to consume Ergo so that they can read the memories instilled within them. I'm not sure why, but it's cool that we have this information, I guess. In the tower we can also find Valentinus's correspondence with the old families of Krat, especially Wolf, father of the Red Fox. They talk about a laboratory. I don't know where this laboratory could be, but it does hint to the possibility that the alchemists have been conducting experiments for a while now, even before Simon took over. In the Arch Abbey, we also finally come face to face with the man behind the phone calls, Arlecchino. Oh my, an actual factual guest. <laughs> I bid you welcome, puppet of Geppetto. We find him in the last Trinity Sanctum, a Trinity symbol on his chest, the Spear of the Blind Stalker stamped through it. We now witness his depravity in full, can taste his malice and hate. He says he's been borrowing some of Sophia's power to talk to you through the phones. If you return to Venini around this time, he will have two things for you. First, he's decoded the King of Puppets message, which reveals the existence of Law Zero, meaning that Geppetto had complete control over the puppets. You can share that fact with Venini or keep him in the dark. Geppetto? Law Zero, the creator's name is Geppetto? One can't make these things up. It must be true. That was the cause of the frenzy. He will also share with you how he was orphaned by a deranged killer puppet named Arlecchino. If we return to Arlecchino, we can ask further questions from him to get the full picture of the story. Arlecchino was once a servant puppet to the alchemists. However, something within him awakened when he realized that puppets were built to be slaves to humans. Benini suggests that the lingering memories of a madman must have stirred his ego, which could mean that Arlecchino was deranged back when he was still human. Arlecchino turned on his master and tortured him, learning some useful tricks that the alchemists used. Since then, he grew to despise humans. He became a rather prolific and infamous murderer. His greatest triumph was the murder of Venini's parents, the people who engineered the very first automated puppets. They begged Arlecchino to spare their child. Arlecchino, a living being despite being in a puppet's body, was overcome with curiosity and what would happen if he did just that. He takes great pleasure in knowing that the case of Vanini's parents has, and likely never will be, publicized, making the man suffer even more. Vanini, all his faults and successes, are born of Arlecchino's hands. Arlecchino has killed many others as well, including Adelina Corday, to which he refers to in vague and uncertain terms. He asks you to finally consider his position, really the position of all puppets, and makes a rather valid, albeit frightening, point. Now listen closely, and heed the king's speech, or the answer to this one will stay out of reach. Are you a puppet? Or a human being? Which one are you? Are you? human. <laughs> Who 
We may be trapped by ergo, but we live, we think, we love, we hate. <laughs> They have locked us in the prison they call puppetry. Puppets are capable of consciousness despite their design. We have seen this time and time again. But that includes the freedom to do evil. Arlecchino is as human as they come, driven by hate and sadistic hedonism. If we are human and wish to be viewed as such, if being colored like tools is wrong, so too does it apply to someone like Arlecchino. He mocks our attempts and revels at the legacy he has left. After all, if not for him, none of the events of the game would have happened. No murder of Vanini's parents, no grand covenant, no puppet frenzy, no grand plot by Geppetto or the alchemists. But Arlecchino is still a product of human ambition. Had he not been created, had humans not tried to play God, we'd have been better off. In that sense, even Arlecchino is a victim of the worst parts of humanity, which he ironically also represents. Once we have listened to his confession, we can put an end to the King of Riddles, the Puppet Ripper. He leaves us a souvenir he stole, which we can return to Venini. More than any other character, Arlecchino makes us question the nature of puppets. Are they a miracle or a hell of our own making? Indeed, Kraut's arrogance led to its own downfall. Overambitious and comfortable humans wanting to delegate everything to slaves. Never able to shrug off that need to be in control of another living being, of being on top, even if they must create an entirely new specimen for it. Benini thanks us for the closure we have given him, though it does not ask about the fate of Arlecchino. If I hadn't, would my parents still be alive? Would we have been untouched by that murderous puppet? I've always blamed myself. <laughs> It's a hell of a burden for a child, that kind of guilt. So I hung on. I hung on to the Grand Covenant. I wanted to use it to keep people safe. You know, in many ways, I envy you. Your strength. Thank you for this. Talk about closure. Upon rest, Pulcinella will ask to talk to us, revealing that he too has an ego born way back when Lorenzini was a child. Even though they both knew the truth, they could not admit it that it was a puppet that killed the Veninis, as that would mean the removal of Pulcinella. Also thanks you for helping and being a true friend to Venini. Ascending the tower, after the elevator, we confront Gatto. If we've given him gold coin fruit before, we can reaffirm our friendship and skip his encounter. He will let us go, wishing to leave this place with his sister and get far, far away from this hellhole. He tells you that Geppetto is safe and asks you to let his sister go as well. We climb along the edge of the tower, trying to avoid enemies. They are pulling out all stops and progressing without dying can be quite hard. We also come across one of the instances where I have to agree that the ambushes are complete bollocks. I myself have never fallen for it because I always run past it to the stargazer that I know is just beyond the corner of this very annoying section. We activate the stargazer and we face the third to last boss, Simon's right hand woman, Laxasia. Laxasia was formerly known as Sister Adriana, who penned the so said Pistris books. The main goal of the alchemists was always to ascend to a new form of humanity. This is what all the experiments with the petrification disease have been about. We met many of the test subjects, the one we found in the Abbey, the ones we've been fighting at the exhibition and destroyed Krat, the Owl Doctor, Victor and even the Walker of Illusions. However, none of them got the final elixir, they were all half successes. Sister Adriana was the first one to get the finalized cure, turning her into Laxasia the Complete. With new powers beyond the simple humans, she could serve the alchemists and be the role model for the new wave of superhumans. However, no matter how perfect she might be, the one thing the Alexa couldn't change were her unrequited feelings for Simon. On one hand, Laxaise is one of, if not the hardest boss in the game. So far into the game, I have little new to say about boss fights, but also she is the one that we can talk about until the sun comes up. Laxaise is the most aggressive, hard to parry boss in the entire game. Her combos go from 2 to 4 hits to as many as 9 or even 13. She'll put to test everything you've learned so far, though this makes her rather unpopular with some people, especially since she isn't even the final boss. She will also employ electric shock with some of her attacks, meaning you can't always just approach her, even after she has finished her attack. 
In the first phase of her boss battle, you can break her shield, which I strongly recommend, since it will make the second phase that much easier. Also, you can technically break her sword, but that requires more perfect parries than I've got hair on my head. If you do somehow manage this, it will go straight to phase 2 without her having to take any health damage. I uh, originally did have a whole section that I wrote out talking about how to block and dodge and counter all of her attacks, but <laughs> I'm not doing that here. The video is already long enough. I'm sure there's someone out there who is just itching to make a Loxaze is actually the best Soulsborne boss ever video. So I'll leave that honor to someone else. I will say though, even though Laxazia isn't my favorite boss out of the entire game, she does represent all of the game mechanics. She is hard. She requires you to understand the dynamics between dodging and blocking, and how to use both of them and at which time. She is also completely viable if you only master one, blocking or dodging, though this does make her very hard for the lay player, the option is still there. As stated before, you can technically break her sword, though there is no real animation for this and it doesn't change the battle. However, you can complete this fight purely by parrying. In fact, there are videos about this on YouTube, where in the first phase you parry until her sword breaks, and in the second phase you parry her lightning attacks. If nothing else, this alone crowns her as queen of the combat in Lies of P. A lot of people struggle with Laxasia. The start of her second phase is particularly annoying. She also has a lot of attacks that have very unusual delays. But there are also a lot of people who love Laxasia, and I have to agree that she is one of the most fun bosses. Infuriating, yes, but that is the point. If she were not so hard, then the end of the game would feel very underwhelming. Honestly, in the case of Laxasia, dodging is generally the best strategy. You are more than welcome to try and learn how to parry all of her attacks, but if you just want to beat her, dodge and run away when you need to. You'll have a much easier time like this. In the first phase, try to keep your distance, then when she finishes her attacks, run in before backing away again. In the second phase, try not to panic. If she is in the air or charged with electricity, she will usually delay her attacks. Stay away and let her come to you, then punish her before running away again. Lots of pulse cells are mandatory, and if you need to cheese her a bit with throwing items, be my guest. Even more so than the Nameless Puppet, Laxase is the perfect Lies of P boss. A lot of people joke how Melina is a Sekiro boss, but Laxasia is completely within her lane here. She doesn't feel out of place at all for the player character's skills. She just takes a very long time to master. She's also another one of those bosses that is very hard to fumble through. While Lies of P in general is very demanding and asks a lot of you, Laxasia is the complete culmination of that. You have to use everything at your disposal, or else she will kick your ass. The only thing that could be objectively bad about her would be her positioning in the story, since Manus after her is kind of anticlimactic, and the Nameless Puppet almost comes close to overshadowing her. But I think the fact that she gatekeeps the most important part of the story also speaks to her importance, not only in mechanics, but also in the narrative. Though she dies, the show is not over yet. We still have two bosses left. After Alexis's death, Subject 826 will have moved to Rosa Isabel Street and reveal himself as a fan of the late Patricia Corday, also revealing the exact circumstances through which Patricia lost her voice, poisoning, though he is incorrect in assuming it was self-inflicted. With unsurpassed sorrow, I must announce Lady Antonia has passed away. This happens regardless of if you give her the cure or not. But if you do, she will have left you a record and a note, thanking you for giving her a chance to be free and happy once more, for however short a time. The record is labeled Memory of Beach. The connection to the beach where we witness memories of Carlo could be coincidental, but it could also mean that she was the legendary stalker. Who knows? The skies clear up and we discover what Laxasia was hiding.
We see the result of Sophia's imprisonment. She begs us to free her from this torment. It's uncertain what exactly caused this. Clearly, she has been decaying for some time now. Was she used in some way in the experiments? How did Simon use her powers? The carcass head on her desk says, Her true power was the ability to move time. But that's not really an explanation. She couldn't be the source of the petrification disease, as that was around before her father Valentinus died, and before she went missing. But could she have contributed to it somehow growing to this level, where like, every third Krat citizen is ill? Again, who knows. Certainly she seems to suffer from a similar ailment, as her soul turns to Ergo. We claim her Ergo, and the humanity she has left behind completes our transformation into something adjacent to a real human being. Halfway to the top, we meet the red fox. Ciao, bello. If we spared her brother, we can give her a coin as well, and she will leave us alone. This choice doesn't make that much sense. Her objective is to get her brother to see again, but we've already spared the cat and given him coin as well. Since we spared him, she has no need for revenge, nor motivation to fight us at all. I guess this is just her nature, self-serving to the bone, but it seems a bit too greedy to try to press more out of us when we've already made it this far. I mean, does she really think she's stronger than Laxazia? Doubtful. I get that foxes are conniving, but she should be smarter than this. This much? It might even cure him entirely. It's not fair, the way I've been harassing you. You're the only one who's ever been kind to us. I never even introduced myself. I'm Claudia. If only we had been friends from the start. But I suppose it wasn't possible. We were both protecting something, and those things weren't... compatible. We didn't fit together. Hurry. Please. Go to your family. Finally, we find Geppetto locked in a cell. For whatever reason, he has the key to the door, but before that, we must answer a question. And yet, I think all I've taught you is blood and violence. This will be the last time, I ask. I promise. Simon has gone completely mad. He's trying to become a god by using a tremendous amount of ergo. I don't know what kind of world he wants to build. Perhaps there's no stopping him. I trust you, my son, and I'm ready for any outcome. But I don't know what you think of me. Speak truthfully, for my sake. Was I a trustworthy father to you? I see. I didn't do enough to earn your trust. I wasn't a very good father to you. I gave you more loneliness than love. That's my burden to bear. But remember, there is still plenty of time. Once all this is over, we can become a real family. I promise, I will give it back to you, the happy family we once were. By this point, humanity doesn't really matter. If your hair hasn't gone grey by now, it won't regardless of your answer, so I suppose it's rather a test of character. Did you understand the message of the game? Or do you perhaps truly see Geppetto in a positive light, despite his shortcomings? Or do you condemn this father of yours for his actions? If you answer yes, that he has been a trustworthy father, he thanks you and says that he can now move forward. If you answer no, that he hasn't been trustworthy, he will seemingly reflect on his actions. Is this a genuine reflection? Is he vying for pity from his own son who has killed so many people and puppets? All for his own plot to bring back the son who died due to his neglect? Regardless, his objective hasn't changed. 
He wants, no matter what, to rebuild the family he once had and lost. And somehow, we are still not done. God, this level fucking drag. We see one more unique enemy, this disruption spitting muscle man. He is a tough cookie, but nothing you can't handle. I skip now to Simon Pistris Manus himself. So, what's the deal with the alchemists? Well, to Simon, his father was like a god. And no, I'm not being hyperbolic here. There are known immortals among the ranks of the alchemists. Simon says as much in his confession. The one who created me was no normal human. Simon had extraordinary abilities, supposedly able to read the minds of people or the memories of objects. The vagueness of this might be a translation issue, but there seems to be evidence for both being true? I don't know. Simon, however, was abandoned by his creator. Rejected by his god, he sought out to make a new one, to become one himself. As we went over before, the alchemists believe in a godlike angel who was torn to pieces after offering immortality to humans. Now Simon's posse has been trying to reach that godhood again. Having found the arm of god, they tried to use it, but found it required some sort of power source. Ergo was compatible, but soon they realized that it burnt through the stuff as fast as a kid goes through a bag of candy so they needed some way to gather a whole bunch of it. To this end, the alchemists also started to experiment with the petrification disease. The disease occurs when one is exposed to ergo for too long. Eventually, people started getting sick, and the alchemists would offer a cure, a potent elixir that would make use of the disease's mutations to enhance a normal human's capabilities. Most died or turned to carcass monsters, but some, notably the stalkers and other people with strong constitutions like Victor, would be able to withstand the cure, remaining somewhat lucid and sane. Ergo also has a third use. A note right before Victor's boss battle reads, Ergo hearts connect minds with wavelengths, that transparent fullness where lies cannot exist. Is that the new true world or a forced prison? Simon also mentions the new world he will create when he becomes god one where there will be no truths or lies. When God awakens, he will be like a bird who has just cracked open his shell. He will possess tremendous abilities that can change the world, yet be as innocent as a child. It seems that Simon wanted to create a world based on this childish innocence, one where there are no lies, no deception, no betrayals. Scars that run deep after his creator left him. Thus we also get the game's tagline, Deception Shatters Innocence. Simon's world would be one without humans or humanity, which runs antithetical to our own journey. His plan is a bit childish, naive, but also very founded in an understandable cynicism. Imagine being able to know everything those around you think. No wonder he becomes so jaded and wants to create a world where all is connected and innocent. One fleeing test subject recounts how he was made to consume Ergo and read the memories of others. Simon wanted everyone to be like him when he turns into that innocent god of his illusions. This is also the reason why he must have kidnapped Sophia. Her innocent and pure mind was a tonic for Simon's pain, as he says. Her sweet and tender disposition made him enamored by her, despite her own unnatural abilities. Still, what exactly their plan was remained somewhat ambiguous. Were they trying to infect all of Krat to give them the petrification disease and so leech off of all that ergo that it would create? How does Geppetto and P tie into this outside of getting the arm of God back? Why is that after we defeat Andreas, the ergo from the bosses starts being sucked to the aisle? Did we kickstart the ritual or did Simon just happen to start the ergo extraction at that very moment? Or has he been waiting on his fucking chair for the past, I don't know how many years, waiting for something to happen? These questions remain as of now unanswered. The theme of kind lies against forced truth seems somewhat tacked on, which a lot of people rightfully criticize. I wish there was more of a discussion surrounding this theme, but there is quite a bit that we can find in-game. The protection of the Grand Covenant was a giant lie, one which led directly to the puppet frenzy through Geppetto's meddling. The murder of Vanini's parents, another event which kickstarted a lot of the game, was also covered up a lie, because it would have been bad for the reputation of the city and of the puppets. Was the immortality promised by the angel that fell from the sky also not a lie? Lying can be kind and cause less heartache than telling the truth, but is it really better or more moral? If we lie to Vanini about who started the frenzy, can we be sure it will never happen again? If we lie about Alidor's identity to Eugenie, will she ever be able to close that hole in her heart? Is Hugo's wish to continue Alidor's legacy, one now stained by betrayal and greed, 
really the best idea? And should we not tell him that truth about the hero he looked up to? Is keeping the nature of puppets, their capacity to be human, a secret, not morally unjustifiable? Alas, we don't get any of this in-game, which is a big waste. We must pick up the torch of philosophy ourselves, but that will all come in its proper time. For now, we still have a game to beat. Simon's first phase is relatively easy, especially after Loxasia. He has a lot of wide sweeping attacks, which are rather sloppy and unbalanced. And this makes it hard to know when he is done with his attacks and when he is charging up a new one. He will have one attack where he slams his uh, hammer, I think, into the ground and white hellfire will appear, but the circle is small and doesn't do a lot of damage. I don't have much advice for Simon. I try to dodge in the direction of his attacks, much like the King of Puppets mech. It doesn't have a whole lot of health, and by now your weapon should be plenty upgraded to do enough damage against him. He also doesn't do a whole lot of damage himself, so truth be told, I just tank through his first phase. And surprise surprise, he has two of these phases. He does that one pose from the creation of Adam by Michelangelo, though the growth on his left side just looks like a penis head. He keeps some of his swinging moves, but can now use his left arm of God to send out special attacks. When he does swing, try to stay close as he can push you quite far away. At around half health in the second phase, he will do this summoning ritual. From now on, periodically, a hand of God will appear somewhere around the arena. This will have a very obvious and long animation, giving you plenty of time to skedaddle to the other side of the circle. The most bullshit attack that Manus has is to sleep into the fucking heavens. Your camera can't follow him, so you have to guess when he will come down. It's a fury attack too, so you can't just dodge it either. I believe it's about 3 seconds long. I somehow was able to intuit the timing and parry it during my second playthrough, but yeah, it's the most unfair attack in the game and I can't tell if it's intentional or not. You can try and unlock your camera if you have the presence of mind to do that during the fight, but I don't know how effective this is. His attacks are weak and his health bar isn't that big, though I imagine he was a bit more annoying before they nerfed his health. However, it's mostly a spectacle boss, I don't mind it being so easy as it is, as we just had Loxasia, and the next boss will be quite a doozy as well. He rambles on about Sophia, fucking weird if you ask me, especially as he has a copy of her portrait, as well as a lock of hair in his cane. Anyway, he shares one last piece of wisdom to you, be wary of Geppetto. After defeating Simon, we get one last heartfelt monologue from Gemini, which I will skip, and reach the core of the Abbey to confront Geppetto. I knew you could do it. We have all the ingredients we need. Unfortunately, he's not about to bake us a cake, though he is a few eggs short of a breakfast. The old man goes full mask off. His plan was to use you to bring back his dead son, Carlo. He put Carlo's memories into our P organ heart, hoping we'd gather ergo on our journey. Now he plans to use all of that ergo, as well as all the ergo that the alchemists coveted, and the arm of God to bring back Carlo. For this, though, Pinocchio must give him his heart. If you give me your heart, all these trials and tribulations will be over. You have been a brilliant and a good boy. As your reward, I shall turn you into a real boy. Give me your heart, son. If you do, then no surprise, you get the bad ending, where Carlo comes back to life, but as a murderous puppet of Geppetto's. He kills everyone at the hotel, and they get replaced with puppets themselves. Geppetto seems to want to do this to the rest of Crot as well, his megalomania having gone completely out of control. Ironically, once he gets Carlo back, he just ends up abandoning him again. Truly father of the year material. I believed you were a good boy. But you insist on breaking my heart. Well, I suppose Carlo was mischievous. It seems you inherited his personality instead of his memories. But a father always looks after his children. Even naughty ones that must be punished, like you. In my own way, I grew to love you. After all, you're the puppet who would bring my son back to life. Obviously, we don't give him our heart, which leads us to two other endings. If we've lied and gained just enough humanity to rebel, 
we get the neutral ending, where we remain a puppet but gain some freedom. In the true ending, however, which is signified if you have long grey hair after Sophia dies, we will have already become human. To celebrate our new birth, Geppetto really is a surprise gift for us. An optional boss fight. The nameless puppet was the first puppet to receive a pea organ. Note, not the first ever puppet, just the first one with a pea organ, the heart that powers us as well. The intention of this was to harbor Carlo's soul, which is why I'm adamant that it should have been impossible for Camille to have designed the Saintus of Mercy statue with a pea organ, because that would make no sense in the timeline. The Piercing Hatred amulet says, it is unknown whether the nameless puppet had an ego. This is because multiple cores holding concentrated ergo were used to boost its firepower. If this puppet could feel only one emotion, it would be hatred. I don't think I need to say this, but it's a two-stage fight. The first stage is relatively simple, outside of the fact that the fucker can heal himself twice. To keep this from happening, just stay aggressive and don't give him the chance. Along with Loxasia, the Nameless Puppet is one of the hardest bosses in the game, but I quite enjoy it, especially the first phase. If you learn the patterns, it will be incredibly easy to and satisfying to parry him. I highly recommend blocking, you can easily earn your health back by parrying his attacks. Even if you fumble some of them with the normal blocks, as long as you can parry some, you will conserve a lot of health. The new P organ upgrade, which has replaced the rising dodge, is also incredibly useful in this fight. The second phase is a lot harder. It's been compared to Lady Maria or Melenia. Melenia? Melena. Fuck, I don't remember. Too many similar names in that game, honestly. I feel like that was Martin's main contribution to it. When the Nameless Puppet enters his second phase, he will have this one fury attack, which he usually starts with, which is very hard to dodge. And even more so to parry. It has no clear indicator, so you will just have to intuit when it happens. After a while I have managed this, but it can be very hard and annoying. There also isn't a whole lot of downtime between his attacks, so you have to really be careful. Which is the best example of what a lot of people don't like about Lies of P. You just have to learn the timing of some things, not all attacks are intuitive. It's satisfying when you do, but learning it can be frustrating, and people don't seem to like learning things when it comes to souls likes. I get that this is a minority, Lies of P has an overwhelmingly positive on Steam, so clearly the majority does like this game. But still, it's a criticism that I hear a lot, and 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 a whole lot. Much like Romeo, some of his longer combos can be avoided with some smart dodges. You have to keep an eye on his openings. Fable Arts and Consumables are king here, Legion Arms don't seem to work too well though as the Nameless Puppet moves around too much. Sometimes I did land a good hit with the Puppet String, so that's worth trying. The fandom has interpreted the Nameless Puppet a certain way, which the game seems to heavily imply. Namely that the body of the Nameless Puppet is the literal body of Carlo, Geppetto's dead son. This ties into the amulet that you can get from the Nameless Puppet's Ergo. If it could feel one emotion, it would be hatred. Carlo's hatred, likely towards his father for being used as a puppet. It seems whatever essence of Carlo is left in the nameless puppet can only feel rage, which could also be why the pea organ with Carlo's memories was put into us because the body was too volatile, trying to rebel against Geppetto's plans. The name for the boss then is also incredibly tragic and ironic. The Nameless Puppet. Everything that was left of Carlo, that made Carlo, Carlo, is gone. Now there is only an empty husk, robbed of any identity, having even lost its name. Merely a puppet of Geppetto's now. And all it can do is hate, and hate, and hate. There's no shortage of fucked up things, especially if you start looking under the surface, and it just paints a darker and darker picture of Geppetto the more you learn about the game and its lore. Once we have depleted his health bar, we will be knocked down in a cutscene, but before the Nameless Puppet can take the final blow...
Here we can see one of two scenes. In a normal ending, Geppetto will curse Pinocchio for being a useless puppet, unable to fulfill his dream, getting his son back. In a true ending, however, we get this. Sorry. <laughs> In the true ending, we get an extra cutscene. We're at the tip of the abbey, taking in the view of Krat one last time. Beats me where from, but P finds a doll in Sophia's likeness. Must be one of Simon's hobbies. We return to Gesture from the start of the game and grant her life as she did to us. The credits roll, and regardless of what ending you got, you get this after credits cutscene. I have a final report on the Crod experiment. You certainly took your time, Paracelsus. Your findings? I think we have a new brother. A new type of humanity, so to speak. You get a peek at Gian Joe's true identity. Seems he wasn't just a simple alchemist after all. We also get a DLC or sequel bait, revealing the next folktale to be The Wizard of Oz. After that, we get an option to immediately start New Game Plus, or take a look around Krat one last time. We can talk to our friends and see what their plans are now that the disaster is finally over. I've made up my mind. I am going to keep living, to honor Atkinson's sacrifice. Someone needs to tell everyone out there what happened in Krat. I'm gonna look for a way out again. Thanks for all your help. I hope Krat finds fortune soon. You have been such a great help to Master Vanini. I will do my best to be of assistance in return. This great disaster, the Krat Crisis, has left no one unaffected. But it's over now, thanks to you. We are all in pain, we're all hurting. But now it's time to begin healing. I will do everything I can to help. Together, compagno, I think we really can make Krat, if not the entire world, a better place. So much has happened. It's bewildering. But it feels like there is hope. Even here in godforsaken Krat, it's all because of you. So thank you. Though I suspect you haven't told me everything. <laughs> I just want safety for everyone at the hotel, at least. That's why I should make sure you're well armed. If you need anything, just ask. Oh, ah, did I scare you? It's me, Hugo. This whole thing has inspired me. 
I'm going to try to be the Aladoro of a new generation. I will also keep looking for the relic's true owner. Check in with me anytime. A great weapon calls for a great... <coughs> Sorry, no, pronouncements aren't my thing. As always, prove that you're worthy. Upstairs, we can find a note left by Sophia. From Hugo, we can retrieve one last amulet or weapon. This description for the weapon reads, A giant scissor blade used by a nameless puppet. It is a double-edged sword that can end one's freedom or grant it by cutting the strings of manipulation. Puppets are tied to strings. Humans have cut their own strings. The boy made a choice and became human. Upstairs in Geppetto's room, we can also find the fruits of our labor, the golden lie, having fully grown from Carlo's portrait. A mystical wooden rod obtained from the boy's portrait. Fascinatingly, it extends and retracts at the whim of Geppetto's puppet. There are two kinds of lies. Yours is the lie that makes your nose long. The boy loved the fairy tale about the wooden puppet's adventure. At least the wooden puppet's father was kind. And so ends the story of a boy and his journey to discover the meaning of humanity. But what the fuck does it all mean? What really happened? And what does any of this have to do with Pinocchio? No, I'm not going to recount the entire story of Pinocchio, but I will be summarizing the most important points as they relate to the game. Usually I would assume that the consumer is at least aware of the story that the analysis is based on, but considering most people only know Pinocchio from the Disney movie, I think it's safer to cover my ground here by giving you a short summary of what the original Adventures of Pinocchio was like. This will help with explaining themes and characters later. There once was a carpenter named Antonio, who one day picked up a very peculiar log of wood that he wished to carve. However, whenever he tried to carve it, the log would scream out in defense, pleading to not be struck. Soon after, Antonio's friend Geppetto came around, wanting to receive a piece of wood from Antonio to, quote, I thought I would make a beautiful wooden puppet, but a wonderful puppet that should know how to dance, to fence, and to leap like an acrobat. With this puppet, I would travel the world to earn a piece of bread and a glass of wine. What do you think of it? So far, there is little connection between the original story and Lies of P. However, it is worthwhile to note that both Geppetto, in the book as well as in the game, has a very self-serving intent when making Pinocchio. The game's Geppetto wishes to use this vessel to try and jog Carlo's memories, just enough to get his son back, but not too much so that the child would rebel again. In the original story, Geppetto wishes to live off his creation, which could be applied to the general attitude that Krat has towards puppets, servants that make one's life easier, tools on the toil of which they can live off of. It's also not clear, but in the books when Pinocchio escapes from Geppetto, the locals seem to regard this as a wise move, since according to them, Geppetto is a regular tyrant with young boys. Whatever that means. Geppetto laments how he endeavored to make Pinocchio into a well-conducted puppet, but did not take his mischief into account. Well, that makes two for two so far. While Geppetto gets sent to jail, Pinocchio meets a talking cricket, who warns him of the fate that awaits mischievous and unruly boys who do not wish to learn. Pinocchio smashes the cricket dead. Geppetto gets Pinocchio to agree to go to school, and sells his coat to buy Pinocchio an abacus. The boy sells this abacus immediately on his first day, so he can go look at a puppet show, the parade master and carnival that seems to have taken place in Krat are likely allusions to this puppet show. Pinocchio causes a disturbance, but after recounting his pitiful tale, the parade master in the book takes pity on Pinocchio and gives him five cold coins to bring back to his father. As Pinocchio is going home, he meets a blind cat and a limping fox. The naive puppet, as he was literally born last week, tells them that he is returning home with five gold pieces. The fox and cat convince Pinocchio to join them, as they will show him where to bury the gold, so that instead of five pieces, he will have five thousand gold pieces. Pinocchio falls for this ruse, and they stay the night at their red crawfish inn. The two animals leave, and when Pinocchio wakes up, he must set off alone, when two bandits attack him at night. These are of course the fox and the cat, but disguised. Pinocchio runs away and finds a house which belongs to a beautiful child with blue hair. The bandits catch the puppet though and hang him, but as he is made of wood, nothing happens. The blue-haired child saves Pinocchio and tries to take care of Pinocchio, but he is unwilling to drink the bitter medicine, to which four black rabbits with a coffin arrive. 
At this site, Pinocchio swallows the medicine immediately. As an aside, the blue fairy also has a dog servant called Medoro. The fairy asks Pinocchio his story, and where exactly the gold coins went. Pinocchio lies and says that he does not know, and his nose grows longer. With each subsequent lie he tells the fairy his nose grows longer until he physically can't move. The blue fairy reprimands Pinocchio, but softly, in a motherly way, and offers to become Pinocchio's older sister and have him and Geppetto live with her. The puppet agrees and goes to look for his old man when he is met by the fox and cat again, who try to con him once more. They take him to the slums called Trap for Blockheads and he buries his money, hoping for it to become a gold coin tree. He realizes he has been conned and tries to file a complaint but gets thrown in jail instead. Once Pinocchio is freed from jail, he finds that, that the blue-haired child has died of sadness and goes to look for his father. However, he gets separated from Geppetto and washes up on the island of industrious bees. Pinocchio begs for food, but none are willing to give him anything unless he does some work. One old woman with blue hair manages to convince him with sweets, and she turns out to be the blue fairy. Again, the blue fairy reprimands Pinocchio for his mischievous deeds and tells him that good boys are obedient and go to school and listen to their parents. Pinocchio promises to go to school, but he keeps making rascal friends. Alidoro is the name of a mastiff, not German Shepherd, as he is in the game, who is sent after Pinocchio after it is believed that he beat up one of his schoolmates, Eugenie. Pinocchio saves the dog from drowning when it jumps after him into the sea. Romeo, or Lampwick, is a schoolmate of Pinocchio's and convinces him to abandon school and go to the land of boobies. Yes, that is the actual name in the English translation. Funnily enough, it's a land where there are only boys. <laughs> this is a land where they never have to go to school and can always play. However, this turns them into donkeys. Eventually, after some more shenanigans, Pinocchio does find his father, but Geppetto falls gravely ill. Pinocchio takes out many jobs and errands to pay for everything. When he learns that the blue fairy is still alive, but in the hospital, very sick, he also starts paying for her treatment. When Pinocchio devotes himself to selflessly take care of his parent figures, he finally becomes a real boy. The blue fairy says, Boys who behave badly and when turning over a new leaf and become good, have the power of bringing content and happiness to their families. One of the main and most obvious parallels is that Geppetto is largely absent, though he does seek Pinocchio throughout the novel. He tries to teach Pinocchio how to behave, at least at the start, but Pinocchio ends up not listening to him. It is instead the fairy that teaches Pinocchio patience and manners. Whenever the puppet fails to live up to expectations, he comes crawling back to the fairy, who forgives him and asks him to be proper. It is through this patient, good-willed parenting that Pinocchio slowly grows, making mistakes and admitting the truth of his mama's words. But while the fairy sets up tests for Pinocchio, it is eventually his care for his father and the charity to the fairy, the love of a son, that turns him into a boy. It does seem like the book was generally used for the setting and characters. While most is superficial similarities, there are a few major ones that are also reflected in the game. One of these is the important parent figures that are made up by Geppetto and the Blue Fairy, or Sophia, in the game. However, everything else is subverted from there. Sophia remains the main guidance giver that Pinocchio actually listens to, but Geppetto, while he was a bit sus and a little abusive in the novel, at least physically, becomes a right proper bastard in the game. Also, the moral of the book is turned upside down. Pinocchio, to become a real boy in the book, must be obedient, must dutifully study and listen to his parents. While there are some darker aspects to the book, it does seem like it was generally meant to normalize a certain behavior among children. In the game, however, we see the opposite moral. The game doesn't teach us obedience, it teaches us to break free from obedience. The game sets very different values for being human, mainly freedom and compassion out of free will, not duty. It is the emphasis on free will that is most important, furthermore the book is about growth. Pinocchio being a puppet and then turning into a real boy is meant to isolate kids who are unruly. Only once they behave can they become proper humans. Lies of P, meanwhile, is on the surface level, a similar transition from a puppet to a human. However, the main story is not about learning what humanity is like most people think. But I'm getting ahead of myself here. For now, I will conclude this section. I recommend reading the original book, it was quite funny at times and a relatively short read. I will now move on to recounting the complete timeline of the world of Lies of P prior to the start of the game, at least how I see it. 
The stories in From Software games are infamously elusive, often very abstract, and the director, Hidetaka Miyazaki, has left out details on purpose so that a coherent narrative is never fully possible, making us imagine and draw our own conclusions. Even Sekiro, the biggest outlier, has some of these characteristics. Lies of P is quite similar, though definitely much easier to put together than other Souls-likes. The main story is very straightforward, but there is plenty to explore and discover if you take a closer look under the hood. You might think, oh, the game's story is fairly straightforward, what could there be to discuss? But you have no idea. As is par for the course for these games, the lore can be quite convoluted, so buckle up. The earliest date we can point to is the ground collapse 600 years ago in the west of Krat. Among the casualties, unknown minerals were found in the ravine that opened up, but the ruins weren't given much thought at the time. This became known as the Devil's Pit, and would be subject to much superstition, but would eventually become the relic of Trismegistus when the alchemists find it. The Order of Crowd report states that the cluster structure is inorganic, having sunken its roots into Krat. That seems to suggest that Ergo is not native to Earth. Youtuber Kite Tales suggests that Ergo could have been part of a meteorite that came to Earth along with the angel that fell from the sky. The name Trismegistus actually refers to Hermes Trismegistus, but not the Greek god Hermes himself. Hermes Trismegistus is a combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth, patron of medicine, magic, alchemy, and astronomy. It could be that this connection to astronomy hints at the fact that Ergo appeared alongside the angel. If this is true, it could also mean that we have a name for the angel, Trismegistus. Hermes Trismegistus is the creator of writing and patron of all knowledge, so it makes sense why he would be associated with the alchemists in their pursuit of absolute truth. One of the most important parts of hermetic teaching is that individual humans are not quite so different from the divine supreme. This acknowledgement results in a second birth, called a gnosis. We see similar themes of humans ascending to godhood through divine wisdom in, of all things, Genjin Impact. Gnosis, or knowledge, is not empirical, but divine in nature. In Lines of P, the immortality that the angel shares among humans might not be literal immortality, and that one cannot die or age, but a more metaphorical immortality, through which an individual ascends to something like godhood. I'm afraid that my knowledge of mythology stops here, however. The connection between the game and the real-life Hermes Trismegistus is interesting, and I recommend checking out the YouTube video by Eternalized on the topic, link in the description below. If somebody has any other interesting connections to make between the real-life Hermes Trismegistus and the angel in Lies of P, I recommend leaving a comment in the comment section below. This would mean Ergo is not native to Earth, at least not the Earth of Lies of P. The alchemists tell of a story where the wishes of humans piqued the interest of a godlike being that descended from the sky, much like an angel. This being would live amongst humans, out of curiosity, but its power was evident. The angel would give out blessings of immortality, and growing to love humans, the angel shared it amongst them. The in-game book, So Said Pistris Part 2, describes the angel as being of the undying substance, the breath of metal that lives forever. Crowd is theorized in-game to be some mineral life that consumes Ergo, with abnormal growth. It could be that the angel and the relic are connected. But this immortality was not meant for everyone, and a lot of people died. What had before been a great hope for humankind was turned into rage, and the humans tore the angel apart. All that was left was its left arm, the hand of God. Mortality would elude humanity as a whole, but a chosen few would walk this earth undying. At some time in the distant past, a man named Frangelica would also be blessed by the visit of a one-winged angel. I believe that these two events are connected. It's not a big stretch, both beings are referred to as angels, and a special emphasis is put on their limbs. What's more conclusive is the arm of God. Now, it is the left arm. When Andreas turns, his right arm turns into a wing. I don't know how much of this reflects the actual appearance of the angel that the alchemists worshipped, or even the one that Saint Frangelico saw. What is more important is what happens with Simon Manus. When Simon taps into the power of the arm of God to summon the angel from the past, we see a mass of right hands appear, and from them a singular left hand, such as Simon's new left hand, recreating the painting, The Creation of Adam. Since the Christian imagery is already plenty present in Lines of P, I think we can conclude that this logistical issue with the left arm is more of a question of symbolism. 
The YouTuber, the Inhuman One, explains in his video about the arm of God how some world religions, including Christianity, see the left arm as signifying evil. And in our case, when taking into consideration the creation of Adam, it specifically signifies humans, the sinners who were cursed with mortality after rebelling against their creator God. From this, he concludes that the angel that the alchemists worshipped was not in fact an actual god, but a human, thus the left arm. That means that instead of humans meeting a god that walked among humans in the disguise of a human, was actually just a human with supernatural powers. I find that further proof of this theory is supported by the post credit scene when the woman talking with Paracelsus mentions that we need to get his arm back, most likely referring to the arm of God in a remarkably personal matter. The note from Gianjo is also titled Letter of the Eternal, and the organization he is a part of seems to concern itself with individuals who possess eternal life. Could the angel have been one of these internals, an immortal but a human nonetheless? Meanwhile, Kite Tales considers that the angel was indeed a celestial being outside of this world, and that the first humans to meet it were the Eternals, who would later either found or become associated with the alchemists. Regardless, the arm of God and the one-winged angel that Frangelico saw have too many similarities to be a coincidence or unrelated. They could still be unrelated, but I'm betting on them being connected somehow, if not outright the same entity. This also might suggest that Frangelico, who became known as a living saint, could be one of those Eternals or Immortals. We know nothing else about his identity, so there is no use speculating on this part further, but it is an interesting point to consider. Next we have the gold coin tree, which was created by the alchemists. Sophia mentions that it was created from listeners, the tears of those listeners manifesting as the gold coin fruit. With Gianjo possibly being immortal himself, or at least eternal, whatever that means, and with his deep interest and knowledge of the gold coin tree, it could be that he might have created the one we find at the hotel, though this is speculation on my part. As the tree has the soul of a listener, the fact that Gianjo is burnt when he tries to pluck its fruit might also support this theory. His mentions of being interested in growing trees might also be a dark allusion to his past deeds. However, what remains ambiguous is who were their listeners exactly? Sophia explains that she can hear Ergo and manipulate it, calling herself thus a listener. She says that her mother before her was also a listener, which means this power could be maternally inherited, but we don't have enough evidence for such a conclusion. As far as we know though, the listeners do all seem to be female. However, what we do know is that Ergo, at least publicly, was only discovered a few decades ago. Meanwhile, the gold coin tree in the hotel has been there for at least a few centuries, dating back to the medieval times. Is listening to Ergo only a part of the abilities of a listener? Did the listeners and thus the alchemists know about Ergo centuries ago? Or were listeners just an entirely different thing back then and went by a different name? I am not sure, but the points I talk about later might suggest that the alchemists have been experimenting with Ergo for longer than we know, at least longer than the last 30 years. I say 30 years because that is more or less the timeline from which Krat went from a little oceanside town to the big bustling city we know today. This tree was found on top of a rocky mountain by a king's knight, Guillaume, as the healing power of the fruit became known able to cure any disease or plague. Renini's guide explains it thusly. According to lore, Hotel Krat is an isolated castle built by an aristocrat devoted to a form of occultism after receiving a revelation from a radiant tree. However, the knight eventually went mad because of his obsession. The cursed knight's halberd reads, The discovery of the gold coin tree made the knight of the isolated castle grow vain. The knight sought greater wealth and glory than the king, and ultimately fell to ruin. However, no records remain as they were all destroyed in a large fire. Vanini's Landmark Guide Part 1 continues. Above all, being so far underground just compounds the rumors. Some even said that it is connected to an unknown hell. Sometime later, an asylum was built out of the castle that we know today as Hotel Krat. It seems that this asylum might have been connected to the relic of Trismegistus somehow. As it was called the Devil's Pit before and held an unknown mystery, it was likely these rumors of hallucinations within the asylum and unknown hells, however true, might have been connected to it. 
Alas, it seems that the institution suffered a great fire before being purchased and renovated by Antonia. More recently, around the time of the Grand Exhibition, talk of ghosts spread among the guests, which the proprietors dismissed. The YouTuber Kitetail suggests that these ghosts were, in fact, the alchemists who were using the secret passageway in the hotel to travel to and from their island. After all, Antonia does admit that she used to work together with them. While this interpretation is likely, it does still offer a few problems. Was this the only way for the alchemists to get in and out of Krat? Considering Antonia cut ties with them and had been sitting literally in front of the portrait for some time, it leaves some doubt in me. Of course, despite Antonia knowing about the gold coin tree, she was completely unaware that the Black Rabbit Brotherhood was stealing from it, so it does seem that she does not always have a good overview of what's happening in her hotel. What's more, the possibility of the alchemists conducting experiments in the insane asylum is an interesting take. But this would mean that the alchemists have been in Krat much, much longer than the more obvious evidence would have us believe. Namely that they came here and settled around 30 years ago. Of course, the first finding of Ergo and the relic of Trismegistus could have been a ploy. The alchemists were in Krat long before Krat was aware of it. After all, the gold coin fruit could only have been born from the hands of an alchemist. And if Saint Frangelica was an alchemist, or eternal, or whatever as well, that would give us two concrete examples of alchemist influence being in Krat long, long ago. But then why publicize the discovery of Argo at all, if this is the case? Was it to spread the petrification disease in Krat, as well as putting the Ergo in a massive amount of puppets? The latter does not produce more Ergo, but the former might. Still, it can't be better than literally just mining the Ergo from the Relic of Trismegistus, so that logic seems a little flimsy. At least I can't say with certainty that that was the plan of the alchemists. At least insofar as publicizing their arrival 30 years ago and the mass use of Ergo, especially for puppets. In conclusion though, I do think we have enough evidence to say that the alchemists had some presence in Krat before the modern age, but perhaps it was just with the appearance of Valentinus that their operation grew as large as it has. At some point the alchemists found the arm of God and began to use it for experiments. It could be that if the Eternals were the original immortals, then they could have given the arm of God to the alchemists, either directly or indirectly. It would make sense why Paracelsus speaks of the Krat experiment. It seems the Eternals were wishing to see what the alchemists would do with the arm. Next we jump quite far ahead in the timeline, to the events a few decades before the game. And this seems a somewhat contested point in the fandom, but we have two documents that name the exact time during which the alchemists made themselves known in Krat and settled down. The workshop primer states that no other city in the world today has been receiving more attention than Krat, the city of puppets. Back when the almighty V visited, it was still just a fishing village. It has undergone a brilliant change in the past 30 years, spurred by Krat's puppet industry. The puppets made in Krat's workshop are known for using new technology that is on a different level from their competitors. And in his diary, the Archbishop Andreas states that the alchemists should have been turned away all those 30 years ago. Though it's understandable why some would have doubts about this, we need to consider that the Krat we see today was built in those 30 years. Before it was just Moonlight Town, the Cathedral and maybe the Malum District. It is hard to believe that most of Krat, from the station to the Grand Exhibition, City Hall, Benini Works and so on were only built in 30 years. But I guess that goes to show how much capital and power the alchemists really had. In three short decades they managed to raise a city out of nothing. No wonder they are so highly regarded and no wonder why they control everything. Their leader's statue is the first thing you see when you leave the station. Their mark is on the bridge leading to City Hall and it's even supposed to be on the City Hall building somewhere. And they even put funds into the most important landmark of Krat, the cathedral. They own Krat and everything in it. Without them there would be no puppets. And even if somehow Krat still had puppets, it wouldn't have been enough to erect an entire city in 30 years without the help of the alchemists. The workshop primer in general might be my favorite collectible in the entire game, as it explains almost everything about the lore, especially the key details of the how, why, when and who. Let's analyze it a bit more. The Almighty V could be one of two people. The first one that might come to your mind would be Venini. He owns the workshop mass producing the puppets, and a news article literally calls him V, after all. However, he is himself about 30 years old. 
so it can't be him. What about his parents? After all, the Veninis were, by Arlecchino's admission, the ones who first engineered the automated puppets. However, Venini is an Italian name, and the game does seem to suggest that Krat is somewhere in, if not around, Italy. So it would make more sense that the Veninis are native to the area rather than immigrants. But even with that conjecture aside, it would make no sense to bring up the Veninis here. This is a workshop primer made for those engineers working in Krat's workshop, mostly with puppets, as it later talks about Geppetto specifically. The primer's main topic is how Krat's puppets are special, of course referring to the use of Ergo. Therefore, it would be most logical to assume that the V they are talking about is Valentinus, the alchemist who could tap into the powers of Ergo which allowed Krat to flourish. Admittedly, the term automated puppets remains dubious in its meaning, and I would like to talk about the origin of the puppets in general. We have at least three, maybe four known stages of puppetry in Krat. The first was the primitive puppets, without any Ergo. This interest in puppets seems to be rather widespread, as we have confirmation that, quote, the puppets made in Krat's workshops are known for using new technology that is on a different level from their competitors. So clearly there had to be competitors to the puppets made in Krat's workshop. This seems to be a point that the majority of people miss when talking about puppets. Heavy emphasis is put on Geppetto and his skills, not to mention that the loading screens say that Geppetto is responsible for all puppet technology in Krat though his dialogue states otherwise. Furthermore, puppets were a big craze in the real-life Belle Epoque. It's not a far stretch to assume that people other than Geppetto were interested in puppet technology. Also as a side note, I am trying to also use the data from the Korean version of the game's files which have been translated. You can find these on the Lies of P Discord, I recommend checking it out. Big thanks goes out to user key for key who helps translate a lot of the original Korean text into English and has helped in clarifying points like what angel means in the original texts and helping to draw many important plot-related conclusions. You can also find them on Tumblr where they post a lot of their amazing artwork. Really check them out. In any case, we have the first primitive puppets. No ergo, no grand covenant, no nothing. Very rudimentary. The second type is the origin point of the game's setting, the Ergo Puppets. Once again, to quote the primer, the workshop puppets are intricate, like humans, and they perform their master's orders so naturally that people wonder if they have souls. Many competitors try to replicate the workshop's special mechanical hearts, only to fail and prove the outstanding gap between their capabilities. The monopoly on the special power stone Ergo and the skills to optimize its efficiency, those are what give Krat's workshop its edge. These appear after the alchemists settle down, roughly 30 years ago. The alchemists are somehow able to intuitively understand the properties of Ergo. How, we do not know. This could lead credence to the theory that the alchemists were here long before, conducting experiments with Ergo in the insane asylum. Well, in any case, Valentinus can tap into Ergo's power. There is further evidence that Valentinus was crucial in this development for puppets. The tale of three brothers reads, Thus there lived in Krat a technician who made the friendly three puppet brothers, an alchemist who breathed life into puppets, and a stalker who rectified puppets gone wrong. The three puppets built the craftsman's workshop tower and made phenomenal puppets. Now this could just be a fairy tale, however all tales come from some crucial truth. The local technician is obviously Geppetto, native to Krat. We have the alchemist who breathed life into puppets, Valentinus, and a certain stalker who rectified puppets gone wrong. This is likely the legendary stalker, though she has been turned into a brother, perhaps for misogynistic or derivative reasons. I guess three brothers sounds better than three siblings. In any case, I think we can safely assume who this stalker was. These three brothers or siblings also have weird overlap with the Trinity Sanctums, but I believe that Repetition 3 could be accidental. At least I can't state confidently that the Trinity refers to the three siblings here. But who knows, maybe I'm right on the money. I don't have any more evidence to prove or to overthrow this point. If nothing else, we do find the workshop logo on the safes that we can find within the Trinity Sanctums. And the books in the Trinity Sanctums also seem to reflect a lot of the writings that the alchemists have. This would conclude the second wave of puppets. The third comes with Lorenzini Venini's arrival on the scene. Few citizens of Krat do not know who V is. The crown prince of high society, 
the man who came up with the grand covenant of the automated puppets and built the best manufacturing company at the age of 18. At the age of 18, Vanini puts into effect the grand covenant that Geppetto worked out. Here we also have something of a clarification on an earlier point. The grand covenant of the automated puppets. So the automated part must be talking about either of the previous iterations of puppets. Arlecchino also mentions how the Veninis made the very first automated puppets. So it could be that Lorenzini's parents made the first primitive versions of puppets, and Geppetto helped create the second iteration, which used Ergo. Finally, Lorenzini mass-produced the third iteration of puppets, who were bound to the Grand Covenant. The possible fourth and final category is the P-Organ puppets. We have two confirmed cases where we know for certain that P organs were used. Our character, Pinocchio, and the Nameless Puppet. We know that these have to be special cases, as the Nameless Puppet was created to house Carlos' soul. Carlos' soul could only be an object after the petrification disease outbreaks, which happened after the alchemists came to Krat and discovered Ergo. We also can see that in the normal puppets, while they do have some sort of heart mechanism, it's not the P organ we know. However, there are some inconsistencies with this. Firstly, what the fuck are these things? Are these the hearts that the Workshop Primer alludes to? Most puppets have them. Romeo notably doesn't. Does he also have a P organ? I have no clue. Exhibit B. The Saint is a fucking Mercy statue. What is she doing with a P organ? I can't- So, yeah. Like, for many things in the game, I don't have a concrete answer. But it does seem that the P-Organ puppets are different from others in their capability for growth. So, now that I've cleared up a lot of the confusion when it comes to the lore and began a lot more confusion, let's move on to more ambiguous events that take place in the 30 years between the Alchemists coming and the modern day. After Valentinus and the Alchemists settle down in Krat proper, they start funding a lot of projects. The aforementioned Cathedral, the Alchemist Bridge, the City Hall, blah blah blah. One particular is the acquisition and renovation of the Rose Estate, now the Monad Charity House. One curious thought though, were the Monads already here, or did Valentinus marry into the family? Benini's Landmark Guide Part 2 states, The most widely known attraction is Rosa Isabel Street. It's named after the cultural sponsor, Lady Isabel Monad. But if you think about how the ladies married to the leader of the alchemists, Valentinus, you'll think twice about who really is in control of Krat. The union of Krat's old families and the organization of alchemists is shown in symbolic form. Given that the sacred Ouroboros mark is engraved on City Hall as well, it's obvious who owns the city of Krat. Apparently Lady Isabel was a big name on her own, not just tied to her husband's achievements. Was her family already here before Valentinus came? The guide also mentions the union of Krat's old families and the alchemists, seemingly suggesting that Valentinus only married into the Monad family, instead of himself being a Monad. In any case, formerly an orphanage for slum kids, the Rose Estate gets turned into the most prestigious boarding school in all of Krat, giving alchemist, stalker, and workshop technician education to children. We can also note that by this point, the stalkers as an organization has been founded. There are two main camps, outside of the independent contractors. The Bastards, former members of the elite families who now protect the alchemists and the workshop, and the Sweepers, street thugs and mercenaries who the old families pay to do their bidding. It's uncertain when exactly these occupations started being mainstream, likely with the appearance of the alchemists, which would make the organization itself too about 30 years old, give or take. Still, they are incredibly well known and even popular, seen almost as Krat's local heroes. The news mentions them and the fad of wearing animal masks, and people like Eugenie and Hugo looking up to them also shows us a glimpse of how stalkers used to be seen. We know that they wear animal masks used to be worn in ancient Krat when fighting the legendary rock giants. Whatever, let's move on. Anyway, it seems to signify your soul animal too, but I think that's more of a marketing trick, if anything. We also know very little about the old families. We know they are rich and influential, but they are at odds with the alchemists and the workshop, who are new powers in Krat, undermining the power of the old families. We know of at least one family, Wolf, the family to which the red fox Claudia belongs to. Who were the other ones? Ceresani? Geppetto? Vanini? Any of these would make sense in some way, but we don't really have a concrete answer to this either. This once again brings us back to the Trinity Sanctums. 
One of the Trinity keys we obtain from Arlecchino reads, This key probably unlocks something. The Sacred Triangle was some organization's secret mark. Rumor has it that this organization was Krat's true master. So, Arlecchino, a former servant of an alchemist, has access to the Trinity Sanctums. At least he has the keys and gives them out at his own convenience. These sanctums seem to be some sort of important safe house for a secret organization running Krat. We also find workshop safes here. Who do these Trinity Sanctums belong to? The old families? The monads? Manini seems to suggest that there are secret powers behind the scenes controlling Krat. Considering how they swept his parents' death under the rug, I'm inclined to agree. However, the location of these sanctums should also be noted. We can find one in Vanini's workshop, another one in the cathedral, one in the opera house, one in Krat Central Station, and finally one in the Arch Abbey of the Alchemists. In one of these sanctums we find an outfit belonging to the bastards, and in another we found an outfit belonging to the workshop. We also find a sweeper stalker's clothing set. So there is no conclusive evidence in the items that we find. The only vague hint that we get are in these nonsense scriptures on the books, and only two of them make sense to me. Trust and truth are one. The end of the path of stars will lead to great eternal life. And remember the metal angel. We are simply on a journey that follows his footsteps. The alchemists worshipped stars, and we know they value the truth as well. And the eternal part likely refers to the Eternals, who seem to be tied to the alchemists in some way or other. So do these sanctums belong to the Eternals? Why does Arlecchino have the keys then? And the Metal Angel. Could this be referring to the godlike angel to whom the arm of God belonged to? The angel part seems to fit, but the word metal appears for the first time. Still, as the angel was described of being of an unnatural substance, the word metal could be used to hint at that. Unfortunately, I do think that this will likely remain a mystery, forever. Unless the DLC answers these specific questions. But seeing as we killed Arlecchino at the end of the game, or at least had the option to, we are unlikely to see these places ever again. Right, coming shortly back to the correspondence between the old families through Wolf and Valentinus, talking about the Solator Laboratory. God knows what this means or what the laboratory itself is, but the entire tone of the letter is incredibly dubious, so I don't know if Simon was truly a worse choice than Valentinus, despite being Sophia's dad and all. Remember, Valentinus was married to a listener. Alchemists make trees out of listeners. It's no wonder Sophia's mother hated being one. Moving on to a different topic, around this time, Carlo Geppetto, son of Giuseppe Geppetto, is enrolled into the Monad Charity House and takes on a stalker education. His father, a renowned puppet technician, is too busy to focus on his son, and as such the boy grows to resent his father. Carlo eventually grows to the age of a late adolescent. He also graduates from the charity house in some form, but his father remains absent, and instead Carlo gives his graduation necklace to his best friend Romeo, who also lived or studied at the charity house. Right around this time, the petrification disease hits the Rose Estate. By this time, it's already a known threat, but an outbreak this large was unprecedented. There are no survivors. Among the killed are Valentinus Monad himself, and likely candidates for infection or death are Carlo and Romeo. Sophia also goes missing around this time. Romeo might have survived for some time, as he makes a wish with the devil to save more people. Could this have been Geppetto? Romeo's ergo says that the boy awoke to a throne he had not asked for, and started to look for the friend from his memories. What exactly happened to Romeo we do not know, but we can infer that Geppetto definitely had something to do with it. A loading screen says that in the early days of the petrification disease, it was seen as a unique disease that only manifested in some social classes, much like black lung. However, the source was unknown. Another loading screen mentions that it broke out first among the alchemists, which left them squabbling. However, we don't know how much we can believe the loading screens. One specific one says, Gianjo ran away from the alchemists after getting fed up with their delusions. He has chased the legendary gold coin fruit to heal his incomplete body. We know Gianjo is in fact Paracelsus, an internal, but it could very well be that he did have a disagreement with the alchemists. Still, this point feels a bit misleading, since we know Gianjo is a false identity, but it never rules out that some of the facts about Gianjo could also be true for Paracelsus. 
The petrification disease is born from overexposure to ergo, but then why the charity house, one of the most prestigious schools in Krat? Possibly because it started out as a slum orphanage, which would mean that it was likely somewhere in the Malam district. It would make sense then why people would think it was a poor people's disease. It's uncertain if the alchemists were already infighting before Valentinus' death. A loading screen does imply that Simon Manus' followers were rather obnoxious, perhaps even not popular. In any case, Valentinus' right-hand man, Simon, rises to become leader after Valentinus dies. It's likely at this time that Geppetto and Antonia stop cooperating with the alchemists. Geppetto realizes that the alchemists are using the disease for their own dubious ends, and Antonia says that until the disease, she had cooperated with them. It's likely that after the outbreak and Manus' ascension, that she too removed herself from their circle, also locking up the gold coin tree. Around this time, Eugenie's brother Alidoro defects from the alchemists, and helps Medora create an op-ed on the alchemists and their secret goals, which gets censored to hell and back. It is probably after all of this that the alchemists' experiments with Ergo ramp up. They have figured out that the Arm of God requires a lot of Ergo, so they have decided to spread the petrification disease throughout Krat. Through Ergo, we are connected, so those who die and become Ergo will still be part of the new world that Simon envisions. Those who survive will become enlightened beings. So the Rosa State is hit with the disease, Valentinus dies, and Manus rises to power. However, the big question is when exactly does this happen? Well, the way I see it, for all of this to have happened, Lorenzini must have already been 18 or older. Let me explain. Arlecchino had been an ergo puppet whose ego awakened and who tortured his alchemist master, going on to wreak havoc in Krat. If the alchemists arrived around 30 years ago, and Venini is around 30 himself, this will give us a rough overview of what could have happened. We can divide the last 30 years in half, the first 15 years and the last 15 years. Of course, I doubt that everything happened exactly 30 years ago, the more likely answer is something like 31 or so years. But these are the solid dates that the game gives us. 18 years after his birth, Benini sets up his factory. Even if he is himself in his mid-30s, this would still put this event in the middle of our 30-year timeline. Camille and the discovery of Ergo happened before the implementation of the Grand Covenant. By interrogating and taking Camille apart, the Order had opened the door to a new possibility. Later, means of control such as the Grand Covenant emerged, but it was a small problem compared to this discovery. Placing a date and time on these events is hard, especially as the window of time gets smaller and smaller. However, there is one very important piece of evidence that has saved this timeline project of mine, and that is the Mona Charity House Concert Flyer. All of you are invited to the concert being held at the Monad Charity House. We pray for the successful opening of the exhibition. Children sponsored by the Monad Charity House have a message of love and hope for all of you. Don't miss this chance to listen to the most innocent performance in all of Krat. I doubt that the exhibition refers to the Grand Exhibition. It could, but I highly doubt it. However, there are two pieces of information that very clearly place the Rosa State disaster after the implementation of the Grand Covenant. And that is the second part of this letter. The date and time are left vague, but the place is Lorenzini Arcade Central Plaza, sponsored by Lady Isabel and Sophia M. Lorenzini, as in THE Lorenzini Venini. For this arcade to have existed, Venini would have had to be the High Prince of Society by this point, even having the arcade named after him. And we know this event takes place before the Rosa State disaster because Sophia is present. Sophia only went missing after her father died and Manus imprisoned her. So, the timeline should look something like this. Roughly 30 years ago, after the alchemists settled down, Arlecchino escapes and kills Venini's parents. About 18 years after the alchemists settle down, Venini establishes his factory and imprints the Grand Covenant on every puppet. He becomes the High Prince of Society and gets the arcade named after him. After this, the Rose Estate gets hit by the petrification disease and Carlo dies. So Carlo's death must have happened in the last 15 years, give or take. After this, Geppetto, armed with the knowledge that puppets can awaken to egos, is inspired by the story his son so loved, and creates the nameless puppet, the first puppet with a P organ, placing Carlo's ergo within it. 
However, this puppet turns out to be volatile, so he scraps this project and makes Pinocchio. The puppet doesn't awaken, however, and the petrification disease and puppet frenzy have left Krat in shambles. People hoped that the police would take care of this, but they forgot that they replaced their police force with puppets. The carnival, opera, butler, dog, fireman puppets? All hostile. Every facet of Krat turned against its gods, and the factory that was making said puppets? Well, we know what happened to that. The factory manager's report note to Vanini states that the ergo the alchemists had been supplying has been of lesser quality sometime before the frenzy, and that they are likely using a different method to experiment on ergo. We know this method of experimentation to be tied to the arm of god, which means they are burning through ergo quite rapidly, thus the lower quality. The factory manager Nikola, perhaps a reference to Nikola Tesla, also suggests that they could be draining the puppets in the barren swamp for Ergo, which explains why their influence reached even there. It seems that Vanini had his doubts about the alchemists before the disaster even started. These experiments with Ergo also give credence to the theory that the Arm of God and the Relic of Trismegistus, where Ergo is from, are somehow connected. After all, it would not make sense for Ergo to react so potently to the Arm. So, again, to reiterate. Sometime in the last 15 years, Carlo dies. By this point, the alchemists are already in full swing with their experiments. Geppetto, meanwhile, creates the nameless puppet and then P. It could be that he hoped P would naturally awaken to Carlo's ego. However, we know that Geppetto knows about the Arm of God, even having it in his possession at some point. But why would he start the puppet frenzy? Well... Maybe Vanini shared his suspicions of the alchemists with Geppetto. They were, after all, colleagues and good friends. Geppetto must have known already what the alchemists were planning. Maybe, to expedite the process of collecting Ergo, Geppetto started the puppet frenzy and stole the Arm of God with Archbishop Andreas's help. The alchemists took the opportunity to go wild. The city of Krat, suffering both the disease and frenzy, became a playing ground for the alchemists. They started gathering ergo on a mass scale, but could not go through with their plans until they had the arm of God. Lucky for Geppetto, Sophia wakes up P. Geppetto gets, or lets himself get, captured by the alchemists. Everything is then in one place. The ergo that has been collected, the ergo and Carlos' soul within P, and the arm of God. And P has no choice but to go to the island and save his father and stop the alchemists. Which brings us roughly to the present day. And when is that exactly? Well, for the longest time I believed it was 1889. The grand exhibition sign at the train station implies as much. But upon further thought, this doesn't make much sense. The sign is thoroughly withered. The bodies are old and... kind of decaying? And you definitely shouldn't make conclusions about bodies in Souls-like games. But everything seems old, somehow abandoned. Fortunately for my sanity, there is once again one document that answers all of my worries. Descartes' note is dated 1890X. Descartes is a technician in Venini's factory, having turned one of Venini's ergo storage batteries into the Hammer Mjolnir. The grand exhibition was supposed to take place in 1889. However, it was delayed due to the outbreak of the frenzy, which started in Rosa Isabel Street. That was the origin point, probably the center of high society, and thus also the greatest concentration of puppets. At first, officials, the workshop, and the Venini company tried to get things under control, but obviously that did not happen. I believe that the grand exhibition would have had to take place in the latter half of the year 1889, since there is no way it took 12 months for the disaster to reach outside Rosa Isabel Street. Descartes' note only says 1890x, but I personally believe this is 1890. By this point, Venini Works has fallen into puppet hands, with Fuoco creating more puppets for the puppet army. However, the existence of the King of Puppets is not yet well known. Only a little later does this information come out. However, by then it's too late. Gemini also says that Elysian Boulevard used to be a regular rich people row before the puppet frenzy, which was a long time ago. Thus, I posit, that the current year, when P wakes up and in which the game starts, is at least 1890, if perhaps 1891. But no later. There are a few reasons for this. 
First, a loading screen says that CROD closed itself off to stop the puppet technology from being leaked. But when the petrification disease started spreading, it was these restrictions that kept the citizens locked up. Now the whole city is under lockdown, with only two soldiers from outside getting in, Bell and Atkinson. Crut is the center of puppet technology, but nobody cares if it drops off the grid completely for like three years? Which is a long ass time? Two years is already kind of stretching it in my opinion, and no word about the Grand Exhibition either, which was supposed to bring Crut's puppet technology all around the world. Doubtful. Also, how long do you think Venini has been squatting in his factory then? Three years? All alone with Pulcinella? And again, do you believe that Simon has been sitting on top of his fucking tower for three years, just waiting for somebody to defeat the Parade Master Fuoco and Archbishop Andreas? Yeah, right. The way I see it, events went something like this. In 1889, the exhibition was supposed to take place, but was delayed by the first skirmishes on Rosa Isabel Street. A few months later, we are in 1890, and the frenzy has spread all across Krat. Vanini Works has been taken over, Descartes being one of the few survivors left to chronicle Fuoco's ideological heel turn from capitalism to monarchy. A little later, Vanini sets off for his factory by himself, trying to contact some stalkers, but finding the organization disbanded and help unavailable. Archbishop Andreas has also started taking in refugees, mostly people escaping from the petrification disease, but also likely the puppets since it was only a matter of time before they made it to Moonlight Town. However, also likely in 1890, the alchemists take a trip to the cathedral, maybe a month or so before we awaken, and turn everyone into carcasses. Geppetto thus loses contact with Andreas, and sets out to help Benini by shooting down the puppets at City Hall. Then, Sofia finally finds us in the train car, and we assume control of Pinocchio. Everything then falls perfectly into place, especially for Geppetto. How ironic then that when he does get a second chance at being a father, his son rebels. Even in the bad ending, Geppetto just ends up abandoning Carlo. Actually, there is a lot of irony in the game. Indeed, the whole overarching thing seems to be the hell we created for ourselves. The survivor abandoned his brother Leo, falling into suicidal despair. The mad donkey, with his singular focus on the truth, forces us to kill him and save Geppetto. The fox and the cat, untrustworthy, manipulative traitors, have estranged themselves from the player so that when the time comes when they genuinely need your help, you are less inclined to do so. Andreas wishes to become an angel, resulting in the deaths of all whom he tried to protect. Romeo, wanting to save Crod and its citizens, ends up being misbranded as a murderous puppet, who has gone off the deep end. Benini, who puts in place the Grand Covenant to stop any more tragedies from happening, hands Geppetto the key to starting the puppet frenzy and killing hundreds if not thousands. The irony of Lies of P is found in the lies we tell ourselves to feel better. It is about the lies we tell others for our benefit. It is the delusions that we so desperately cling to, so desperately wanting to escape reality, the truth that, play God as we might, we have no control over our own fates. The story analysis is slowly starting to wind down, but I would like to take a moment to talk about character stories in general. They are quite short, and also quite simple. What you see on the surface is pretty much what you get. Only a few of the core characters have overarching storylines. If you are used to watching Vadi's Prepared to Cry videos about all the fucked up ways in which characters suffer in these Souls-like games, you will be somewhat disappointed. Now, however, that does not mean that the character stories do not serve a purpose in Lies of P, or that they are uninteresting or boring or useless. Quite the contrary, in fact. To illustrate my point, I will be looking at Sekiro's characters and side quests, as its story structure is the most similar to Lies of Peace. It also has fewer side stories, and those it does have are also quite short compared to its From Soft siblings. So what are the stories of Sekiro? Sekiro continues the tradition of making everyone alive miserable as fuck. This is apt, after all, Sekiro's storyline is of ambition, seeking power beyond one's means and corrupting everything around you the consequences of seeking this power so dogmatically. Most importantly, it is about the tragedy of war. The character stories we find in Sekiro are such. A wounded and dying man trying his best to take care of his demented blind mother in the midst of tragedy and death. A war profiteer seeking to make ends meet and survive in this unforgiving landscape. A grieving father wishing to turn over a new leaf unsuccessfully as his dark past catches up with him. 
a genius physician whose ambitions become his own undoing. An old shinobi counting his days before he eventually, certainly, turns into a monster. War has destroyed the lives of these people, left them scarred and broken, waiting for the end fate has in store for them. Often their end will be of their own doing, too caught up in their own schemes to see the oncoming tragedy flying straight at them with unyielding speed. Almost every single one of these stories ends in death, in lessons unlearned and disdainful, tragic memories. Every single one of these characters is a reminder of the horrors that war and ambition bring. Every single one a mere drop of blood in an ocean, forgotten completely by history. In Lines of P, we also see people suffering from man-made horrors. While we do not quite know it yet at the start of the game, the puppet frenzy and petrification disease are entirely the fault of humans and their selfish ambitions. By the end of the story, Kraut will have changed forever. The scars of betrayal will run deep into its core. But while this is all true, it's not the focus of the game. Compared to Sekiro, the stories in Lies of P are rather unremarkable. Mundane, in fact. They are snapshots of life. A journey with Pinocchio is in learning about humans and how to be human. We are given a window into the lives of humans to try and understand them. The stories in Krat are just as tragic as the stories found in Ashina. But while Sekiro shows us tragedy, Lies of P shows us humanity. Kindness, empathy, compassion. We can reunite a woman with her child as she succumbs to a disease that has isolated her from her family and taken her sight. We can remind a child of fond memories, playing with his friends in the company of the hero he once looked up to. We can give closure to a grieving husband, who was ridiculed by those around him, acknowledging that his love was real. We can give an old, sickly woman a short, delightful moment to revel in the pleasures of days long gone. We can help a puppet learn to love, and we can give a dying woman a few merciful moments of bliss before she passes. We can give a murderous monster an opportunity, a chance to stay as herself even as she faces death's door. We can, as a puppet learning about humans, forward the knowledge we gather and teach someone else the value of empathy, of grief, anger, and kindness. We can, even after being conned and tricked, help out two siblings so used to betrayal and self-interest that they know nothing else, merely repeating the same cycle of abuse they have been subjected to. We can lift the weight of someone who has for decades as a child lived with the guilt born of events completely out of his control. We can set free someone who has suffered for so, so long as the tool of someone else's machinations, trapped, alone, and in unimaginable pain. Many of these stories are based on a lie. Some are smaller, some bigger. But if completed, all of these stories end with hope, something that is lacking in FromSoft's games, especially the character stories. It is this human kindness that drives the message of Lies of P. These little insignificant but happy events in an otherwise bleak world. Snippets of humanity that show you the ugly sides of humans, while also allowing you to preserve the good parts of humanity. Because in Lies of P, even if it is based on a lie, helping each other is what is at the core of the human heart. I think that's also why I don't mind that telling the truth doesn't have all that many consequences compared to lying. Ultimately, it's not about rewarding lying and punishing truths. It's about the choices that you make. If someone is hurting, if someone can be helped, will you help them? Even if it is as menial as fetching a bottle of wine, will you go out of your way to bring that wine to the old lady? Whether you tell the truth or you lie, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. Life goes on the same. But making that conscious decision to be kind, to give someone a small mercy, to show that you can understand and empathize and support someone else, that is what Lies of P asks of you. So which one is better? An ugly truth? Or a considerate lie? If neither changes anything, is it really wrong to choose to be kind? I'd like to also take a look at some of the major characters. I don't want to talk about them for too long. This video is already so, so long. If you've made it this far, then congratulations. I hope you've been enjoying it.
I don't have a whole lot to say about everyone in the game, so I'm sorry if your favorite character wasn't really mentioned here. As I said, a lot of the story in Lines of P is very straightforward. And so far, Geppetto isn't a very complex character, but that doesn't mean there isn't depth to him. Geppetto is a narcissistic control freak. Both his wife and son die of the disease, and both he commodifies into obedient slaves. Even after Carlo dies and he's willing to plunge a whole city to misery and anarchy, he refuses to do any introspection. Like a real narcissist, he shifts blame away from himself. It seems almost paradoxical then, that there does seem to be something that resembles kindness. He sends you to save Venini, to check up on Andreas and even the poor of the Malum district. He also asks, once you come back from the grand exhibition, to try not to break Antonia's heart too much with the news. Why bother going out of his way to send the precious cargo that is holding his son's heart into such danger? To prepare him to take down the alchemists? Maybe. Probably. When we free him from his cell in the tower, he says that he regrets only teaching us blood and violence, and that he will only ask once more for us to take up arms. However, in the bad end, he asks us to kill all of the inhabitants of Hotel Krat. I guess it doesn't really matter exactly what he teaches Carlo once he has full control of him. He only has to placate P to keep us on his side. We learn more about him in retrospect and see that he doesn't turn evil just on a whim at the end. After you save Geppetto from the donkey, Antonia will say that he usually isn't this reckless and that the pain of his grief must be clouding his judgement. Actually, the fact that Geppetto made it so far on Elysian Boulevard and was only stopped because of a stalker is a nice little detail you only think about after. The fact that the donkey calls him the father of the puppets is also very ironic and sad, considering what he forced him to do. You also have the duality of the antagonists, the alchemists and Geppetto. On the surface, the alchemists seem worse, they do human experiments and are just as willing to let Krat die for the sake of their new world. But is Geppetto really any better? He's using Ergo, which is part human essence, to make obedient slaves. Are we willing to give Geppetto slack because his experimentation is mechanical and not biological? Geppetto is a rather tragic and disturbed character. He isn't the Gammon of this game, as some say. Gammon didn't hold any power over us, and he was as much a victim as we were. Certainly, he was culpable in part to what happened to Yarnum, but he wasn't as singularly antagonistic as Geppetto is. In the hunter's dream, he suffers penance for his actions. He is tortured, never able to fully die or leave the dream until we kill him. Geppetto, however, is THE antagonist, even more so than the alchemists. He stands directly in contrast to our hero's objective, that is, to become human. He was a neglectful father and this led to his son's death after he had lost his wife. He's wrecked with grief, which fuels his new ambitions. But this grief does not come from having failed Carlo as a father, but rather at letting his ideal of a family fall apart. It's a personal failure, not to Carlo, but to himself. But Geppetto can't differentiate between puppets and humans anymore. To him, they are all the same. That's why he has no problem considering P his son, but starts freaking out when we rebel. Killing everyone in Hotel Krat reveals his true feelings. Humans are no better or worse than puppets as long as he has a use for them. Being an engineer and creating puppets is not a funny coincidence, but a perfect metaphor for his need to feel in control. Puppets are the perfect species of humans to Geppetto. Obedient, useful. For this I really love Geppetto, because he is the least human out of all the human characters in Lies of P. He sees no worth in humanity. Not the joy of creation or of mastery that Eugeni has, not the aspiration towards greater good like Venini, nor the enjoyment of the pleasures of life which Antonia embodies. Geppetto embodies nothing other than control. He shares none of the virtues of being human. The lives most precious to him, his wife and son, were toys just as his puppets were. I imagine he felt a lot of annoyance when those toys broke, but like a petulant child, he could not accept that fate had tried to teach him a lesson. So stubbornly, he drags his wife and son back from the dead so that he can keep playing with them at his convenience. During our battle with the nameless puppet, he says, Though he did not kill Carlo, he speaks as if his son's death was something that happened to him. And Geppetto got his wish. He wanted his son back, and the monkey's paw curled a finger. But try as he might, he can't fight against humanity itself. This he realizes far too late. Geppetto had no love in him. 
Who's to say why? But I can confidently state that Geppetto embodies narcissistic parents to a T. It's hard to even find anything good to say about him. So it's incredibly tragic, but fitting that he should find humanity right before his death. This puppet, this machine, this thing cries for him. Even though P pushed back, P still loved his father. And I like to think that reflects on how Geppetto must have felt when Carlo died. Did Geppetto cry because his son's life was cut short? Or was he angry in despair because something he had thought under his control slipped so carelessly out of it? Even something so low as a toy can be human, can will to be human, has always been human. When he apologizes, it's not only to P, but also to Carlo. Before, he never apologized, even when we told him to his face that he has not been a trustworthy father. But here, he finally understood the tragic extent of his failings. His death is both literal, but also serves as a metaphor for how we deal with people like him in our life. No matter how much we love them, how much we want them to love us back, we can't grow as long as they are in our lives. I have to apologize for mispronouncing her name quite a lot. Uh, it's a force of habit. I get that's very ironic, considering everything I'm about to say about her. As an aside, it is interesting to note Sophia's powers. The bone-cutting handle says, I don't know when I woke. The sights I have seen overlap. They repeat. Was that a puppet? A dream? Notes from a stalker's last counseling session before going mad. It seems we are in some way stuck in a time loop. Sophia's power to turn back time is quite literal, but it seems the effects are felt. During his fight, the mad donkey even seems to allude to this reality, that events keep happening over and over again, that we keep coming back every time we die. Her hand is on the pulse of the game. She literally wakes us up and guides us through the story. She also serves as our one way to get more powerful, to level up. The role that the maidens play in these games is always a very interesting one, but usually a bit derivative. Rarely are they so important to the story, However, Sophia, as the embodiment of the blue fairy from the original book, is a great mirror and even subversion of the typical maiden character we are used to. While P suffered neglect and emotional manipulation, Sophia's fate is much more physically violent. Much like P, she was made into a tool for someone else's sake. Simon says he loves her, but this love is as shallow as Geppetto's is for P. Sophia has her agency stolen from her turned literally into the princess atop the tower. However, unlike the stereotypical damsel in distress, Sophia is proactive. She wakes up P and guides him through the game, unlike Geppetto who sends him on violent errands. Her affection is genuine, coexisting with her understandable wish to be free, while Geppetto's machinations reduce P to not even an object himself, but a shadow of an object of obsession. In the book, while Pinocchio wished to do right by his father who tried to teach him, the boy's real lessons come from the guidance of the Blue Fairy. In the same way, Sophia literally enables the outward manifestation of peace humanity. There is something to be said about Sophia being reduced to an object, not only by Manus, but also by the story. Of the two kids abused by the adults in control of them and forced into a position where their agency and will is undermined, the imprisoned maiden is the one who has to die. Still, her part in this story is not simply a MacGuffin or anything like that. She overtly embodies the role of the mother figure, which the Blue Fairy also plays, contrasting Geppetto's role as the father figure, both in-game and in the book. Sophia's agency is taken from her, but she does not sit idly by. Geppetto couldn't get off his ass, so Sophia had to wake up P, which obviously starts the events of the game and the downfall of the antagonists. Her guidance is also proactive in our turn to humanity, acting not out of self-interest, but empathy. She could, if she wanted to, just use P as a puppet, which she planned on doing at the start. Yet her motivations remain fluid. Instead of using P, she becomes his guide. To call her our conscious is a bit much. Sadly, none of the maiden characters in these games get too big a role, Emma from Sekiro being the closest thing we have to a story-critical maiden character. But even in her position, Sophia refuses to stay a tool, encouraging P down the same path. As best she can, she reclaims her agency, asking us to end her misery. While Arlecchino is important in reflecting the nature of puppets, it is only with Sophia's help that we even have the thought of being anything more. Which is why the true ending is so perfect in my opinion. She gave us life, once again filling her motherly role. 
but we return all the affection, love, and wisdom she imparted to us by giving her life in turn. A real mother's love is unconditional, but I think there is no greater feat for a son than to return that love. This is why it's also important how the game handles her. It's no secret that the maidens of Souls games are ripe shipping material, and while there will always be some of it, as far as I am aware, the romantic interpretation has been rather tame for Lies of P, and rightfully so. Geppetto, despite his many failings, is integral for P's story as the father. But without Sophia, we would have no satisfying conclusion to that story. But as a final subversion, Sophia does not keep the same status of power, that which a parent has over their child. The true ending is both the gift of life that keeps on giving, but also when Sophia and P become equals. Sophia taught us to seek the humanity within ourselves, despite being a puppet. When we accept this truth, that puppets are as human as humans themselves, and then applying it to bring Sophia back, that is the greatest sign of devotion and love that P can possibly give. And now we come to the special boy himself. We talked about the story, we talked about the timeline, and gone over the more important characters. But none of that answers the real question. What is Lies of P about? Is it learning how to be human? Certainly I have alluded to that, but no. I've been putting a lot of focus on finding humanity, but this has been a deception by me. It's only half true. Lies of P is about identity, and not in the way you think. Many interpret the story very straightforwardly. Pinocchio in the book learns how to be a good boy, therefore Lies of P must be about P learning how to be a human. But my opinion differs. For me, Lies of P is not about finding humanity, as much as accepting that you already are human. It's about self-worth. It's about coming to terms with the trauma that has estranged you from yourself, and about accepting yourself as you are. Remember one of the first lore beats that I pointed out back at Krat Central Station? The poster that says, Ergo is life? P has always been a living being. And yet we keep getting told otherwise. Geppetto's puppet this. You are just a puppet that. You are special, not like other puppets. The language used estranges P from his true nature. How is what happens to P any different from what has happened to Pulcinella, Polendina, Arlecchino? It's fundamentally the same. P remembers his humanity. He unlocks that which has been hidden within him all this time locked and pushed down by others. P looks, acts, and has the capability of humans. Yet, he is denied his agency. The narrative archetype of a child is one usually characterized by innocence. The child is new to the world, without a concrete identity, morals, or thoughts of their own. These develop through time, but until then, they are entirely under the control of the child's parent. But as P progresses through his journey, he graduates from a naive child to an adult. Romeo planted the first seed of doubt, upon at which the child starts wandering about the greater world, where they start asking questions and going outside the boundaries that have been set for them. And then comes the betrayal, the deception that shatters innocence. P can no longer afford to be naive and ignorant. He must grow up and take on the grueling responsibilities of an adult. Sophia's death and Geppetto's kidnapping separates the child from his parents. P is no longer a boy, but a man, spurred on by his own experiences. Despite it all, the child can be a surprisingly insightful character. Often wisdom is found in simplistic innocence. As you grow older, you are less likely to change. This can, however, make you blind to the truth. This is why children often represent the truth. They lack the cynicism of life, the ingrained beliefs that separate men. In their innocent simplicity, they can only see the beauty of life, reminding the older characters of its existence. For these reasons, Arlecchino is actually a great contributor to P's psyche. His riddles exercise P's capacity for imagination, play, and expression, all traits very important to children. If we get the answer wrong in the grand exhibition, Arlecchino comments that P can only see glasses broken, a weapon, much like himself. The exhibition is where the illusion starts to shatter. We've had time to stir on Romeo's appearance and are getting slowly clued in to what has been happening behind the scenes. When P meets Arlecchino again, he asks us straight up. No pretenses, no metaphors. 
Are you a human or a puppet? This brings us back to the first prompt before Hotel Croc. Who are we? Back then, our answer had been a lie. Or at least so we thought. And what about now? If we say that we are a puppet, Arlequino expresses deep disappointment. Why would we willingly shackle ourselves? He sees this for what it is, slavery. He even goes back to calling you Geppetto's puppet instead of Geppetto boy. And there is a lot to be found in a name. In general, P lacks any concrete identity. Most project onto him their memories of Carlo. Even his name, P, is unofficially inferred from the title, but everyone in the game calls us Geppetto's puppet, or a variation of this. Though we come to mean many different things to many different people. Venini calls us compagno, seeing us as an equal, which is no small praise coming from Kratz High Prince of Society. Even his butler bows to us and regards us as a capable gentleman. Antonia exclusively refers to us as Geppetto's son, not puppet, allowing us some humanity. Even if she, much like Geppetto, starts by only seeing us as a ghost of someone who is gone. In the end, as we abandon our ties to Geppetto, she calls us the boy who resembles Carlo. To her, we are still that child who she so adored. A fond memory that gifted her peace and happiness. We might resemble Carlo, have something of his, but we are still our own individual now. Sophia starts by calling us Geppetto's puppet, which is appropriate, as she does seek to use us for her own benefit. But as we become closer, she starts referring to us as clever one. Through her death, she literally grants us true physical life and marks P's graduation into adulthood. When we meet Geppetto, it won't matter what we choose. By this point, we will either have become human or stayed a puppet. The choice here is aesthetic, but it asks P explicitly what he thinks of his father, his creator, his caregiver and jailer both. And when Geppetto dies, P cries. He grieves, because Geppetto, even if he was a monster, was still his father. P still loved him. Either by his own volition, or helped by Carlos' memories, P was still fond of Geppetto in some way. And now, that man is gone. At the end, when P returns the ergo that Sophia left him, P exercises the final faculty of being human, giving life. He has reached the end of his journey. More importantly than becoming human, he has learned to see humanity in himself, puppet or not. Deceptively, Lies of P is not about becoming human, but shrugging off the shackles that bind us down, and shrugging off those who might not have our best interests at heart. Whenever Geppetto calls us a good boy, he is speaking right through us. He does not see P. He sees a mirage of a person he wants comfortably under his thumb. It is well documented that abusers will put on this show of affection, while also putting our lives in danger. Love bombing might have become a meme in recent years, but it is very much what Geppetto is doing here. He gives us attention, affection, praises us. He talks about the great future we will have together as father and son. But it's all fake. He tells us he loves us, then keeps sending us out on missions where we die and die and die again. He says how much he regrets teaching us only violence, but he never changes his ways. If we take this purposeful manipulation into account, we can start seeing holes in all of our interactions. Go save my good friend Vanini, he is so helpless and frail. Oh, but if you're in the area anyway, might as well shut down the factory. Ah, the poor archbishop. Think of the refugees. See what's going on in the cathedral. Definitely not because the Archbishop was the last person to have the arm of God, which the alchemists are looking for. Oh, I weep for the poor souls in the Malum district. Their water contaminated, living under the oppression of the Brotherhood. Go liberate them. Definitely nothing to do with them working for the alchemists and stealing from the gold coin tree or anything. Ah, poor, poor Antonia. Another casualty of the petrification disease. I'm going to send you now to bargain with the alchemists, who I know do human experiments and who can't be trusted, to look for a legitimate cure, definitely not hoping that you stop their operation. Geppetto is playing on our good nature, playing on Carlo's emotions. Don't do these things for me, he says, do it for others. Do it for Benini, the refugees, the poor, Antonia, etc, etc. He knows Carlo was rebellious, so why would Carlo's soul and memories listen to Geppetto? Before he can fully control us, he needs to play it safe, which is why he sounds so worried when we start showing real empathy and humanity. The title Lies of P refers to the lies that Pinocchio tells in the game. It's not about how lying is human, but freeing ourselves from our naivete. 
The start of the game firmly states that lying is our pejorative. It is our choice. We are literally barred from progression until we take this first step towards individuality, something that Geppetto time and time again tries to deny us. Lies is a tool used by humans to express human desires through human actions. It's an inherently social technique and thus inherently human. And that is the crux. The title itself tells us all that we need to know. Alternatively, the game could be called Humanity of P and it would have the same meaning. It doesn't roll off the tongue quite as well, but that is the point. Lies are the answer in Lies of P. They are the bridge that brings our puppet identity and our human one together. When at the very start we say to the door of Hotel Crot that we are human, it is not a lie. At the beginning it may seem like a deception to P, as he doesn't believe it himself. But by the end, when Arlecchino asks us the same question, it is an admission, an assertion. We have deprogrammed ourselves from all the abuse we have suffered. We have overcome our guilt. We have gained the confidence in ourselves to say, yes, I am human. And that is why we cannot progress through the intro without saying it. Eyes of P is a journey of acceptance and most importantly, healing. It is only through these that P can find his own humanity and become a real boy. All right, we're finally starting to come to the end. When I started this project, I was expecting it would go a lot smoother and a lot quicker. When people say that these videos take months or years even, they're not lying. Maybe it can even be told from my voice, but uh, by this point, it is the end of December and I am very tired. <laughs> Which is why I've largely cut the part talking about difficulty. I remember when the game first came out and I was in the trenches defending it. Everybody was saying how hard it was when I had been worried after playing the demo that the game might be too easy. Thankfully, I was proven wrong. The game is hard, but it's not unfair. It's nothing that we haven't seen in Elden Ring before, and people love that game. In general, I feel like I don't have too much to add to the discussion about the combat. A lot of people have made much better videos that go much more in depth on the mechanics, and I'm not really the mechanics guy. However, I do find it to be a shame that the discourse around Lies of P is primarily dominated by its difficulty. Generally, this has been the case for the Souls-like genre in general. However, the FromSoft games have had a huge advantage. Of course, before Elden Ring, being in the Souls fandom contributed to your ego. Being able to take pride and flaunt the fact that you've beaten these games was a somewhat elitist point of pride for a lot of people. But even setting that aside, the Souls games were known just as importantly for their level design and interesting bosses and intricate lore. Difficulty was a part of it, and certainly it was the one that most people talked about. But once you go past that first superficiality, you find so much more. For Bloodborne, the difficulty was also a big part of it, but an even bigger part was, of course, the story. You can't talk about Bloodborne without talking about Lovecraft and the Great Ones and how cool the world design is. When talking about Sekiro, we do generally talk about mechanics, and that does admittedly include how hard Sekiro is. But it's also being said to have the most satisfying combat. Of course, this is many years later after lots and lots of criticism, so maybe this will also be true for Lies of P in the future. For Elden Ring, obviously, the dominating factor is its open world and level design. But when talking about Lies of P, we do a full circle, and we come back to the superficial topic of difficulty. Lies of P is not known for anything else other than its difficulty. When talking about Lies of P, so far, difficulty has been the main thing. And it was all you heard about for months. I watched YouTube videos, streams, scroll through Reddit, everything and everyone was talking about how unimaginably difficult the Lies of P is. And to be honest, that is kind of fair. Don't get me wrong, I love Lies of P. It was my game of the year 2023. And it is in my like top 10 games of all time. However, we do have to admit that round 8 put its focus into the gameplay. And as such, the main thing we can talk about is gameplay which is admittedly difficult. 
There is a story there. I haven't been talking about fuck all for the past five hours, but it's not as automatically fascinating as the stories in the From Software games are. The level design is also very cut and dry. It is interesting, and I like the levels. However, there isn't that much to analyze. The characters are mostly fine, but in terms of the story, we don't have as much to theorize about as you do with the From Software games usually. There are so many more links and contradictions usually, which makes Lies of P so simple in comparison. As this video has demonstrated, there is still plenty that we don't know or can't be sure about, but that isn't as consequential as it is for any of the Dark Souls games, for example. Sure, we can talk about who or what Gemini was, and we can talk about P's journey through the game, but when comparing it to From Software's games, Lies of P is lacking. This isn't inherently negative, but we do have to admit that this is a part of the discourse in Lies of P. Lies of P is just another Souls-like that can't beat the it's too hard allegations, it seems. I want to be clear, the criticism is fair, but it did anchor the discussion to one single point for quite a long time. Even people who did not play Lies of P knew of its difficulty. For a short amount of time, the game even had an overwhelmingly positive rating on Steam, but has now dropped down to just very positive, which again proves that this part of the discussion is alive and well. Thankfully, people have started to discuss other aspects of the game by the year's end, which I am very happy about. At least it did better than Starfield, so... <laughs> I did not find Lies of P to be much harder than Elden Ring, and a lot of people seem to have the opposite impression. Or it could be that the difficulty was overshadowed by everything else Elden Ring had to offer, while the gameplay of Lies of P is its main crutch, and everything else is stuck in the periphery. And so people who don't get the combat, or don't get into the flow, or just refuse to get into the flow, don't have anything else to latch onto, nor do we have anything to use against the critics when we defend Lies of P. Now, you could call me dramatic in this point, after all, I did just admit that Lines of P has gotten overwhelmingly positive on Steam, and Neowiz has sold millions of copies by now. Clearly the game is liked, but it's not beloved. Another big part of the discourse is how similar Lines of P is to the From Software games. When Lines of P was revealed, people saw vaguely European-looking architecture and immediately said, Oh, this is just like Bloodborne! And post-launch, the comparisons continued. Oh, the nameless puppet is just like Millennia, or like Lady Maria. Oh, the Brotherhood OST is just like Godric's music. Like, FromSoft didn't invent video games. Unfortunately, that is the curse that Lies of P must bear for sticking so earnestly to the confines of its genre. But to me personally, some of the comparisons felt unfair and tried to overshadow Lies of P's uniqueness. Again, I admit this has changed as time wore on, but for the first few months I felt like I was crazy listening to what was being said. But I also understand where all these criticisms and comparisons come from. Like, I can't play Elden Ring without seeing all of the other From Software games within it. To me, none of the areas feel new. And I imagine that's what Lies of P feels like to a lot of Souls veterans. There is some criticism I do agree with. I do think that they should have explained blocking and parrying a bit more thoroughly, and as I said when I was talking about the intro, the way it is introduced is not very effective. Since most people who will be playing Lies of P are Souls veterans and will have likely played Sekiro, they will be expecting something they will not get. Another thing that I do tangentially agree with is that there's no reason for that many bosses to have two health bars. Again, I don't think that they have an unreasonable amount of health. I did find the fights do go on for a reasonable amount of time when you do get used to them. And I can't say I'm exactly a pro. You can see from the footage I make a lot of mistakes, but still I don't take half a day to beat them. So I do think they could have kept to having only one health bar and still doing the transitions in the middle of that health bar, uh, but still keeping the same amount of health for the bosses. I do think this is something that Route 8 will learn with experience and time. Since they are a new studio and this is their first game, I do think this is something that comes from inexperience and not incompetence. Another point I can sort of get is that some animations and attacks do feel a bit off. I somehow wasn't bothered by this, I got used to the timings and rhythm, but upon further research I can see that while the attacks are well telegraphed, the frame animations can be confusing when you are trying to parry. 
But there's also complaints that I completely disagree with. For example, saying that the game doesn't give us enough tools to manage stamina and the Legion gauge and weapon durability. We have so, so many options. Dancing One's amulet, stamina recharge amulet, an amulet that literally lets you dodge through fury attacks, consumables that instantly recharge your Legion gauge and instantly fix your weapon durability, the cube. Legion arms aren't the best, I do think they are one of the weakest parts of the gameplay, but there's still so much you can do with them. And you still have the grindstone and consumables. Again, please, for the love of God, use consumables. If you don't use the items given to you by the game and then say that the game is too hard, my brother in Christ, that is not the game's fault, that is a you problem. I see this every time a new Souls like comes out and just... Can we move on from the elitism? Then people will say that the developers didn't think their own game through enough, and it is so disrespectful to everything Round 8 and Neowiz have done. They stayed true to their design philosophy of making Lines of P a hard game, but they did also allow the player to play the game their own way and make it easier for them. I'm not trying to call anyone specific out here, I'm just illustrating how much discourse there is about the difficulty of Lies of P. Thankfully there are people who do concern themselves with the lore. I have mentioned Kite Tales and the Inhuman one here by name, but there are many others on YouTube and I really do recommend checking out their channels. But that is the Alliance share on the difficulty and mechanics. Coming back to my own field of story, I don't have too much to say. I know you're sick of hearing it, but Lies of P really is very straightforward. The inconsistencies and plot holes that I have pointed out are low-key criticism, but they don't really take away from the general experience of the game. You can still build a relatively coherent timeline. However, I would like to briefly go over one thing that has bothered me the most about the writing in Lies of P, and that is specifically Venini. People describe him as being up his own ass. The YouTuber Jinji and others find him insufferable. And in the year 2023 of our lord, I can understand why people find it hard to sympathize with the rich. But I'm willing to go against the grain here and say that his weird charm is quite affable. And likely fake. If one pays attention to his character quest, you will find out that Vanini's parents were killed when he was young. The twist is they were killed by a murderous puppet. This event traumatized Vanini and would follow him well into his adulthood. Benini would create the Grand Covenant and install it within every puppet that passed through his factory. It was his wish to stop the tragedy that happened to him, repeating ever again, which allowed Geppetto to take over the puppets and send them into the frenzy. The existence of Law Zero within the Grand Covenant implies that Geppetto had always planned to take some form of control of the puppets. He likely exploited Benini's trauma to this end, convincing him to implement the Grand Covenant. It's quite tragic. A newspaper even spells it out to us, how his eccentric personality hides in deep grief. Every year, Vanini asks the city for the investigation file for his parents' death, which has been covered up and is denied every time. However, I am also willing to admit that his disposition is a bit problematic. If we pay any attention to the core of the story, which is that puppets are human, then his entire operation equates to slavery, basically. Again, not a very good look for a rich factory owner in the year 2023. While P is the exception, we have plenty of examples of puppets gaining ego. What with Palandina, Julian's wife, the broken puppet, Romeo, hell, even Vanini's own butler. I think we've seen plenty of billionaire philanthropists with a butler slash surrogate father duos by now. But the fact that he literally collared the puppets and took away their free will is... kind of evil. It continues the legacy his parents started. They created the first automated servants, and many sought to take even more freedom from them. And his actions are quite sympathetic if you learn his backstory, but by no means are his actions right. And he doesn't even really change in the story, which is a shame, as his would be one of the most important developments. When you talk to him after credits, he already has new ambitions to make the world a better place together. Buddy, that's how all of this started, with your good intentions paving the road to hell. At least we see him be curious about how puppets rose up. It still remains dubious how big a part the frenzy played in the puppets going haywire, and how much of it was just Romeo's doing. We can't forget that they aren't just killing mindlessly, they have a purpose for their actions. But I don't think he even really addresses the fact that P is a puppet. 
Peace change from machine to human is extraordinary and he treats you like a friend, but we don't see any conflict of interest. Ken Vanini, someone who was so traumatized by his parents' death at the hands of a puppet, which led to him forcing an entire new species of beings into submission, really trust a puppet running around killing other puppets and humans alike without anyone stopping him. Benini coming to terms with his grief and seeing past it, finally noticing the souls that he has trapped inside machinery, would be huge. It would be an incredibly fitting development, even if it's a bit eye-roll worthy to some. Oh, the rich labor exploitator realizes his expendable workforce is alive, whoop de whoop who cares? But if we are going to have such a character anyway, why not actually explore his character and have him change? For now, Vanini just leaves a conflicting taste in my mouth. It's like biting into a caramel bread only to find it molding inside and half empty. Was Round 8 scared of making a bigger statement? I don't know. I hope in the DLC we get some more development out of Vanini. I would be amiss if I didn't give my two cents on Gemini. One comment summarizes the popular opinion on Gemini thusly. I think my biggest problem with Gemini is that he interrupts any sort of atmosphere from entering an area, and his exposition feels like it could have been put in notes or descriptions or just anything more subtle than a character narrating lore to you. And I get that. A lot of people hate Gemini because he talks too much. He is chirpy, but weirdly genuine. He gives comments on side quests, which is cute, but pretty pointless, as the side quests are already made easy by the marker we get on our Stargazer map. Still, Gemini is equal parts annoying and mysterious. I glossed over him in the story because everything is speculation. Sophia knows him, the legendary stalker seems to refer to him as if Gemini was a human, and he even mentions having been in the Relic of Trismegistus before, but that is pretty much the extent of it. I feel like we'll get more on him in the DLC or something. I think Gemini should have stayed broken, offering more dry and critical commentary to better fit in with the game's mood. Something like Hawkwood the Deserter in Dark Souls 3, a very melancholic and critical presence. He would remain this way if you stayed a puppet, but if you became a human, he would slowly warm up, breaking out of his shell as well. I think this would have made him much more bearable to many people, and also make us more attached to him. Alas, for now, he remains one of the low points of the game, but his part in the game is so small that it honestly doesn't even really matter, so I won't speak of him anymore. To cap this off, another common complaint that I do completely agree with is the incorporation of the Nuvo. Piracy aside, I did feel like I got some performance issues myself, even though my computer can run Elden Ring just fine. Also, keybinding being stuck to WSD and not being able to rebind it is very bad. We should try to be more inclusive towards left-handed people and people who use alternate layouts. Also, icons for the PlayStation controllers, which is something that I used, only came after the first patch, which is fine, but I do think these are things that should be pointed out. Other miscellaneous stuff to complain about is that the lip syncing is very weird. I have actually no idea why it is like that. You might think, oh, it must be synced to Korean, but there is no Korean dub of Lies of P. In fact, this is kind of funny, because Westerners who play this game might think that the lip syncing is synced to Korean, meanwhile Koreans who play with Korean subtitles might think that the lip syncing is synced to English. But no, the characters just flap their lips like fish, it's very funny when you realize that. <laughs> Going back to the negative, the loading screens were the most red herring part of figuring out the lore. There are so many contradictions. The loading screens say that Geppetto made all the puppets in Crot, while the man himself denies this. The loading screens say that the Witch's Tower play was made by an amateur, yet the flyer we find calls it the last work of Krat's greatest playwright. These contradictions aren't limited to only the loading screen tips. Geppetto says that Dorian Gray believed that paintings could harbor a living soul, yet the item description says quite the opposite. Gemini says that maybe Sophia wishes to stay alive, then two voice lines later, he says that you'd be keeping her alive against her wishes. The Atone says that no puppets are allowed past her, yet we find puppets fighting carcasses in front of the Grand Cathedral. I feel in my stomach that this could be something that was lost in translation, but I am not sure. Generally, these aren't too egregious, but it makes you wonder how any of this even happened. Other weird oversights, question mark, that I noticed is that Vanini says that the Legion arm we have is a project he discarded at some point. 
Yet the legion arm we start with has Geppetto's name engraved into it. I don't know what this is supposed to really mean. Uh, gold records also don't add to your humanity, which are the records you get in New Game Plus. This seems kind of like a waste. This would give you more reason to experiment with telling the truth on your second playthrough without locking you in to the bad ending. Also, the text box when reading signs shows up for too short a time. So many times did I have to walk back and then walk forward to activate the sign again, just to walk back and walk forward again. Please, round eight, make this longer. <laughs> Concerning Julian and his puppet wife Melody, uh, why can't Melody be resurrected? Pulcinella could, when stopping Melody from getting a second life. That seems kind of unfair. Another reason to hate Vanini and the rich. <laughs> Also, the death animations for some human characters are a bit too silly. Bloodborne had some great death animations for like Gammon and Lady Maria, but then the dudes in Lines of P just flop dead but keep monologuing. It kind of takes you out of the dramatic situation. The last thing I wanted to mention were pulse cells. The description reads, Pulse cells are ergo cells that power the P organ. They work with stargazers and they also convert the energy from attacks impact to recharge. But the only people who use pulse cells are us and the nameless puppet. So what gives? Why does literally nobody else use them? I don't know, it seems like a weird oversight. And of course I would be amiss if I didn't mention that quite a few of the bosses did get their health nerfed. I think now they are perfectly fine. I can't speak for all of them before the nerf. So maybe it was a bit more unfair. However, I think right now they are perfect. And this change happened rather quick as well. Speaking of changes that happened post-launch, before the November patch, the Link Dodge and Rising Dodge abilities were locked behind P-Organ upgrades. After the patch, the Rising Dodge ability was given by default to the players, as well as two additional courts in Paladina Shop at the start of the game, which is huge, actually. Not only are we getting more quartz, which is very important, but also we get a very important upgrade by default, which makes the game a little bit easier. I never got this upgrade while I was playing because I didn't really see a point, but it is good for those who rightfully stated that it should be automatically a part of your arsenal. This was replaced by a very important upgrade, which actually has purpose being an upgrade and not default which is that when you use pulse cells, your guard regain does not disappear and stacks with the health you healed, which is also, I think, very cool. And that's basically it. The only other thing that I wanted to mention is that the fox and cat have cute matching bell accessories. I could not find any other place to put this little tidbit in, but I found that while looking at their models, and I think it's very cute, and I'm glad that this detail is in there. So... <laughs> Almost six and a half hours, about 120 pages later, what have we learned? Is Lies of P good? It's alright, six out of ten. <laughs> well, for, first of all, is it a good game? Well, it has an engaging and mostly coherent storyline. Its environments are beautiful, it has creative and deliberate level design with many memorable areas and encounters. Its characters are interesting, its combat is engaging and challenging, it has a beautiful soundtrack, and what's more, it was released in a functional state, with no major bugs or missing features. And these days that is somehow a commendable feat by itself. Sure it had some patches post-launch, but which game doesn't? On that note, is it a good Souls-like? Is it better than FromSoft's games? Well, does it have to be? Does that matter? I feel like such a question is reductive. If you like FromSoft games, Lies of P will be for you. If you like Lies of P, you should play the Souls games, or Bloodborne, or Sekiro. It really is that simple. I don't think there's much else to discuss here. Joseph Anderson started his video analysis with a very quaint example. I'm not gonna retell the example. If you wanna know about it, then you should check out his video. But it basically boils down to the same thing that a lot of people have been echoing. That Lies of P feels so much like a From Software game that if you remove the names NeoWiz and Route 8 Studios from it, you would believe that it was made by the same people who made the Dark Souls games. There have been many great Souls likes. Neo 2, Hollow Knight, if you count it as a Souls like, my personal favorite, Salt and Sanctuary, so on and so on. Lies of P has just come closest in design, story, and gameplay compared to all of them. But that does beg the question. Should games from now on try to go the Lies of P route by staying incredibly faithful to the Source games? That is Lies of P's greatest strength after all, and there aren't many games that scratch the same itch that Lies of P does. 
I do think on a meta level that this is something that we should talk about and that companies should consider going forward. ISFP marked itself as one of the most successful Souls likes by being so incredibly faithful. Not to say that other games in the same genre haven't been just as successful, but ISFP really has been huge. I do think that this validates a more faithful approach to designing a game like this. But it shouldn't mean that experimentation isn't welcome. In fact, I hope Round 8 Studios experiments more with their future games. I get they were trying to play it safe and stick to their strengths and things they knew that worked when making Lies of P, but I can't see the potential for new developments, and I think both they and other studios that are interested in making these types of games will try to go more outside of the box. To me, Lies of P is the first tentative step of a fledgling bird, and Route 8 has shown that it gets the fundamentals of a good, even great, Souls-like. Now I just hope that they learn, both from the things that worked out great, and things that could use a little bit of touching up. And I really hope that they make many more great games just like Lies of P, and are not afraid of innovation while doing it. With that, I can largely conclude my thoughts on Lies of P. This ending part has been relatively short, because I do think I've made most of the important points up until now rather clear. This video was more meant as a collection of my own thoughts looking at the discourse of Lies of P. There are many other videos on similar topics, and I suggest you look at them. This is not supposed to be the comprehensive video on Lies of P. However, I did see a lack of long-form analysis about Lies of P, especially when it comes to the lore, because I found a lot of inconsistencies with what people were talking about. So I wanted to clear things up from my point of view, while also contributing something to the game that I love so much. Besides, if you're the kind of person who likes watching 10 different 3 plus hour long videos on why Bloodborne is the best game ever made, it's true, Jesus said so, then this video will be for you anyway. This has been my first project, and there's a lot that I could improve on, the audio probably being the number one thing. I don't know how noticeable it is, I hope it's not too distracting, but I've had a lot of changes in audio over the past couple months, and so, yeah, <laughs> that, that was one of the more difficult parts. Also, I do admit that I'm not the best when it comes to mechanics, and I really wish I could have played Lines of P more, but during all of this time, while I have been recording, writing the script, editing, I have also been doing school stuff and working on my graduation thesis, which has taken up most of my time. Which is also why I'm so late to the party, but it does seem to have had some positive effects at least, as I do not have to talk about difficulty, thank god. To wrap things up, I hope you have enjoyed this video. This is my first real analysis of a game, and I'm sure my inexperience is noticeable in some areas, and I hope I can only improve with time, especially by the time the DLC comes out. But as a side effect of my experience, there will likely be things that, looking back, I will have missed or fubbed. If you have any corrections or ideas, theories, whatever, comments or feedback, then please feel free to share. I will try to read everything. On that note, uh, the show is over. You can go home now. Thank you so much for watching. Subscribe if you want to see the future video covering the DLC or hopefully any future games that the developers make. I will also maybe try to cover those if they are interesting. So yeah, until then, thank you very much for watching and have a nice holiday. See ya. is over. You don't have to go home or straight to hell. Though well, that would be my choice. But you can't stay here. Not if you want to live. <laughs>